progress. Today, we are going to begin with a panel dedicated to the broad theme of gender. As we heard from Anna Davin yesterday about the Ruskin College History Workshop held 50 years ago that we partially commemorate with this symposium, gender was a central concern for the organizers, many of whom were involved uh, in the women's movement. And girls and their histories were well represented on that program with an entire panel, including a paper by Davin herself, dedicated to what they called growing up girls. <laughs> um, we also heard yesterday from Ashwini Tambe on the origins and preoccupations of the field of girlhood studies. Uh, Ashwini gave us an outline of the trajectory of that field, especially as it related to defining who was a girl um, and how historians have sort of seen that uh, figure at different times. So for this panel focused on gender then, we wanted to highlight some of the concerns that until relatively recently had not been the focus of most girlhood history. For that, we turned to editors and collaborators on a longstanding project on the global history of black girlhood and founders of the History of Black Girlhood Network, Corinne T. Field and Lakeisha Michelle Simmons. We asked them if they would introduce us to the work that they and their colleagues have been doing on black girlhood around the world. We will first hear from Corey and Keisha, who will give us an introduction, and then we'll hear two papers from their collaborators. And you've actually um, already heard from other members of this network in the presentations by Crystal Webster and Dara Walker that we heard yesterday, but on different themes. Um, so let me introduce Corey and Keisha first, and then I'll introduce Anasa and Vanessa just before they give their talk. Uh, so, Corinne Field is an Associate Professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at the University of Virginia and co-editor with Lakeisha Simmons of the Global History of Black Girlhood, which will, uh, will be published soon by the University of Illinois Press. She is currently researching a book tentatively titled Grand Old Women, How Abolitionists and Feminists Transformed Aging in America. She is the author of The Struggle for Equal Adulthood, Gender, Race, Age, and the Fight for Citizenship in Antebellum America, and co-editor with me of Age in America, the Colonial Era to the Present. Lakeisha Michelle Simmons is Associate Professor of History and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Michigan. She's the prize-winning author of Crescent City Girls, Young Black Women in Segregated New Orleans, and the co-editor with Corinne Field of the forthcoming Global History of Black Girlhood. Simmons has published articles in Signs, Gender and History, and Tulsa Studies in Women's Literature, and is on the editorial board of the Journal of American History. Simmons is currently working on a book on the history of love and care in Black families during the transition from slavery to freedom. Um, and together, their presentation is entitled simply, The Global History of Black Girlhood. So Corey and Keisha, take it away. Thank you very much. I, I apologize, everyone. My camera is not working, but hopefully you can hear me, which I guess is more important. Um, I want to begin by thanking the organi organizers of this conference for including us and including Black girls in this conversation. It means a lot to me, um, and also I know a lot to Corey as well, so thank you very much. I want to begin by talking a little bit about the question that got us started. We were at, Corey and I were at a round table at the Society for the History of Children and Youth in 2015. And it was a round table on, on new work that had come out or was coming out in Black girls' history. On that panel was Abbasede George, who pointed to the various ways that Blackness operated in different locales and asked our panel um, really explicitly if the frameworks for Black girl studies could, apply, could be applied throughout the globe. And George was um, a little bit critical in the, the idea of for example, that Black girlhood was, was defined by um, a, a desire or a need to prove girlness, right, all across the globe. So um, George called for this denaturalizing of the concepts of Black, of girl, and girlhood to historicize how these constructs take form and get assigned to bodies in particular contexts. So Keisha and I went on to organize a conference on the global history of Black girlhood at the University of Virginia in 2017. And from that, we put together this edited volume that's forthcoming from the University of Illinois Press in September. So contributors to this anthology engage in a conversation across disciplines and historical subfields to consider three key questions posed by Black girls' history. 
What does it mean to be a girl? What is the meaning of blackness when seen from girls' perspectives in different times and places? And how have black girls imagined themselves as part of a global African diaspora? So by considering both the local and the global, this anthology offers possibilities for looking at how black girls create themselves over time by making history. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the long history of black girls studies. In some ways, the work that we were trying to do um, in the conference and in this anthology is nothing new. Black girls and young women have often voiced their frustration with sexism, racism, colorism, and economic inequality. Yet until recently, academics and professional historians have paid little attention to Black girls' opinions. The interdisciplinary field of Black girl studies is an ethical orientation and a political praxis, as well as a theoretical framework, a way of seeing the world with and for Black girls. This way of thinking rejects frameworks that construe Black girls as a problem and instead recognizes them as practitioners of creative genius, um, as Ruth Nicole Brown has argued. Nikki Finney, um, a poet who has worked with Brown in workshops with Black girls, has asked this question. What does it mean to have a 21st century sacred place for Black girls' 400-year-old, my mother was not inferior and I'm not inferior either, attitude? What does it mean, as Finney suggests, to see this I am not inferior attitude as a 400 year project of black girlhood? One place to begin the story is with Phyllis Wheatley. Wheatley was a young girl, only seven or eight, when traders and humans stole her from her home in West Africa. After the horrifying transatlantic journey across the sea, she landed in New England. She was a young enslaved teenager when she published her first poem in a newspaper and a teenager still when she traveled to London in search of a benefactor for her writing career. At the age of 19 or 20, Wheatley published her book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. Recognizing Wheatley as a transnational Black girl writer who faced the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade and enslavement, traveled around the world and sought freedom in her own writing, demonstrates that the creative genius and intellectual project of Black girl studies is nothing new. Noting that this project is nothing new reframes how we think about Black women thinkers of the past. Black women who have often been ignored or slighted by white historians or within childhood studies. When we start considering the age of our protagonists, for example, we notice that many of the icons of Black women's history were once girls themselves. And this seems obvious, but a lot of them started their activism in, and work as actual girls. For example, two iconic texts often used to teach African-American women's history, Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl and Anne Moody's Coming of Age in Mississippi are centrally about girls and girlhood in ways that their authors purposefully emphasize, but many readers used to overlook. Jacobs and Moody rewrite the history of slavery and civil rights through their coming of age experiences, revealing how gender, race, and age intersect to endanger and constrain Black girls, but also how Black girls' critical perspectives open up revolutionary possibilities for reconfiguring public and private life so that Black girls can be seen, heard, and valued in all their creative brilliance. So, you know, if we think about these people as foremothers in childhood history, how does that reframe how we think about the history of girlhood? Uh, they were writing way before um, any of us in, in this room. Um, but it is not just African-American texts that have sought to make visible Black girls as rich and complicated worlds. Afro-German writer Ika Hugo Marshall dealt with the question of Black girl invisibility head on when she published Invisible Woman Growing Up Black in Germany in 1998. Writing about her life as a Black biracial girl living in Germany after World War II, Hugo Marshall narrated a story of rejection and finding her communities, as um, Vanessa Plumley will discuss in more detail. Many other key texts, some fiction, others bio, biomythographies, detail Black girlhood and its transnational contours. Caribbean writers such as Evelyn Trio weave archival research and fictional imaginings into the genre of neo-slave narratives 
that envision what the early years of the transatlantic slave trade might have meant for the West African and Creole girls who never had the chance to document their own stories. Black scholars in African-American history and studies have also been working on these issues since we've been integrated, and I'm using integrated ironically, um, please note, into the academy. Sadly, the work of Black scholars hasn't always been recognized by those in the wider discipline of history and within childhood studies more specifically. And I just want to note that I've, I've written um, in the Journal of American History, wasn't really publishing Black women scholars until about 2014, right? And I don't, I didn't have time to do a full study of the Journal of Childhood and Youth, but like these are kinds of projects that we need to be thinking about. Um, sociologist and civil rights activist Joyce Ladner was one of the first scholars to actively write against pathology as an overriding framework for understanding Black girlhood. In her book, Tomorrow's Tomorrow, first published in 1971, Ladner wrote about Black adolescent and pre-adolescent girls from a decolonial and Black feminist perspective. By recreating Black girls' own worldview and sense of the future, she, she sought to represent, quote, the strength of the Black family and Black girls within the family structure, end quote. She saw kin networks developed by marginalized girls as central to their resiliency. Wilma King, in 1997, wrote Stolen Childhoods. She documented how enslavers and employers in the 19th century United States forced Black children to work at young ages, denied them education, and separated them from their families but also how Black children and their enslaved communities created spaces for nurturance and play, forestalling adult responsibilities as long as possible. I think part of the larger project of Black girls' history has, att has attempted to listen to Black women and girls and to center them in our analysis. So the field of Black girls' studies began from an intersectional diasporic framework sustained by the intellectual brilliance and political engagement of Black girls and women. In Ashwini Tambe's wonderful paper yesterday, she correctly mapped the trajectory of girlhood studies in the academy as moving from the study of white girl subcultures to the transnational and then to the intersectional. I think this is exactly right, but what it means is that the mainstream of academic girlhood studies is finally arriving at the place where black girls and other girls of color have always been. So what does girlhood history look like when we listen to Black girls, when we tell their story? Some fundamental assumptions begin to shift. So for example, simplistic distinctions between freedom and constraint turn to more nuanced analyses of how Black girls create arenas for self-expression while also answering to both adult and white supremacist authority. The abolition of chattel slavery, which proceeded through fits and starts over the long course of the 19th century, exposed Black girls to new forms of coerced labor while also creating possibilities for negotiating freedom. Whether in the United States or French Sudan, indentured servitude, guardianship, and marriage functioned to control girls' labor after the end of slavery. The way girls navigated these coercive demands, choosing whom to obey, reveal uncomfortable links between the history of slavery and girlhood as states of unfreedom that can also authorize forms of consent. When we listen to Black girls, the very question of who counts as a girl and what it means to be a girl takes center stage, as Black children often find themselves thrust into adult responsibilities sooner than others, while also facing a future in, when black, in which Blackness functions to divide the category of woman rendering Black women as not fully adult, not fully women. And Ashwini Tambe and Crystal Webster both explained these dynamics so well in their papers yesterday, and I think show the potential for this kind of, of listening to Black girls and girls of color. Uh, the everyday and the intimate emerge as key frameworks for understanding Black girls' history. So Dara Walker's focus yesterday on the everyday, the quotidian, and the long term in her talk demonstrates the productivity of this framework. By distinguishing stages of girlhood, early childhood, adolescence, young womanhood, we can see how each generation first learns about race, gender, and class domination in their families, 
their friend groups, neighborhoods, classrooms, and cities. These lessons make girls experts on the private dimensions of inequality and center issues such as colorism, access to leisure, styles of self-fashioning, and household work. A focus on pleasure and creativity is also a key framework in Black girl studies right now. Informed by hip-hop feminism and performance studies, but rooted in archival research, historians recover Black girls' ordinary joys, friendships, and play. These pleasures might include the erotic, but they neither begin nor end with sexual experience. So Kira Gaunt influentially argued that the games young Black girls play, such as double dutch and clapping rhymes, enable girls to toy with both respectable and transgressive embodiments of Black womanhood. Sadia Hartman's recent book on wayward girls demonstrates how young Black women migrating to cities at the turn of the century created a revolution in private life by pursuing pleasure and self-expression. So Hartman and others have drawn extensively on the theoretical frameworks developed by Black feminist theorist Hortense Spillers. In her 1987 essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, and other works, Spillers provides a methodology for analyzing the vulnerabilities and revolutionary potential of Black girls when she argues that 500 years of slavery and discrimination functured, functioned as an ungendering process that removed people of African descent from the grammar book of American gender, Prema the categories that are premised on mother, father, daughter, son. That outsider position, Spillers influentially argued, offers possibility. So rather than joining the ranks of gendered femaleness, Black women can claim what Spillers termed an insurgent ground as female social subjects. Nazira Wright, in her book on African-American girlhoods in the 19th century, applied this framework to youth. Wright argues that Black girls contribute an intensified investment in imagining new futures because of their age-based sense of becoming women and their awareness that the standard grammar of womanhood will never apply to them. Habiba Ibrahim and Tammy Owens also explore how Spiller's concept of ungendering implies exclusion from standard categories of age and life stage, placing people of African descent in the Americas out of time or without a specific age. So Habiba Ibrahim develops the idea of Black age in her recent book by that title, which I highly recommend. Black age is a time frame out of step with dominant Western notions of time, history, and age categories. So like Spillers, Ibrahim sees revolutionary potential in probing what lies in the spaces beyond hegemonic, hegemonic categories of gender and life stages, how Black age opens new ways of relating to one another across gender and generation. In some Black girls have always disrupted the category of girlhood, always insisted on frameworks that account for race, class, and sexuality, as well as age and always imagined a diasporic identity that links Black girl experiences in different locales, even as girls focus on the local and everyday and the intimate. So to understand how girls define Blackness, contributors to the global history of Black girlhood looked beyond local frameworks to explore how concepts travel across time and space. Chapters focus on multiracial girls in the colonial period, navigating transnational kin networks, African-American school girls after the Civil War, creating interracial friendships, progressive era girls testing the limits of segregated juvenile justice, and the children of Black GIs and German mothers searching for belonging in the aftermath of World War II. How girls imagined the African diaspora becomes apparent when Black girls stage a play about the Haitian Revolution, when girls in Jamaica, Jamaican reform schools confront Black adults with colonial attitudes towards race, when high school students in the Black power era look to Africa for new beauty standards, and when activists from the United States and South Africa reflect together on how girlhood shaped their commitment to Black liberation. By bringing histories focused on different regions and time periods to bear on a shared theme, this anthology aims to prompt a deeper understanding of what Black girls share across time and space and what does not translate from one context to another. So adopting a global framework for the history of Black girlhood shifts attention to contexts where class, 
ethnicity, and religious affiliation sometimes matter more than race in creating normative categories of girlhood. In majority Black contexts, access to protected girlhood dedicated to a future of idealized motherhood depends upon middle-class status, access to colonial and missionary schools, and membership in a privileged racial group that is not necessarily white. So by positioning the category of Black girlhood in relation to girl of color configurations, as well as to the better known ideals of white girlhood that emerged from Northern Europe and North America, historians and Black feminists can better appreciate how girlhood functions to shore up ideas of racial difference, social class, and national identity around the world and how Black girls disrupt categories of girlhood, both by affiliating with other girls and insisting on the distinctiveness of their Blackness. Black girls' internationalism often looks different than Black women. While some Black girls travel by choice or by compulsion, many remain in their homes and communities, but engage international frameworks through reading, media, and imagination. They often use these international connections to construct a diasporic affiliation with other Black youth as a generation distinct from their elders. And academic scholars are just beginning to explain these dynamics. So there is a pressing need for more academic research on Black girlhoods outside of the United States and before the 20th century. African-American girls' history, especially work focused on the 19th and 20th centuries, is thriving. Uh, with new and wonderful work coming out all of the time. As Keisha and I put together the edited volume, we had a harder time making sure other regions and earlier time periods were represented. So South American Black girlhood, Black girlhood in Asia, Islamic girlhoods in various regions, and Black girlhood in Europe, especially outside of German history, where there's a lot of new work on Black German studies. Uh, work on Black girlhood in the 18th century is sparse, and there's even less on pre-modern periods. I think we really need to reckon with what, what both Blackness and girlhood meant in pre-modern time periods. So, um, you know, what, sorry, I lost my place. So, uh, you know, what was Black girlhood before the modern era? So I think organizations such as Shiki and the Children's History Society are well positioned to support research on Black girls and girls of color outside the US and in earlier time periods. And some of this work is happening at this conference right now, which is fantastic. But Keisha and I would call for even more sustained effort to support research on unexplored regions and time periods before the 19th century and to foster conversations among different subfields. So the second area where Keisha and I see an urgent need for more research is in queer girlhoods. So sometimes the self-invention of Black girlhood leads not to Black womanhood, but to Black manhood or gender non-conforming identity. Historians looking to identify the gender fluid practices of Black girls in the past have only just begun to fill in a picture of Black girlhood that does not depend upon a binary opposition between girls and boys or assumptions that Black girls are always future women. So scholars such as C. Riley Storton and Anya Wallace, Savannah Shanga, and Ziatila Ima are developing methods and vocabularies to understand the history of Black girlhood beyond reproductive heterosexuality, but there's a need for more of this work and a need to center this work wherever it is. Uh, and then third, Keisha and I would urge more careful attention to how methods and concepts travel between the social sciences and history. The field of Black girlhood studies is interdisciplinary at its core. Sociologists, anthropologists, literary critics, scholars of media and visual culture, people in schools of education and public health, all contribute vitally to Black girlhood studies. And everybody agrees that Black girls often reach back to the past to understand their situation in the present and imagine the future. But I think we need more careful unpacking of how qualitative social science methods differ from archival methods, especially how forms of participatory action research where Black women work with and for Black girls differ from historians' use of archival documents, visual culture, and oral histories. So if the project is to listen to Black girls, how do social scientific and historical modes of listening differ? And how can we continue as historians to focus on change over time? So to appreciate how the past shapes the present, but also how the past is radically different from the present. 
And uh, finally, I think we need to continue to engage girls in writing the history of Black girlhood and creating archives for future historians. The 1972 conference got something right when they involved children and youth, but how can historians do this in a more inclusive way? This won't be easy, but I think it's worth trying. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Corey and Keisha. Um, our next pres presenter is Anasa Hicks, uh, who is an assistant professor of Caribbean history at Florida State University. Her research focuses on race, gender, and labor in 20th century Cuba. Her book, Hierarchies at Home, Domestic Service in Cuba from Abolition to, from Abolition to Revolution will be out in September 2022 with Cambridge University Press. She's currently working on a second book about the Cuban veterans of the Af African Liberation Wars of the 1960s and 1970s. Hicks's research has been supported by the Ford Foundation, the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And her paper today is entitled Revolutionary and Racialized Childhood and Adolescence in Studies of 20th Century Cuba. Anasa. Hi, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, so first I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference and thank um, Corey and Keisha for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I'm very happy to be here. So um, really listening to Corey and Keisha's presentation, I feel like what I want to say kind of exemplifies um, what, what they've already said in, in the context of the country that I focus on, which is Cuba. So for the first half of this paper, um, I'm going to talk about trends that I've seen in studies of childhood in post-1959 Cuba, um, where most histories of childhood and adolescence have emerged in the last 15 or so years. And then I'll pivot to my own research um, on that topic, which takes place in Republican era Cuba. So the period between around 1902 and 1959, um, because I think that uh, the, the studies that have emerged in the past 15 or so years are related to post-59 Cuba um, exemplify some of the, the gaps that Corey and Keisha mentioned. These are studies of childhood that don't necessarily attend to um, questions of race or gender when their focus is on childhood. Um, but the research that I've done in my, the chapter in my chapter in Global Histories of Black Girlhood, I hope um, do those things. So um, studies of childhood in Cuban historiography, as I said, have overwhelmingly focused on the post-1959 era, understandably. The transformations that the Cuban revolution wrought on the island society are difficult to overstate. And possibly no preceding Cuban government focused so explicitly on transforming the lives of children. Much of the state-led transformations of the early 1960s in Cuba focused on young people because as Fidel Castro insisted, the revolution was for the children. Um, this temporally inflected historiography on childhood in Cuba has drawn out many useful themes for historians, ranging from religion to state formation to studies of sexuality. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about how studies of childhood have elucidated some of these themes um, in late 20th century Cuban history. So one of the first indicators that children would be an important factor in the battle for the meaning of the Cuban revolution was Operation Pedro Pan or Operation Peter Pan, which began in 1959. So Operation Pedro Pan was a loosely organized affiliation of Catholic churches in Cuba and in the United States. Um, in the first years of the revolution, several thousand Cuban children traveled unaccompanied to the U.S. under the auspices of the Catholic Church. Why? <clears throat> Why did they do this? Their parents feared that the new Cuban government would terminate um, patria potestad, or the legal authority that parents traditionally hold over their children. They feared that the Cuban government would eliminate that and take legal control over all children in Cuba. Even in 1959, many Cuban conservatives suspected the Castro brothers of being communists, although they hadn't attested to that yet. And of course, it was a longstanding trope of anti-communism that 
communism sought to destroy the nuclear god anointed family unit. So the literal movement of several thousand Cuban children away from the island, away from their parents, um, was a hallmark of the revolution's early years. But recent work has elucidated a counterpoint um, to this ominous and dramatic action on the part of some Cuban parents. In her book, The Revolution is for the Children, The Politics of Childhood in Havana and Miami, 1959-62, Anita Casavantes Bradford argues that the new revolutionary government was extremely concerned both with maintaining the nuclear family and with children's welfare in particular. So through mass vaccination programs, the creation of boarding schools for young children, the creation of a youth militia, a youth militia known as the Pioneros, um, and the politicization of higher education, the post-59 government sought to transform childhood in Cuba, both by educating children early about the dangers of capitalism and the moral superiority of socialism, and by improving material circumstances for Cuban children. Another book, um, Rachel, Rachel Hinson's Laboring for the State, Women, Family, and Work in Revolutionary Cuba, 1959 to 71, uh, uses the nuclear family as a unit of analysis for the first 12 years of the Cuban Revolution. And she also finds that far from seeking to destroy the Eurocentric Christian family unit, the revolutionary government actively sought to repair and maintain the nuclear family, often at the cost of the desires of Cuban men and women themselves. Mass marriage initiatives and the close monitoring of women's contraceptive practices across the island uh, both had profound effects on the experiences of family life and therefore childhood in Cuba. So what was the effect of the revolution on Cuban children? And how did the generation of Cubans born in the early 1960s differ from their parents? And how would their experiences differ from their children and their grandchildren? Um, one emergent theme in many post-59 studies of childhood uh, is the emergence of a new kind of sexuality. Many of the opportunities that the revolutionary government created for children to form an attachment to the revolution, the boarding schools that I mentioned, the literacy campaign in which uh, many children and young people traveled without their parents to the island's interior to teach peasants how to read, essentially, um, the training for the pioneros militias. These created situations in which children and adolescents were alone with each other for extended periods of time. Um, Gregory Randall, who is the son of the famous poet and historian and author, Margaret Randall, remembers the clashing of two worldviews during his own childhood in 1960s Cuba. There was the relative puritanism of many revolutionaries. So it's kind of anecdotally known that many revolutionaries like Fidel and Raul and Che were personally quite um, prudish, one might say. They had a very conservative personal politics. So that kind of trickled down to people who were close to them. Um, but that often clashed with the free love ethos of, uh, that pervaded many countries and many revolutions in the 1960s. In an interview with historian Isabella Cosse, Gregory Randall remembered that even as adult supervisors tried very hard to prevent sexual activity among boarding school students, for example, um, you know, dormitories housing 60 children or adolescents to a room often became dens of teenage sex at night because it was impossible really to prevent that from happening. Sexual awakening um, is a universal hallmark of the transition from childhood to adulthood, but the transition was perhaps especially acute in 1960s Cuba where sexuality itself was profoundly politicized. State formation and revolu revolutionary Cuba also looked different from the lens of childhood. Um, as Gregory Randall's biography connotes, he was born in the US, raised partially in Mexico, and then fled to Cuba with his family after the turmoil of the late 1960s in Mexico. Cuban children were not the only ones that the government was interested in. 
the Isle of Pines, um, which is a small island off the southern coast of Cuba, was renamed the Isle of Youth after 1959, and it became the site of international boarding schools in the 1960s and 70s. Students from places like Nicaragua, El Salvador, Angola, Mozambique, um, and other nations came to Cuba for academic and political education. Educating children from nations with, with whom Cuba shared political solidarity was a boon for the nation state, as well as for the children who traveled there. Um, clearly, children were a valuable resource for the revolutionary government. As Anita Casavantes Bradford's work illuminates, um, children have also been a useful trope on both sides of the Miami Straits, as communists and anti-communists have made arguments about the good or evil of the 1959 revolution. If Operation Peter Pan, which I mentioned earlier, was the first indication that children or childhood would become an ideological battleground within the revolution, um, the case of Elian Gonzalez might be a kind of epilogue to that saga. Uh, to recap, since um, this was a very American news story and I honestly don't know how far it traveled outside <laughs> Cuba and the United States. So just to very briefly recap, um, Elian Gonzalez was a Cuban boy. He was five years old in 1999 when his custody case nearly sparked a diplomatic crisis between the US and Cuba. Um, around Thanksgiving of that year, in November, a fisherman in Florida discovered Elian floating alone on a raft. Um, his mother and other um, adults had died on their desperate trip away from Cuba. Um, and so he was the only remaining survivor, I believe, on the raft that he was drifting on. And he was quickly whisked away to relatives that he had in Miami, um, who wanted very much to keep him. But inconveniently for Elian's Miami family, um, Elian's father was alive and well in Cuba, and he wanted Elian back. His parents were separated, Elian's mother and father, and his father had never agreed for him to go to America in the first place. So Elian's father demanded that the United States return the boy to him in Cuba, and eventually the US agreed that this was the appropriate course of action. The city of Miami disagreed. The US federal government's brutal retaking of Elian from his family's Miami home sparked unprecedented protests in the city of Miami and arguably transformed the city's relationship to the federal government. Um, the 2000 presidential election was quite consequential in America and it came down to South Florida. Um, the Democrats lost, which many people uh, relate somewhat to the saga of Elian. Many uh, Miami Cubans, as they're known, found what what the Democratic president did uh, to Elian, as they saw it, they found it unforgivable. So Elian's story, the story of this five-year-old boy kind of caught between the two nations, um, as I said, was a very emphatic epilogue to the story of childhood in Cuba and what, what childhood meant both in Cuba and in Miami, which saw itself as the true inheritor of, of, the, of Cuba. They saw the island as having gone off course and themselves as the inheritor of what it meant to be Cuban. So um, I hope I've shown how much strong work there is in post-1959 histories of Cuba um, that have been published and continue to be published um, but as you may have noticed, I didn't really mention race or gender in this kind of recap or analysis of studies of childhood in post-59 Cuba. Um, and that is because they're really not there. Um, and that is not necessarily due to neglect on the part of these authors. It's actually quite difficult to study race seriously in post-59 Cuba because starting about two years after the Cuban revolution in around 1961, the new revolutionary government insisted that the problem of racism in Cuba had been solved, that it was no longer an issue and therefore no longer needed to be discussed. And so it was not. 
And so for historians, that creates a problem, right? Um, when the documents that you're interested in neglect to mention race or deal with race, it's hard to make um, it's hard to make solid conclusions about race since there's no documentation of it or its importance. Um, so now I'm going to pivot to recap uh, briefly a case that I discuss in the chapter I contributed to Global Histories of Black Girlhood, which as I said, um, is from the Republican era in Cuba, so pre-59, um, because I think that using methodologies from this earlier time period, um, looking back into the early 20th century and into the 18th and 19th centuries, um, in Cuba could yield new insights about childhood as it relates to racial identity, gender, and slavery. So, as I said, um, my own book about domestic service in 20th century Cuba um, kind of deals with this post-59 erasure of the discussion of race. And my chapter in this anthology delves into, into the topic of race. I use court cases essentially to argue that to be a black girl in early Republican Cuba um, was to be vulnerable in a way that was historically consistent with the pre, pre-independence and pre-abolition era in Cuba. The abolition of slavery um, changed the category into which black Cubans fell and independence from Spain granted black Cubans citizenship um, but the intersection, intersecting identities of race, gender, and age combined um, to render Black girls less protected than they could have been. So just to briefly summarize independence in Cuba and the end of slavery, uh, slavery was abolished in Cuba in 1886. And in 1898, Cuba became independent from Spain um, due to a US occupation of the island. And in 1902, finally, Cuba became um, fully independent. So how much time do I have? By my own estimation, I don't think I have that much time. About five minutes. Okay, then I'm going to briefly summarize um, one of the, the court cases that I go into in my paper to try to um, elucidate the point I want to make about how using different methodologies can be helpful in getting at some of these uh, themes of gender and race in studies of childhood. So the court cases I talk about in my anthology chapter have to do with sexual violence against black girls. Um, one case in particular is related to a 13 year old um, named Regla Maria Sanchez. In June of 1914, Regla Maria um, went with her cousin, the 12 year old Elena to pick up laundry um, that her mother had washed for a client. So her mother was a washerwoman. Um, and she, I think her daughter actually was taking laundry to one of her clients, a single 49-year-old man um, named Enrique Guerrero y Ruiz. So in June of 1914, Regla Maria and her cousin went to deliver these clothes to, um, to Enrique. And according to both of them, when they got there, Enrique grabbed Regla Maria, shut the door and raped her. Um, she didn't mention it until a day or so after it had happened to her mother, but things moved quite quickly once she did. Guerrero was arrested, charged with rape, um, and the prosecution recommended that he receive 14 years in prison for his crime and a fine of 2000 pesos and that he take responsibility for any offspring that might result from his attack on Regla Maria. I found this case really interesting because there's a lot of documentation of the investigation that the police did. Regla Maria was mestiza. She was of mixed African descent um, and she enjoyed a very good reputation. The police spoke to her neighbors. They spoke to her teachers at school, finding that she was a very respectable 13 year old girl, someone who behaved within the bounds of what was appropriate behavior. A doctor who inspected her found that she had been a virgin just days previously, which indicated that she was telling the truth about what had happened to her. Um, but Guerrero's lawyer 
attempted to cast doubt on the teenager's reputation and her narration of what had happened at Guerrero's apartment. So the questions he asked kind of questioned every single action she took or didn't take over the course of this, uh, the commission of the sexual violence. Why she didn't scream, why she didn't try to escape when Guerrero only used one hand to close the door, why she didn't tell anyone immediately, et cetera. And ultimately, Guerrero's lawyer strategy was successful. Guerrero was um, acquitted on all charges. Um, and so he was, he was found not guilty and Regla Maria was left, and her mother and cousin were left to deal with the trauma of what extremely likely happened to her. So I use this court case and others to argue that the, the notions of citizenship in Cuba and honor, which is a much older kind of standard of behavior, collided in the early 20th century. Regla Maria was a citizen. She had the right to the court system and the court system did go to bat for her. They tried to prosecute the man who had attacked her. They saw her as a child. She was noted as a, a menor in the court cases. So she was understood to be a girl, to be a, a girl child um, by the court. But I argue that was not enough to overcome older standards of what it meant to be a young black girl. He found skepticism that Guerrero's lawyer displayed in the possibility that she could have been raped shows, I think, the way in which Black girls were not, not immediately believed, were not believed at all, even when there was overwhelming evidence um, that they had been victimized in some way. And so, like I said, that's just one example of a few court cases um, I go into in the chapter. But I think that looking at specific cases like these um, is something that historians of a later time period in Cuba could do if they were interested in accessing these questions of race and gender in post-1959 Cuba, which as I said, is not an easy task given that the revolutionary government saw the question of race as solved. And in the 1970s actually began to see the question of gender um, as solved as well. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> our final paper today uh, will be given by Vanessa Plumley. Uh, Vanessa is an ACM Mellon faculty fellow and assistant professor of German studies at Lawrence University, where she is also an affiliate faculty member in ethnic studies. Her most recent publication is an article in seminar titled Auf den Spuren ihrer Geschichte, Black German Detectives and the Cases of Anais Schmitz and Fatou Fall. She is currently working on her first monograph, Black German Belonging, Politics, Performativity, and Place, and an edited volume with Tiffany Florville on uh, Innovations in Black European Studies. She is co-editor of the volume Rethinking Black German Studies, and her paper today is entitled Of Confinement and Liberation, Black German Childhood Narratives. Vanessa. Can you all see this? I'm going to make sure that it is playing from start. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So thank you again um, to everyone who organized this conference and thank you to Corey and Keisha for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm not a historian. <laughs> I will use that as a caveat. Um, I'm in cultural studies, Black German studies um, and do more of a literary take on um, Black German girlhood. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, within the context, the German context, Blackness occupies heterogeneous and often ambiguous positionings both from within and without. Overtly racist and infantilizing terms became popular parlance in dominant media and everyday discourses throughout 20th century, century Germany. Through their labeling of Black Germans as eternally juvenile, white Germans nodded to their fear of miscegenation, which further hinged on the stereotype of Blackness as hypersexual. White Germans' efforts to make Black Germans less threatening, quote unquote, to the national body rendered Black Germans small and prepubescent. And these are just some of the examples that I'm showing you here, um, by no means all. 
With the publication in 1986 of the seminal text Farbe bekennen Afrodeutsche Frauen auf den Spuren ihrer Geschichte, or translated as Showing Our Colors, Afro-German Women Speak Out in 1992, members of the Black German community under the guidance of Caribbean American Audre Lorde created the self-designations Afro-German and Black German. Afro-German designates a German individual who has a white German parent, often the mother, and a Black German parent, often the father. Black German is broader in its usage, embracing German citizens who have common experiences of racism and discrimination, and thus incorporates other people of color. In this volume, among other contributions, Afro-German women narrated their childhood experiences, often for the first time. Several accounts document their childhood with white families and their socialization as white. Some women recount narratives of their adoptive, often white parents. A few discuss their extended kinship networks. As a result of this volume, its impact, and the Black German women's evolution within a predominantly female and lesbian community, women initially directed autobiographical writing in the Afro and Black German women's movement and in the, this context in particular. What I refer to as kinship in this presentation is the German national form of concretizing Blackness as child or kind-like in order to structure a denial of kinship and belonging to the supposedly mature white German national community. As such, white Germans withhold Black Germans membership in the imagined community of German kin on a macro level. At the same time, Black Germans actively demonstrate their own agency in determining and articulating their positionalities from within German society. Their liberatory kinship is embodied in and enacted through the childhood kinship bonds they established within their white German families that contributed to their belonging on a micro level. They narrate these from the present as adults in autobiographical works. As such, Black German women's autobiographical writing defies the imposition of an endless childlike status of confinement and detaches them from Black German's discursive exclusion from without. Their coming of age may be a non-normative process due to racist and sexist structures, but it transpires despite its repudiation. Resisting the trope of perpetual youth, Black German women engender their national belonging in writing, giving birth to a multiracial German nation and leaving a legacy for the next generation of Black Germans to come. So a genre that details one's life, auto, life autobiography lends itself to an analysis of childhood, of course here, girlhood, and of kinship and kindship. In the longer chapter contribution to Keisha and Corey's edited volume, I interpret these three Afro-German women's autobiographies. That in the first year, I'm only going to focus on um, the first two. Unfortunately, I don't have time for the third. Um, but the first two are what I will focus on today. Um, and this includes Marie Neyar's 2007 autobiography that details her survival under the National Socialist regime and her later life and career, and Ika Hugo Marshall's 1998 autobiography, Invisible Women, Woman Growing Up Black in Germany, which itself was one of the first comprehensive um, Afro-German autobiographies to be published. And she did this as a result of Audre Lorde spurring her to publish her, her narrative. And it's about her quest to find her African-American father. These authors hail from different generations. They come of age in distinct socio-historical contexts. Neyar during the Third Reich, Hugo Marshall in the post-World War II era, and Tega in the second generation of the post-World War II era. Each has a unique positioning vis-a-vis -vis the Afro-German diaspora, and there's really no way to generalize uh, the Black diaspora in Germany in any capacity. Neyar's father is Ghanaian, though her mother too was also Afro-German. Um, so she has a very um, interesting multiracial history. Hugo Marshall's father is African-American and Tigas is Nigerian. They demonstrate this heterogeneity. Um, and so what I'm featuring today is the term kinship bonds in relation to these women that they establish with their white German family members, in particular, the white German maternal grandmother who haunts the texts as the common specter. She functions as provider, protector, and caregiver. Often, and not always though, she contrasts with the mother of these women who does not fully identify with her daughter, rejects her due to white German society's own ostracization of her, or does not want to be her mother. So there are fundamental differences across these intersectional divides um, that include racial, maternal, and generational um, complications for Afro-German women's kinship 
um, and belonging. And of course, this reveals itself in the form of racial hauntings. Both text and image transport the cumulative effects of what I call or term the affective filter in these autobiographies. So what I'm looking at is the um, three macro lenses, the first being um, apparatuses, the second being apparitions, and the third being apprehensions. And app is all about orientation. That is what the origin of the term comes from. So an apparatus organizes and can be politically constituted. One example is the country's governing bodies. A device or mechanism that humans use is also an apparatus. So in terms of the apparatuses that I address, I specifically deal with institutions of kinship, race, and gender, and I'm also concerned with the camera as a physical apparatus that captures and conveys affective kinship bonds through photos. So these apparatuses complicate belonging through their intersections and through their framing. An apparition can be defined as the appearance of a dead spirit. So for this lens, I'm focusing on ghosts, real and imagined hauntings, and generations as phenomena. And building on existing scholarship, I probe what haunts these autobiographies at the level of the text and uh, image. Apprehension, apprehensions are understood mostly as detainment anxiety about the future or present and the ability to comprehend something. So here I'm centering the concepts of racial miscegenation and transformation. Um, and so photographic images of Afro-Germans arrest the historical reality of these interrelation, interracial relations in time. And as a result, white German anxieties um, incite what sociologist Avery Gordon refers to as a haunting or quote, um, a something to be done. And here I'm, I'm thinking about this in the context of race and racism in German society. So taken together, these three macro lenses orient Afro-German women in the narration of their life experiences and kinship. In her chapter in the volume Rethinking Black German Studies titled Everyday Matters Haunting in the Black Diasporic Experience, Kimberly Alicia Singletary draws on the work of Gordon to argue that American Blackness haunts the capacity and existence of Black Germanness, and oftentimes erases the very fact of German Blackness through its dominant positioning in, white, in the white German imaginary. Singletary writes, quote, haunting often refers to the physical absence of matter that is physically felt. It is the impact on our mental state that makes haunting such a powerful act, end quote. So in Afro-German girlhood narratives, white German grandmothers embody both this absence and presence. They often occupy the status and position of the missing mother, um, and they're further gener generation removed, so they haunt this present from an irretrievable lived past. And they also present a white um, jarring presence across these filial bonds that they establish. The grandmother's whiteness haunts the blackness of Afro-German girls, and at times it displaces that very blackness to emphasize the granddaughter's belonging and her kinship connection. And this is because the granddaughter's blackness also haunts the imagined white German national family that denies that belonging. So I read them together to argue that they represent the reality of multiracial German families and counter these attempts at erasure of these established filial bonds. Um, by seeping into the narrative and lived experiences, the grandmother's whiteness also permeates the boundaries of the apprehended and visually framed kinship bonds. This represents what feminist memory studies scholar Mariana Hirsch, who's also here um, in the image, articulates as photographs occupying a, quote, space of contradiction between the myth of the ideal family and the lived reality of family life. Photographs can more easily show us what we wish our family to be, and therefore what most frequently it is not, end quote. Thus, kinship is simultaneously established via family bonds and disrupted through exclusion from the imagined white German national community. So this affective filter produces this contradictory kinship, um, but it also has the power to potentially be drawn upon to rectify um, the damage. So I'm going to dive into Marie Nayar's work. Um, her autobiography, as I said, details her survival as a child actress, um, and she was cast in minor roles in Nazi German cinema. She also sang um, her work at a cookie factory until the end of World War II, and her career um, as a nurse. After bearing a white German child out of wedlock and being cast out of her family, Nayar's grandmother married a Caribbean man and gave birth to two Afro-German children one of which was Nayar's mother. So though Nayar never knew her grandfather, her grandmother served as her sole and primary caretaker, and she died when Nayar was 18. 
Nayar and her mother never maintained a close relationship, even though she knew her. Um, and Nay Nayar's father was Ghanaian, and he and her mother had a very fleeting rela relationship. And so he had vis visited her occasionally, and at one time she saw a picture of him um, that she really couldn't identify with at all. Um, she couldn't identify with her mother or her father. Um, and so of her mother, Nayar writes that, quote, she appeared every week at my grandmother's where I lived and often brought me gifts, but I never got along with her. For me, my grandmother was my mother. She was the one who took care of me, put food on the table for me, and made sure that I felt at home. Um, and despite this clearly articulated emotional and maternal connection, she remains really critical of her grandmother. She notes this one experience where she encountered racism and she comes back to her grandmother and asks her if she did something wrong um, and why she's being punished about this or for this. Um, and her grandmother just tells her to stop, you know, um, worrying about it, that everything's fine. And so it's this very colorblind experience that she encounters. Um, and in, in this attempt to protect her granddaughter, she actually reinforces the destructive um, nature of racism. So Nayar also reflects on this time directly before World War II broke out and when she was sick and the Jewish family doctor declared that she actually needed to go to the hospital. And her grandmother questioned the doctor, what do you really mean by actually? Um, and then, of course, he explains that if she goes to the doctor, she'll be sterilized, um, according to National Socialist German race laws at the time. And Nayar's grandmother retorts, um, quote, that is not even a possibility. They can sterilize cows, but not my granddaughter. She is not livestock, end quote. So this is one realization alongside others that her white grandmother has of the macro level impact of racism and sexism's intersections. Um, Nayar's grandmother comprehends the racial difference in the eyes of white German society that Nayar experiences um, and repeatedly seeks to protect her from the fascist regime. In the chapter titled, A Young Girl Like All the Others, question mark, Nayar clearly conveys how she felt, quote, secure with her grandmother. Grandmother and I were an official team. We lived in our two-person family. For me, she was one of a kind. So still there's this unbridgeable racial gap that exists between the two of them um, that obviously is articulated through both macro and micro levels. And so she can see um, the care that her grandmother gives her, but there's also this very um, distinct difference between the two of them. So given the sense of belonging her grandmother produces for Nayar, it is not surprising that the first image the reader confronts, aside from the cover, is a portrait of Nayar's grandmother as a young woman. The reader stumbles upon another image of her grandmother later in the text, and this time it's as if something was removed or cut out. There's this white space between the two of them. And so I ask these questions. Was this image taken from a scrapbook? In what ways does it evoke the familial and maternal bond between grandmother and granddaughter? What do we make of this visible gap? What should fill the space but is absent? Is it her mother? Um, does it evince, evince race here, whiteness as a void? as an unbridgeable divide? Is it a generational gap? Or maybe it's all of the above. So the image draws the two together in the unity of an oval or even a heart, and it articulates that they're close, even if not completely touching um, or bound by the same frame. In her monograph, Image Matters, Archive, Photography in the African Diaspora, Tina Kemp asserts that with photographs, quote, given their context, the home and everyday life, their primary register is clearly that of the family. But that register is not merely descriptive, for such photographs do not record simple relations of kinship or genealogy. They are also, quote, objects that catalyze affect and make affect register, end quote. So these images no doubt establish kinship connections and attachments to the textual narrative, serving as one mode through which affective filial bonds in multiracial families are filtered through to the reader. However, the image remains ambivalent. It is presented as if this is as close as the two might ever come. And I'm referring back to the image of um, Nayar and her grandmother. So now I'll talk briefly about Ika Hugo Marshall's text. Um, she belongs to the generation of so-called occupation children, um, or as this generation has coined for itself, children of liberation. She is one of about 3,000 mixed race children born in the post-war period to African-American GIs and to white German mothers. At the young age of seven, Hugo Marshall's mother sent her to a Protestant institution, God's Little Cabin, at the behest of the racist German youth services. Um, her family's white social worker feared youth pregnancy and sexual deviancy, 
as did a sister working at the Protestant children's home. So we see this intersection of race and, and sexism and the idea that the coming of age is what threatens the German nation. Although Hugo Marshall writes fondly of her family expressing love for both her mother and her grandmother um, and, and sort of defends the decision of her mother to send her to a home, um, it created a rift in her childhood and family life. Um, according to Hugo Marshall, her mother made this decision with her best interests in mind. Um, but alongside her mother, Hugo Marshall mentions her grandmother in the first pages. And she, like Nayar's Oma um, or grandmother, features not only in the narrative, but also in these images. Um, the opening pages describe Hugo Marshall's family and the situation that she has, um, which is basically there's this lack of a father figure, lack of a person of color, and this is obviously a result of, of racist um, laws and regulations and the fact that her father gets sent back to the United States. Um, and so she stresses this desire for a positive reference for blackness, but she, she doesn't have it. Um, and so she says that her grandmother ultimately gave her a sense of belonging. Quote, she let me know that I was her favorite grandchild, and I suffered greatly when she died at 90 years of age. So similar to Nayar's narrated response to her grandmother's death, Hugo Marshall alerts the reader to her grief experienced from this loss. So in the photographic images present Hugo Marsh, in Hugo's Marsh, Hugo Marshall's autobiography, her grandmother appears in three. I'm only going to focus on two. Hugo Marshall stands front and center in the cover image of the English translation from 2008. And this is because she's holding a bike probably, um, but she's surrounded by her grandmother, her mother and her little sister who is also white. Um, and so they frame her in this, this background. Um, it's also found in the German version of the autobiography, that image. In the other images from both language versions, Hugo Marshall is physically connected to her grandmother. Arms outstretched as a toddler, she holds her grandmother's hand in an image that depicts their filial bond. The two appear to maybe even be dancing, um, given this blurred motion that we see on the grandmother's left hand. In the next image, the viewer sees Hugo Marshall and the other women in her family, um, and even one of her neighbors. And in it, she stands at her grandmother's side. And we see one hand is visible on her lap, and the other, we assume, is behind Hugo Marshall's back. The bond the two share solidifies through touch in these images. Hugo Marshall's representation of her family in post-World War II Germany summons an intact conjugal fami family unit. Her grandmother and mother's relationship is amenable and she has a father figure present in her life. Um, we get images of her white stepfather and we also then later get the images of her African-American father who she meets eventually. So I'm going to sort of bring this all back together, um, focusing first on Hugo Marshall and then the uh, first text as well, Nayar's. What haunts the myth of the familial gaze that these photos, these family photos capture, is the fact that the text provides us with information that calls into question what Hirsch terms an embeddedness in familiality. Since Hugo Marshall spent much of her childhood in an institution, her blackness relegated her to a space outside of the domestic family frame at the same time that the images depict her as an integral part of it. As a result of white German fears of miscegenation and blackness, black German children in the post-World War II context haunted the nation's self-image. So what haunts these selected images in Hugo Marshall's autobiography is um, a whiteness that makes the knowledge of exclusion invisible without this context, without the text itself and without the context. The affinity of gender and the desire for maternal nurturing and kinship connections affected the relationships that these Afro-German women forged to their racially and generationally removed white German grandmothers. They bridged while not effacing existing racial and at times generational divides that haunt both the text and image in these autobiographical accounts of childhood. The apparatuses of race, gender, nation, kinship, and history leave their imprint on both the texts and the camera's captured images that are embedded in these works. The familial and generational apparitions that permeate the written narrative and become arrested in the images disrupt the apparatuses functioning in the service of a hegemonically conceived white German nation. Apprehensions that white Germans have about racial mixing are transformed in these works through Gordon's something to be done about race and racism that these autobiographies bring into the picture. By dismantling and deconstructing white Germans' mythical racialized pathologies of blackness, Afro-German narratives facilitate a transformative and liberatory acknowledgement of the complexity of Afro-German women's kinship, envisioning and archiving multiracial bonds 
both within and even beyond the German nation. Thank you. So welcome along then to this session on environment. In the late 1980s, geographer Edward Soger wrote despairingly on what he called the silenced spatiality of historicism, the silent spatiality of historicism, namely the purported failure of historians to accord adequate attention to space rather than time in their analyses. Soja's critique was a spark for the spatial turn within history, one of the more fundamental turns, I would argue, for scholars of children and youth, and one which served to amplify the work of social historians, such as Anna Dabin, through insisting on space and place as vital components of fine-grained historical research. And hence this panel today, which purposefully brings together scholars with expertise on geography, on architecture, on space and place through a focus on the urban. So we have four speakers and three papers uh, as in the previous panel. And as yesterday, I will introduce each speaker or pair of speakers in turn just before their paper. And hence first, we're going to hear from Dr. Sarah Mills. And Sarah is a reader in human geography at Loughborough University here in the UK. Her research explores the geographies of youth citizenship, informal education and volunteering in both historical and contemporary contexts. She is the author of Mapping the Moral Geographies of Education, Character, Citizenship and Values, published in 2021 by Routledge, and co-editor of Informal Education, Childhood and Youth, Geographies, Histories, Practices, published by Palgrave in 2014. She has received research awards from the Royal Geographical Society and the American Association of Geographers, and she is former chair of the Royal Geographical Society's Geographies of Children, Youth and Families Research Group. So with pleasure, over to you, um, Sarah. Thank you. Oh, well, many thanks, uh, Simon, uh, Will, all the organisers, uh, the Society for the History of Children and Youth and the Children's History Society. Um, I've really enjoyed the workshop so far, and I'm going to be talking to the title today, Changing Environments and Spatialities, Historical Geographies of Childhood and Youth. So uh, I'm a cultural historical geographer that focuses on the lives of children and people in the past and, and more recently the present. Um, and I've explored a range of British youth movements and their constructions of mainly youth citizenship over the last century or so, but also, as, as Simon mentioned, kind of spaces of informal education. My last few projects have, have been a little bit more on kind of government led youth volunteering programmes, thinking about maybe some of the continuities and discontinuities in, in those organisations. And Simon asked me to, to speak to the theme for this panel, environment. And I mean, that word just absolutely sums up geography, uh, both its human geography and its physical geography side. And of course, there are whole careers worth of research and experts on the discipline and its contested history, its X-rated history in terms of colonialism and empire, geographical knowledges and, and critical debates. And as a discipline, it occupies, I guess, a curious place between the natural sciences and the social sciences but then also the humanities in its more cultural, historical um, subfields. And I work in a department of geography and environment. So it's, it's part of my everyday life really. And I'm using it here really in its broadest sense because clearly children and young people's lives over the centuries and across the globe have been navigated through and experienced within changing environments, whether that's social, economic, cultural, political, and more recently digital environments. But I've coupled that in my title with spatialities, which is my core focus today, and I'll try and comment on the two. Now, I always feel a, a bit like a gate crasher when there's a gathering of historians, I have to say, but I've always felt very welcome in spaces with historians of childhood and youth and want to put on record my heartfelt thanks for the work the two societies do, the community of scholars that you're bringing together in this event, and for the inspiration that work in this field has given me as a geographer. Uh, I have to admit, I'm a little, I am a little bit starstruck at this event by the contributors and, and organisers. And in terms of my approach to archives as a geographer, my gosh, I would say I'm hopefully the total opposite of the comment that Mary had at the sociology conference at the end of the last panel, because I'm indebted to historians in terms of methodological work and learning, and that's an ongoing process for me and, and many others, I'm sure. So I want to use my paper and its reflections 
to focus on geographers working on childhood and youth that have been inspired by historians and hopefully historians of childhood and youth that have been inspired by some ideas in geography and those possibilities connected to the spatial turn that, that Simon outlined at the start. And I do think there could be closer conversation between these fields and that's why events like this are really great to help bridge some of those gaps or, or disciplinary kind of silos a little. So it's just great to, to be involved today. And as I said, work by historians of childhood and youth geography, uh, historians of childhood, sorry, has inspired lots of, of children and youth geographers. The example that always springs to, to mind to me is, is Mona Gleason's paper, Avoiding the Agency Trap. And the subtitle of that is Caveats for Historians of Childhood, Youth and Education or Children, Youth and Education. But I always see it and read it and say to myself, well, caveats for any geographer as well in this field or social scientist studying childhood, youth or education. And the reach of texts like that into children geography is my own core field is worth stressing. Noting, of course, I think the excellent comment in the previous panel on the social sciences and qualitative social science that, of course, then recognises the kind of uniqueness of history and that the past is radically different. And I think Christine summed that up great. So I'm, I'm not going to do that again. So just as a bit more context, um, and I'm conscious there are different ways of telling subdisciplinary histories. But the subfield of children's geography is developed in tandem with debates on the new social studies of childhood in the 1990s and 2000 that foreground the agency, participation and voices of young people in both research and, and social life. And this work has and remains overwhelmingly focused on children's contemporary lives. But there is a growing body of work on this in historical context I'm going to share and, and try and do justice to. Not least because I'm conscious there's hopefully a, a bunch of folks online here as well that are maybe new scholars in the field, PhD researchers, etc. So I'm going to move into an overview really now of, of what I mean by historical geography as childhood and youth, why a geographer kind of focuses on environments or spatialities and what this might perhaps offer in considerations of children's history, maybe whatever discipline um, anybody's from. And I'd love to give you just a little window on that world of historical geographies of childhood and youth, uh, if nothing else. So the remaining structure of the paper after this introduction section I've just done is what are the historical geographies of childhood and youth? What are geographies and spatialities? I've then actually got a short section on changing environments connected to teaching actually on the histories of, of childhood and youth. And then I'm going to conclude with some future reflections and possibilities. So what are the historical geographies of childhood and youth? Well, well, to me, they capture the ways in which children and young people's lives have been shaped and experienced over time and space. And, and it's that key concept of space really and place that to, to me define my identity as a human geographer and that many have argued have something to offer conceptual debates on, on childhood and youth, whether that's on children's everyday spaces, spaces of childhood, institutional geographies, place-based encounters, children's sense of place, and you could have a whole two-day workshop on any one of those themes and, and it could be very interdisciplinary. I certainly was inspired as an undergraduate student by um, the geographer Liz Gagan's archival work on cultural historical geographies of the US playground movement and gender, um, Chris Philo's work, Teresa Plajaska and others, who brought historical sources to life for me and were able to chart in particular, I think, the spatial dimensions of children's spaces or rural and urban childhood, because that, that's simply just the undergraduate journey that I went on as a, as a human geographer. Now, the historical geographies of child and youth is not a huge field compared to social or political geography, and it tends to be published more as kind of isolated journal articles across the discipline. And we can compare this to, I think, a much more lively, I would say, subfield of history that's focused on childhood and youth represented in, in the workshop and the societies here in terms of scope and scale. And of course, as we know, there are studies that include kind of geographically relevant material, but lots now that has an explicitly spatial perspective. Um, and, and again, the example that jumps to mind to, to me is Lakeisha Simmons' fantastic book, Crescent City Girls, that was mentioned in the previous panel. So I was super excited to, to hear Keisha earlier and, and Corinne, and I'm so excited about your edited book. They, there was a line in their paper at two o'clock about the local and the global that just kind of made my heart sing. So that'll be straight on my reading list here. <laughs> So there is, and there has been, and so I'm hinted at this, this kind of um, historical work on childhood youth and education that's been bringing some of these perspectives in. And um, again, another example would be the, the 2010 special issue in the journal History of Education by Burke, Cunningham and, and Grosvenor, which is called Putting Education in Its Place, Space, Place and Materialities in the History of Education. And even though that's coming from a perspective focused on schools and architectural history, its final paper in that special issue is, is from a geographer. And when you read that editorial introduction or when I read it, they're, they're authors writing as histories of education, but they just sound so geographical, whether consciously or unconsciously. 
speaking to those debates about space and place, which clearly a wide range of scholars and disciplines have developed and embraced um, with the wider interdisciplinary kind of spatial turn, um, but are the bread and butter of contemporary human geography. So, so let's turn to them now in a little bit more detail. So what do I mean by geographies? And I think it's easier here for an example. I'm going to use the geographies of informal education because that's what I've most focused upon in research projects. And I'm drawing now in this section on the editorial introduction to a book co-edited with Peter Craftle that Simon mentioned, Informal Education, Childhood and Youth, Geographies, Histories, Practices. And I want to acknowledge that um, and, and kind of, it does bring together primarily geographers, but there's some historians of youth work in there as well. So a focus on geographies in the context of informal education, um, we kind of tentatively suggest would focus on how institutional um, kind of educational practices operate in, through and as spaces. And to take that a step further, to consider the spatialities of informal education, and, and I'll move to spatiality in a bit, <clears throat> but I wouldn't be a geographer if I didn't speak to the importance of place and location first, of the unique characteristics of different countries and nation states, to the development of, for example, educational philosophies, policy and practice. And it's one of the first, perhaps most obvious things we do, isn't it, in, in any paper, I think from any discipline, is we say we're studying childhood or children in X part of the world. Um, so in each country, the social construction of childhood may flow from particular sets of social concerns, political currents, representations of childhood and youth. But I think more than just geographical coverage, research on childhood, youth and education in particular, I think can attend to how children's lives are woven into and implicated in the complex social kind of political and cultural textures that make up particular places. So this is based, I guess, on an understanding of geography that doesn't just map out social phenomenon on X topic in X location. Because even though such studies are important, the geographer Claudia Hansen theme um, says when it's about education, they can then sometimes perhaps neglect some constitutive properties. So how educational systems, institutions and practices perhaps change, um, affect change beyond the sector. And so the ambition of a geographical approach, um, perhaps a kind of slightly um, next level would have that attentiveness to spatiality. So the definition of this that I'm drawn to is still the one Peter Kraftel's drawn to in much of his own work and that we cite again in that editorial, which is from Pyle and Keefe in 1993, some geographers that I'm going to quote, which is that spatiality is the complex theorizations of mat material and symbolic life, that crucially the social and the spatial are inextricably realized in one another. So overall then, a focus on spatiality brings with it perhaps a requirement to exceed what immediately might seem geographical about education or childhood or any other topic really. And thus the geographies of childhood and youth are, are complex, multifaceted and multi-scaled. And these dynamics can still be captured in what might be seen as more classic geographical models of representation and mapping. So there's some really exciting work being developed by Megan Cope, for example, in Vermont, a geographer studying historical childhood and youth, developing quite creative cartographic representations of childhood in the past, particularly in her teaching, uh, but also through digital archival sources, GIS, urban planning, and, and focusing on ideal childhoods too. So it's been repeatedly shown, I guess, that the construction and experience of childhood are inherently spatial from the rules that shape public spaces to the ways in which children seek to carve out niches in kind of overwhelmingly adult controlled environments. And that overlaps then with themes of power, identity, social cultural difference, lots of things captured in this symposium. And space matters. And I guess it's that focus and conceptual framework that I've tried to develop in my own research to consider how the space of a youth organization, such as the Scouts or the Woodcraft Folk or the Jewish Lads Brigade, for example, can be used as a lens through which to understand those changing environments of children's lives, whether it's the advent of youth culture, political debates, changing gender roles, religious diversity, but most of all, the understandings of citizenship, <clears throat> the moral geographies of those spaces beyond schools, and to try and capture the spatialities of those, art um, of those organizations, sorry, in a, a series of articles that look at how moral geographies are cast in space. And my latest book does that by looking at character education, um, I hope in both historical and contemporary contexts, schools and youth movements, to try and talk across those case studies to ask how character education has been brought to life through its spatial dimensions and, and map the moral geographies of education, not a literal mapping, as I mentioned earlier, but a kind of more um, metaphorical mapping and its different multi-scalar forms. 
That said, as I said earlier, historical work in children's geographies is still fairly niche compared to, like I say, participatory research with children, young people in contemporary contexts, which is the primary um, kind of arena in which my, my research kind of culture is, I guess. So it's therefore been the vibrancy of work within historical studies of childhood, leisure and education that has been the real influence for me as somebody working on the past lives of children within a geography department and engaging with work by historians of youth work, community work, etc., to try and get those insights into people's past experiences of spaces beyond school. And I could reel off a list of authors, many are participants at this workshop, but historical scholarship um, that, that yes, has, fa has charted factors in maybe the historical development of a youth organization, but actually really captured, I think, the multiple enlivened histories of informal education to think about the fragmented, embodied, diverse experiences of those spaces. And so the more I wrote this paper, the more it has ended up being a thank you to historians of childhood and youth. And that I hope hints at some more of the possibilities of spatialities, maybe some future directions too, as I'm gonna to move to in a bit. But as I can, before I conclude on those future directions, I've got a brief section of the paper on teaching, um, as, as I mentioned at the start. So in this workshop, we're obviously reflecting back on, on 1972, those two significant moments in youth history and, and, and what a legacy there and, and its kind of critical pathways. But I wanted to just reflect on, on teaching, which may seem a little odd in a kind of research focused conference, but I think it's important, not least on the changing environments in the study and teaching of children and youth history, whether that's in historical studies or indeed human geography or other fields. And I know this panel is bringing together a lot of different perspectives. One of the contributions when considering the trajectories of youth history, the stock taking as such in, in the symposium, I think are the teaching contributions. And I want to apologize if perhaps some papers in sessions I've not been able to attend with work, kind of commitments have touched on, on this. But I wanted to pause and acknowledge how scholarship from your or our field appears within contemporary undergraduate and postgraduate teaching, graduate students, etc. Because it maybe it might come as a surprise to you that scholarship on youth history appears, for example, in social science modules on our programmes here in geography and is used to prompt critical questions to students around debates on agency, for example. So I wanted to acknowledge the contribution that when we're thinking about trajectories of youth history, we also capture kind of pedagogical achievements and trajectories and pathways and reflect on future challenges too. The past few years in UK higher education and a range of other contexts represented here are no I've seen a number of trade union disputes, closures, threats of closures and redundancies for history and geography departments and challenges for the wider humanities and the work we do, our scholarship. So future trajectories of youth history can't really be separated or detached from that, I think. And given the unique bringing together here of international delegates, I also just wanted to acknowledge some of those collective struggles and solidarities across nations, institutions and across our disciplines too. But let's end on a slightly more positive note, though, <laughs> of more forward looking and opportunities. I think there's really exciting debates in and through the histories of childhood and youth, methodological innovations, digital archives, new critical perspectives, challenging existing debates as new scholarship emerges, new voices are heard. What a welcome opportunity has been um, for me and, and I know others to hear new papers today and yesterday and just have that um, those moments. So in conclusion, I hope that this paper has provided a short overview on the key ideas or concepts in the historical geographies of childhood and youth, and that I've conveyed how spatiality can be a useful idea, that it's simply another strand, another conceptual device, and one that helps to foster a geographical imagination. Historical geographies of childhood and youth are complex and multi-scaled, and I hope this has maybe been a bit of a teaser to perhaps um, check out some of those authors' work uh, I've mentioned, and that there is this increasing engaging scholarship with a geographical inflection by historians it's really really clear to me to see that and work out shows how children and young people's lives are shaped and experienced at the local national and global scale as well as you know the scale closest within a geography would say the body uh, and that too is a really exciting future direction about enlivened and embodied history of childhood and, and youth that I know there's lots of, of contributors to so my hope is that our understanding of children's worlds over time and space um, continues to be enriched, that a geographical sensibility has something to offer the rich body of historical scholarship of childhood and youth that has certainly been an inspiration to me and I know many others, and that these fields will have closer conversations in the years to come. So thank you very much for listening, um, and I look forward to any questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, that was wonderful. And um, if you might be so kind, perhaps, um, in the rest of the session, you might type three or four of those favorite readings into the chat box, um, just in case um, people didn't note them down. 
that that would be wonderful. We'll have something to yep. take away from from the session in that regard. So our next speaker is going to be um, Professor Marta Gutman. And if you wanted to start sharing your slides in a moment, Marta, um, that can happen while I start to introduce you. Okay, so Professor Marta Gutman, architectural historian and licensed architect, is the interim dean of the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York and Professor of Art History and Earth and Environmental Sciences at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Her paper is drawn from her current book project, the fabulously titled Just Space, Modern Architecture, Public Schools and Racial Inequality in Postwar Urban America. That's forthcoming with the University of Texas Press. Uh, Marta is the Distinguished CUNY Research Fellow in 2018 president of the Society for American City and Regional Planning History, a founding co-editor of Platform, which I enjoy receiving into my inbox regularly, and a former co-editor of Buildings and Landscapes, Journal of the Vernacular Architecture Forum. So with thanks, over to you um, for your paper, Marta. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon, and, for, and to the organizers for the invitation to join this workshop and I apologize for my hoarseness, which is the residual effect of an unwanted exposure to the disease that plagues our time, COVID. So I apologize for that. So I'll start by acknowledging that I am presenting from the unceded territory on the ancestral homeland of the Muncie Lenape, Wappinger, and Wequazajek peoples. As Simon just mentioned, this project, this presentation is drawn from the book that I'm writing. And I understood Simon's invitation to present in this, to join this workshop as one that would be drawn from a case study of my, of my new work, which is why I've structured the paper uh, that, in the way that I have. So um, my research began with the building you see here, a windowless junior high school that abuts the Park Avenue Railroad Viaduct between East 127th Street and East 128th Street in New York City's Harlem. I show that state actors used siting, design, and other physical tools to maintain the, stat the status quo racially segregated public schools in New York City. So, whoops, now why isn't this advancing? All right, maybe I have to do it here. All right, great, okay. So architects and planners, almost always white, male, and middle class, facilitated these egregious practices in the 1960s. These are the architects from New Orleans who designed IS-201 starting uh, in 1962. Faced with intransigent bureauc <coughs> bureaucracy, struggling schools, deteriorating buildings, and entrenched racial segregation, parents, teachers, and students boycotted IS-201 starting on the day it opened, the first day of school in September, 1966. White architects and politicians, including the mayor, John B. Lindsay, rallied in defense of the school, calling it, quote, Harlem's besieged masterpiece, close quote. But black and Puerto Rican parents disagreed. The location and the architecture, which they opposed, stood as a constant reminder of their unmet demands, from exclusion from policymaking to broken promises of integration. And they demanded direct control over the core functions of public, of public education. I have argued that while new modern schools were desperately needed in Harlem, they also harmed children. Too often the physical conditions defined black children as social subjects with inherently unequal citizenship rights. And yet school architecture is absent from the literature on the civil rights movement, the debates about education that the movement triggered and most histories of public education in New York City. As the education historian, John Aparillo has argued, quote, schools do not just offer unequal education experiences, they offer unequal chances of succeeding within those already skewed experiences, close quote. The pictures of protesters on this and the preceding slide were taken by James Hinton, the African-American documentary photographer who reported civil rights protests around the country. 
He underscored the importance of black children, education and schools in the civil rights movement in this and other instances here, on the one hand, capturing a parent carrying a poster labeled segregated schools and showing the impact a white hand squeezing blood from the body of a black child. And on the other hand, recording the seriousness of purpose among the youngsters watching the boycott on 127th Street, alert, engaged, and eager to learn. So today, I will situate the grassroots protest at IS-201 in the history of racial struggle for children's well-being in Harlem, in Harlem schools. At PS89 and PS10, Black parents set their sights on correcting the racial wrongs embedded in old-fashioned, poorly maintained and overcrowded public schools starting in the 1930s and continuing through the 1950s. They put public architecture for Black children front and center in the battle for racial equality in New York City. And the physical landscape, as I've argued, is a tangible measure, not only of adult hopes for children, but also of the failure to execute them. And the quality of school facilities was cited again and again as a, if not the prime indicator of racial segregation and its deleterious impact on black children and their education. So in this research, as with my previous work, I engage the history of childhood and youth with spatial thinking, architectural research, and urban and planning history. I want to continue to open new trajectories for understanding the spaces of children and their importance in the long civil rights movement with this new project. To frame my thinking, I've turned to historians of the Black freedom struggle, historians of memory, and political theorists, none more important than Henri Lefebvre, who has informed my study of public architecture for children from the start. So the three public schools I just mentioned aren't listed as landmarks or identified as cultural resources, although schools in other American cities are recognized for their significance in the civil rights movement. This is Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, where nine black teenagers defied violent white resistance and desegregated the school in 1957, uh, assisted by federal troops. The school, the high school, the high school was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1977, designated a National Historic Landmark in 1982, and made a National Historic Site in 1998 with a visitor center and a memorial garden, and you see some of those sites here. With respect to children's places, New Yorkers are, quote, like fish that can't see the water they are swimming in, close quote, to paraphrase the late historical geographer, Paul Grove, who was one of my mentors in my doctoral studies. Black children and their public schools belong in conversations about race, heritage, and architecture. And in making this claim, I joined architects, artists, and preservationists who in doing memory work are creating, quote, a culture of memory that is critical and emancipatory, close quote, in the words of the Mexican architect, Sergio Beltran Garcia. He insists that this work is, quote, not really about yesterday. It is about who we are today and who we want to be tomorrow. That is what memory is for, close quote. So just to review, the U.S. Supreme Court may have declared racial segregation unconstitutional in the landmark 1954 Brown v. Board of Education, but Northern cities lagged in desegregating public schools. New York City was no exception, a telling example of the myth of Southern exceptionalism in civil rights history. As James Baldwin said, quote, no moral distance, which is to say no distance between the facts of life, close quote, existed for Blacks in Southern and Northern cities. James Lawrence, the painter, captured the predicament of dreams realized, dreams deferred, and dreams denied in this stunning panel for the, that he painted in his Great Migration series in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. Three African-American girls lined up in front of a blackboard are learning to read, write, and calculate in a racially segregated public school in the urban North. Harlem was packed full of youngsters, uh, presumably the school that, uh, that Lawrence 
presumably, I presume that uh, Lawrence was depicting a school in Harlem. It was packed full of, of youngsters. In the early 1940s, 480,000 African Americans lived in the city with close to 300,000 residents living in Harlem. 33,000 were children, five to 14 years of age. The New York State Legislature banned racially segregated schools in 1900, and at almost three quarters of public elementary schools in New York City were predominantly 90% or more enrolled with black or white, black or what black and Puerto, with white or black and Puerto Rican students in 1955. Schools were old, overcrowded, and in poor repair, nowhere more so than in Harlem. In 1954, almost one third of the elementary schools that Black and Puerto Rican students attended had been built before 1900. So here's one of them. PS 89 opened in 1889 and redesigned in 1895 by CBJ Snyder the renowned architect who supervised school construction for the New York City Board of Education from 1891 to 1923. An ally of progressive era educational reform, Snyder won acclaim for his innovations in school design, including capacious classrooms and the generous windows that filled them with light and fresh air. By 1935, any association of this school with progressive reform had evaporated in Harlem. The target of repeated parental complaint, the Amsterdam News called for the replacement of PS 89 in a 1935 editorial entitled Build a New School. Coincidentally, one week later on March 19th, 1935, Harlem residents took to the streets in rage. The investigation of the conditions responsible for the rebellion cited second rate education and in, ex, in an excoriating critique of the physical aspects of schools described PS 89, just 40 years old, as unfit for use. This school contained, quote, in an extreme degree, all the bad features of the schools in Harlem, close quote, age, shabbiness, unsanitary conditions, students used outdoor toilets and old fashioned architecture. It was also a fire trap full of dark and stuffy classrooms. This overutilized school, 230,000, I'm sorry, excuse me, 2,300 school students enrolled in a facility designed for 1,600, required double sessions and lacked a gymnasium, library and other features the mayor's report deemed necessary in modern schools including ample up-to-date spaces for play. So in making the case that Black students deserved high quality schools in their own neighborhoods, Black activists compared segregated public schools in the urban North and the Jim Crow South. And the journalist George Schuyler invoked the term Jim Crow starting in the mid 1930s, calling segregated schools in Harlem examples of Jim Crowism. The invidious North-South comparisons escalated in the 1930s and 40s. A.M. Wendell Malliott, journalist and editor, repeated it in 1943 after another race riot shook the city and May Mallory shocked the Board of Education's Commission on Integration in 1957 when she described PS10, her daughter's public school, as quote, just as Jim Crow, close quote, as the school she had attended in Macon, Georgia. By way of dress and comportment, these portraits suggest a tolerance of the status quo that is gravely mistaken. Schuyler, Schuyler joined the Communist Party in the 1930s and Mallory, outspoken, working class and militant, expressly allied herself with the black radical tradition. So Mallory urged the Commission on Integration to quote, correct some of the injustice done to children at PS10, a massive five-story building also designed by Snyder in the mid 1890s. In a city renowned for its liberalism, in a country that prided itself on nurturing childhood during the Cold War, Mallory testified that black students coped with corporal punishment, incompetent and indifferent teachers, a condescending principal, unsupervised classrooms, and an outdated, overcrowded school facility quote, in deplorable condition, unquote. The small unkempt yard, 
the, it's the small unkempt rear yard proved fatal to children. Quote, the building is so old that the children are forced to play in the street, close quote, Mallory testified. Tragically, a youngster had been killed the year before. She testified in 1956, killed by a brewery truck uh, during lunchtime. When Mallory confronted the principal, he told her, as she reported to the commission, quote, this school is just as good as any other school in this community, close quote. Mallory refuted his condescending racism, telling the commission, quote, now we feel that comparing one crumb to with another, we do not want to be another crumb. We want to be compared with the whole loaf, the schools that his children go to, close quote. One complaint about sanitary facilities produced action. She reported that there were two bathrooms in the school for 1,600 students, and they were equipped with pit toilets that made the school smell terrible. Embarrassed, the state ordered the toilets repaired, but made no substantive progress on this matter at hand, which was racial integration. Mallory was undeterred. With Little Rock on their minds, as the historian Adina Back has shown, she and eight other mothers refused to send their children to segregated junior high schools in Harlem. Two are shown here from the 1920s, built from the 1920s. Mallory wanted her daughter to go to PS 118, the school you see on the right, a newer junior high school, the first so-called skyscraper school in New York City, outside of Harlem. Called the Little Rock Nine by the Amsterdam News, the mothers and their children boycotted the schools for 162 days in 1958. When the strikers were taken to court, Just Judge Justine Pollier dismissed the charges. She agreed, uh, Pollier was a great advocate for children in other arenas. She agreed with their attorney, Paul Zuber, that the egregious conditions in racially segregated public schools deprived children of their constitutional rights. In addition to referring to Brown, she invoked a startling new concept to assign cause to the wrongs done to black children in segregated schools. It resulted from an abject failure of government one that she named an invidious, insistent institutional racism, and the term stuck. Hollier's argument, coupled with the agitation of Black parents, forced the Board of Education to take action. Both schools were demolished and new school buildings were erected nearby, as you see uh, from these slides. Um, and although the dilapidated structures were erased, the plots persist. PS 89 was replaced with a 16 story apartment building on the left and a playground, a daycare center and another housing tower were built on the site of PS 10 on your right. These structures are geographic reminders of Garcia's point that memory work is not really about yesterday. It's about who we are today and who we want to be tomorrow. Marking these places, sites of struggle is needed to help create a critical emancipatory memory culture in New York City. Also absent from official public history, although not from black memory, are many other places where African-Americans organized on behalf of children. And in closing, I'll point out a few of them. Preston Wilcox, a social worker, used this settlement house as a basis for organizing for better schools in East Harlem in the late 1950s. Isaiah Robinson, a graphic artist, demanded architectural change at PS 139, a target of the 1958 boycott when he became president of the Parent Association in the early 1960s. He went on to form the Harlem Parents Committee and eventually he became the first black president of the New York City Board of Education. PS 139 was boycotted again on February 3rd, 1964, when more than 460,000 pupils, half the students enrolled in the city's public schools, stayed home demanding good integrated schools. This still remains the largest civil rights protest in US history. Alice, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry, that's an extra slide, I apologize. Uh, Alice Cornegay, a community organize, organizer, met her neighbors in the basement of this church, welcomed by the Rev, by, sorry, by Reverend Mel, Melvin Eugene Schoonover in the early 1960s. They organized a community association and were determined to build a new junior high school 
that would serve as an architectural beacon bringing all children to Harlem. When the Board of Education shared its plan to build a windowless school building, Cornegay, Wilcox, and Robinson revolted, and May Mallory joined them on the picket line in 1966, as I learned from reading the police files on the protest. Dismayed by segregation, empowered by spatial proximity, inspired by their children, they took over the junior high school. They set up an experiment in self-governance and constructed powerful counter-narratives for urban publication based on the premise of just space, racial equality, community control, and Black empowerment. As the historian Marcus Radiker reminds us, quote, history is something we learn so that the living, especially the rich and powerful, cannot be, play tricks on us, close quote. The neglect of children's heritage in Harlem is typical of public history in the United States. It is also profoundly racialized in New York City, effacing the history of the long civil rights movement in the urban North, diminishing the place of space in citizen participation, and reinforcing the historic wrongs imparted by the state on Black children. These absences, quote, reveal the costs of truths we deny and the myths we embrace, close quote, to borrow a phrase from the novelist Geraldine Brooks. The failure to identify, mark, list, and protect its reinscribed structures of racial oppression and represses material evidence of the ways in which Black New Yorkers took charge of public space and organized for change for their children using the built environment as a tool for liberation. Thank you. Fabulous, thank you so much, Marta. Um, wonderful, rich, evocative, lots to discuss later. Um, I won't get started now, but we will come back to this. So thank you very much. Um, and Lucy, if you'd like to start sharing your slides, I will now introduce you and John, um, who will be giving our final paper together. So firstly, Dr. John Winder is an early career researcher interested in histories of childhood and public space. He recently completed a PhD at the University of Kent, exploring the development of the children's playground in Britain from the mid 19th century through to the late 20th <laughs> century. His most recent publication in the journal Urban History explores the place of Wicksteed Park in the wider playground story. Dr. Lucy Glasheen is a teaching fellow in human geography at the University of Southampton, an honorary research fellow in the School of Languages, Linguistics and Film, where she has been co-investigator on the British Academy funded project, Childhood Heroes, storytelling survival strategies and role models of resilience to COVID-19 in the UK. She is currently in the early stages of a book project on play spaces, urban redevelopment and child citizenship in 1930s East London, based on PhD research, and has recently published on modern architecture in children's comics um, in a book called Building Children's Worlds, Architecture and Modernity in Picture Books, which is forthcoming. So over to you, John and Lucy. Thank you. Thanks, um, and thanks, uh, from both of us, thanks so much for the opportunity to be part of this panel and symposium, um, which has been really um, inspiring, um, really inspiring papers so far. Um, so when John and I thought about how our separate research projects might speak to one another's and to the panel uh, and to this panel, scale emerged as a clear point of connection and distinction and as a concept which might speak to wider concerns of historians of children, childhood and youth. Our research centres on the histories of spaces commonly understood as small. Playgrounds and play spaces are limited in extent, and despite the work of historians and geographers such as Elizabeth Gagan, Krista Kalman, Matthew Thompson and Simon Slight are still often overlooked. However, our approach to these spaces has been from ostensibly very different temporal and geographical scales. John's PhD looks at the national history of the British playground from 1840 to 1980, whereas my doctoral research focuses on a single decade and region, 1930s East London, but at a wide range of spaces produced as places for play by different cultural media. 
we also considered how my narrower uh, temporal and geographic focus has allowed me to look at narratives and representations created by um, and for children, as well as about them, something only possible through combining local, regional and national archives. This prompts the question as to whether a micro history approach is best suited to uh, incorporating or centering children as historical actors and producers, or whether do doing so risks reiterating the marginalisation of children and childhood and youth history, as the recent call in children's geographies for children's studies to move beyond child centrism for the purpose of theoretical development and engagement with broader scholarly fields perhaps suggests. I'm not going to attempt to contribute to this debate, which has almost certainly been running in various forms um, since at least the 1972 Childhood in History Children's Liberation Workshop, if not longer, or rehearse arguments about the micro and macro being inherently and inextricably linked. Instead, I think our work points to the messiness of such scalar uh, distinctions. Geographers have pointed out that scale should not be taken for granted as a natural or neutral unit or category of analysis, but like space is produced, contested, experienced and embodied. This presentation will consider some of the scales which place spaces have produced and been produced at, including that of the conference, drawing on specific examples from our research. Thanks, Lucy. So um, today I thought I would um, discuss the significance of the History Workshop um, 6 and the ideas it generated in two ways. Uh, firstly, as an underlying framework for my research, which challenges the seemingly natural assumptions about the spaces where children are supposed to play. And then secondly, as a historical moment that helped to shape the story of the children's playground um, as Lucy said, something I explored in my recent doctoral research. And so firstly, the ideas that came to fruition at History Workshop 6 have provided me with inspiration, prompting critical engagement with seemingly natural assumptions about adulthood and childhood and the physical expression of these norms in public space. These ideas emerged around the same time as the field of environmental history sought to critically examine the apparently obvious, but in fact highly political notions of nature and landscape, which in time also included the urban environment. Thinking from both subfields has been fundamental to my own work, exploring the ideas and actions that have sought to shape children's place in the city, framed as it often is by anxiety about interaction with nature. It's also worth noting, however, that my um, PhD research diverged somewhat from um, calls for a focus on children's lived experience and, and was much more a history of adult, adult ideas about childhood, um, their consequences for the material form of public spaces and children's use of them. Secondly, something I'll focus on more during this um, paper, History Workshop 6 and the subsequent papers and books that it generated have provided historical evidence that has helped me to make sense of the story of the playground in the late 20th and early 21st century. The principles and practices that led some to critique conventional orthodox playgrounds continue to echo in the present. For some History Workshop participants, the playground was characterized as a space where adults sought to exert control over children's public lives while today, some commentators on present day childhood dramatically brand the playground as a space of childhood incarceration. While the ideas from History Workshop endure in popular critiques of the present day playground, much less has been said about what these ideas and criticisms were reacting to. What play space forms were 1970s radicals reacting against? Was the playground then or now really a site of incarceration? Was the post-war adventure playground really a radical break with earlier thinking about and spaces for play? Next slide, please, Lucy. Thanks. So making sense of traditional and radical conceptions of the playground formed a key part of my recently completed PhD research. 
Uh, it plotted the erratic evolution of the children's playground in the 19th and 20th centuries to make sense of wider debates about children's place in public space. At the 1972 History Workshop, Paul Thompson from the University of Essex spoke about children's war with adults, later publishing his paper in the journal Oral History in 1975. He spoke of the social and cultural controls that parents, employers, teachers and the police sought to impose on children's lives, but also highlighted examples of resistance by children. The Adventure Playground was play praised by Thompson and other radicals as a space where children's resistance could flourish, as a space of liberation where children were able to fight back against adult control through self-expression and creativity. It contrasted sharply with traditional conceptions of the park playground which seemingly sought to limit children's behavior through design, choice of materials and expectations around social norms, which in turn justified their exclusion from the wider urban environment. But this critique of the conventional playground was far from straightforward. Adventure playgrounds were undoubtedly different from earlier versions, partly in, uh, particularly in the extent to which children could create and adapt to the play space environment. However, they were still dedicated spaces for children to play and were the product of long running debates about the rationale and design principles that should inform play space provision. For instance, in 1890s London, the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Public Gardens Boulevard and Playground Association promoted children's gymnasiums in a garden setting as a route to better physical health for children and to sustain the status of nation and empire. By the 1920s, play spaces were no longer segregated by gender as they had been, and the route to child health and happiness was through fun and excitement. Children's playground with jazz swings, joy wheels, giant slides, and other manufactured equipment inspired by amusement rides was being installed and promoted by the likes of Charles Wicksteed and co. In the 1930s, however, there were already critiques of this new orthodox playground, dominated as it was by swings and slides, from amongst others, the landscape architect and campaigner Marjorie Allen. Similarly, debate about adult involvement in the practices rather than just the spaces of public play had been circulating since the 1920s, particularly thanks to the work of Mabel Jane Reaney and other advocates of play leadership. In 1948, when Allen published her famous photo essay in the Picture Post promoting junk playgrounds, it brought together earlier critiques of the playground and ideas about play leadership in Britain with international experiments between landscape architects and pedagogues alongside the possibilities of bomb damaged plots of land. By the 1970s, the renamed adventure playgrounds provided an iconic example of the possibilities of childhood freedom in the enduring war with adults. But as historian Matthew Thompson has argued more recently, a wider backlash against child liberation or anxiety about, amongst other things, the safety of playground equipment and the dangers of dog poo increasingly influence play space provision, apparently closing down opportunities for playful creativity in public space. However, it's hard not to agree with the feeling of Iona and Peter Ropey, who saw the playground as something of an irrelevance to children and their play, a product of adult anxiety about urban childhood, rather than a response to children's playful needs or desires. That's not to say that playgrounds weren't used by children, but rather that they were one of many places where children spent their time in the city. For the sociologist Veer Hole, writing about high density housing estates in 1966, the use of playgrounds by children displayed similar patterns of behaviour to adult use of the local pub, a fun place to socialise with friends, but far from the only place where this took place. As a result, it's hard to see the playground as a form of incarceration. Adults collectively could rarely compel children to play in the playground. Instead, it represents one of a myriad of urban spaces where children contested adult ideas and material forms. At the same time, playground discourse and the provision of dedicated places for play may have made it easier for society, society to accept that streets were spaces for automotive movement rather than children's playfulness. We might therefore conclude that playgrounds are now an unnecessary waste of public space and resources. But in a present day urban environment that is often at best unwelcoming for children and young people, the playground perhaps acts as something of a signifier that children are in fact part of public life. 
It also points to the ongoing importance of histories of childhood in contributing to present day debate about social and spatial justice. And with that, over to Lucy. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, sorry. Oh, um, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, my research looks at the production of different kinds of play spaces in East London in relation to child citizenship and projects of urban redevelopment. This includes the increasing provision of playgrounds as part of housing estates built by the London County Council to replace cleared slums and the use of play to introduce new housing estate spaces in documentaries about slum clearance. It includes cartoon urban play spaces circulated in national and localised networks and the representation of cities as places for children's play in internationally translocated commercial films. It also includes magazines co-written by children, which I look at both as sources for child produced narratives about play and as themselves produced as local spaces and increasingly as spaces for play by both adults and children. In 1937, an interview with George Lansbury, mayor of Poplar and former leader of the Labour Party, appeared in the school magazine of Fairfield Road Senior Boys School. In it, Lansbury describes his first victory through collective action the successful petitioning of his headmaster when he was at school for playtime to be introduced. The inclusion of this interview in Fairfield magazine is significant. On the one hand, politics is translated as a, into a suitable topic for children by its connection with play, and play is presented as producing a future political citizen, or indeed a politician. On the other hand, play is represented as something that children have a right to and can, or perhaps even should, take organised political action to protect, in doing so embodying local citizenship. Moreover, play is clearly a suitable topic for a school magazine. The interview itself was conducted and written up by pupils along with the vast majority of the magazine, but the magazine was edited by the headmaster. This is thus an intergenerationally constructed understanding of children's play. It was one of a number of East London magazines produced by schools that were co-written and co-produced by, uh, by children and adults in which play and playful creativity by children was increasingly given magazine space during the decade. This varied from school to school and was not always uncontested. The 1934 edition of the Palmer to School magazine included published anonymous comments from their pupils, complaining that there was not enough about us in it, that their writing was being censored, and that there should be more play related content. These comments were mediated and edited and the request for play related content, which is the extract that I've put up there, um, was almost certainly fictionalised and included in order to belittle such a request. This is the only magazine content in which grammar and spelling were not standardised. Its inclusion, therefore, is evidence that the magazine needed to respond to ideas that it should be more child and play centred. In 1938 and 9, Mile End, Whitechapel, Limehouse and St George's Children's Libraries, all part of the East London Borough of Stepney, also started producing magazines co-created by children. A thousand copies of each edition were printed and editorial address suggests that they are predominantly aimed at local children, although like school and youth club magazines, they also made reference to a wider readership. The children's library magazines are particularly of note for how they produce themselves as a local public space. While school and youth club magazines, by definition, reproduced gendered, classed and or religiously segregated spaces, <coughs> children's library magazines explicitly included children of different genders, ages and from different schools 
producing a seemingly diverse and democratic space of proximity. Stepney Library magazines also position themselves very directly as spaces of, for and by children. The foreword of the first edition of Myland Children's Library magazine, probably written by the borough librarian, directly addressed boys and girls, telling them, we want the magazine, like the children's library, to be your very own. While readers of St George's Children's Library magazine were told in verse to remember that this is your magazine, and between us we can make it the best ever seen. The magazine's contents, made up of stories, poems, games, jokes and pictures, presented playful creativity and enjoyment as appropriate and valued. So as the London County Council increasingly treated the provision of playgrounds as a necessity in inner city housing developments, a range of other local organisations created more spaces for play. As under the 1935 Housing Act, councils increasingly constructed the local as a scale for replanning and rebuilding, while also providing the basis for large scale urban, urban change, sorry. New magazines created spaces for children based on local residency, age and active civic participation, rather than on other identifications. And both discourse about housing estate play spaces and these magazines linked play with citizenship, something that I hope to explore further when publishing my research. Thanks, John. So um, I was just going to conclude very briefly um, uh, our presentation this afternoon, um, hopefully lose an insight into our research and the way it builds on the ideas that emerged and coalesced at History Workshop in 1972 and have been refined since then. Uh, and hopefully we've also highlighted productive ways of playing with scale in the histories of childhood environments. Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone to this session on religions. Um, I'm Mary Claire Martin. I'm a co-founding director of the Children's History Society. And um, I teach at the University of Greenwich in London. Um, there was a panel on religion at the 1972 History Workshop um, conference, and there were three papers on Puritanism and Childhood, Sunday Schools in New Tredegar and Childhood and Family in Ireland. So I'm delighted we've got such a wide ranging panel today, and many thanks to all the speakers, um, especially Hugh, who's got up a half past four in New Zealand yes. and yeah. also Tally who um, is staying up quite late and Catherine who also has childcare responsibilities. So I'm going to introduce the speakers one by one as usual and then we'll have the papers. So I'll start with Catherine. Um, so Catherine Rose um, received her PhD at Queen Mary University of London in 2019 for a thesis entitled the Experience of Childhood in Mamluk Society, Egypt and Syria, 1250 to 1517, which examined some of the most significant features of children's lives, including infancy rituals, child rearing practices, circumcision, education, and health and mortality in the light of factors such as gender and status. Her research draws attention to the richness and diversity of sources for the lives of children and parents in this period, which allows us to consider these experiences firmly within their historical context. Since graduating, she has volunteered as an oral historian for the NHS at 70 project, and now works for the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And she's going to speak to us on researching childhood in medieval Islamic societies, sources and approaches. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, Mary Claire, and thank you to, to you and the other organisations of uh, organisers of this um, of this conference. Um, so my paper is primarily a survey of the kinds of source materials available to researchers of children and childhood in medieval Islamic societies. Its focus will be on sources for the Mamluk period, which was my area of study. But many of the kinds of materials discussed here can be found for earlier and later periods. 
Childhood will include the period of life between birth and the onset of puberty. Um, in contrast with Sahir, which indicated infancy or minority, Bulugh or adolescence were, or sorry, puberty was largely understood to be the point at which a child reached physical maturity. Now I've been asked to devote the first half of the paper to the historiography on this subject since our starting point, 1972. So I'm gonna give you a whistle-stop tour of some of the available secondary materials before uh, secondary literature, before moving on to our sources. Um, I could spend the entire 20 minutes and beyond just talking about sources. So um, I'll try to get to that when I can. A good starting point for anyone uh, beginning to research, uh, well, childhood or anything um, to do with the, the history of um, Islamic societies is the Encyclopedia of Islam. There are various uh, articles on things like Akika, which is a, a birth ritual, uh, puberty, infancy, custody, circumcision, and so on. Um, and this is a good starting point, uh, which can lead to other uh, primary, source, uh, primary sources on the subjects. Now, I know our starting point here is 1972, but I just want to draw attention to an article by Franz Rosenthal, who wrote um, in his 1952 article on child psychology in Islam, that in order to gain an understanding, oh, hang on, I've, I can't see my screen, but I've got the quote is there. <laughs> and he alert, alerted uh, uh, researchers um, of uh, societies in, in, in medieval Islam, in, uh, medieval Islamic societies to the value of researching childhood. Avna Giladi, Avna Giladi is one of the few scholars to take up the baton of, offered by Rosenthal. His work has deservedly been des described as pioneering. Um, his first work, uh, first book was a three part collection of essays on a number of topics concerned with childhood. Um, first of all, the newborn infant and the, the, the various rituals associated with birth, child education, and finally child mortality and adult reactions. He has uncovered and analysed the rich body of consolation treatises which have contributed significantly to our understanding of attitudes both towards child mortality and towards children and childhood themselves. His work has continued in this focused topic specific vein and two subsequent books have been dedicated studies on the issues of breastfeeding and midwives. Understandably given this thematic nature of his subjects he often takes a chronologically and geographically broad view and one of his many contributions to the study of children and childhood in medieval Islamic societies has been to identify the large number of terms associated with its various stages. Yesterday's first panel, we heard about the importance of understanding terms associated with chronological age and context. Who counts as a child? How do we determine this? In their work on youth in medieval Islamic societies, Hassan Sharedi and Sirinx von Hees also remind us that we mustn't take life cycle terms at face value. For example, shab or shabab, plural, during this period, which we understand to mean youth, and today this might be interpreted as someone in, in their teens or early 20s, but during this period it could be anyone in the prime of life, which could be anything from adolescence up to the age of 40. And an example of the importance of understanding these terms, we can look at, uh, at tombstones. Giladi initially concluded that children in medieval societies, in contrast with adults, didn't have tombstones erected on their graves. And this is a position he's recently re revised in response to Werner Diem's lengthy chapter on tombstones of, of what he calls children and other prematurely diseased persons. In fact, there were very few tombstone epita epitaphs for children in Egypt and Syria. In contrast with youths, which are far more represented in the catalogue records, there were virtually none which talk about children. These were, as Deem describes them, prematurely deceased, which could mean, again, anyone up to the age of 40. Topics that have received scholarly attention include education. The focus has mainly been on higher education and institutions of higher education, such as madrasas. I've listed some scholarship here, and this is these address the subject of elementary schooling in a very general way and as part of wider studies on the theme of education in medieval Islamic societies. They're particularly useful in providing a sense of where elementary education fit in the wider academic life of medieval Islamic societies. Other more recent examples, such as Sherman Jackson's and Sebastian Gunther's, talk about 
the development of ped pedagogical thought, for example. Jackson's was, talks about a, sorry, I beg your pardon. Jackson's responds to a set of queries written by an actual elementary teacher, and it can be particularly illuminating about some of the realities of school life in late medieval and early, early Ottoman periods. Iqbal Hassim's work on elementary education and motivation in Islam is so far the only monograph on the subject of elementary education, as far as I know. His overall argument is that there was a great deal of consensus and continuity in the educational theories of the scholars he's examined. According to him, systems of elementary education, including curriculum, discipline, teaching methods, and attitudes towards teachers, changed very little throughout the 6 to 150 years covered by his study. Conrad, Conrad Herschler's chapter on learning to read, however, challenges this. He has looked at endowment deeds, WACF documents, which show an increased focus on reading and writing between the 11th and 15th centuries, and in particular during the Mamluk period. Using these same sources, Adam Sabra's work on charity and poverty highlights the ways that endowed schools, which prolifer proliferated during this time, provided vital material support to orphaned and other children. Literary history is another area that is rich in, in uh, source material for the lives of children. And it's popular literature during the Mamluk period that alerted me to the possibility of studying childhood in the first place when I did my dissertation on the poet Ibn Sudun as an undergraduate. As Thomas Bauer has said, Mamluk literature, and I quote, transcends boundaries between everyday and literary communication, between popular and high literature, between poetry and prose, between the private and the public. And this opens up a wide variety of sources to historians of childhood. Similarly, Yusuf Rappaport has noted that the blurring of lines between history and autobiography, and hence the increasing representation of the domestic, is even more striking in some 15th century works. Bauer's work on so-called kinder totem leader, poetry written lamenting the death of children, is a compelling example of how single texts, when analysed contextually, can provide us with valuable insights about childhood in Mamluk society. In his article on Ibn Mubata's elegiac poetry for his dead son, Bauer illustrates some of the ways that poetry could be used to manage and articulate feelings of grief at the death of a child. More than this, however, he suggests that this kind of poetry could provide group catharsis and help provide a framework around which to express feelings around childhood death amongst its readership within the ulama or the religious scholarly elite. An important, to borrow a term from Barbara Rosen Rosenwein, emotional community in Mamluk society. His work often explores shared intertextuality, the literary heritage and language that helped to shape the poetic communication of members of the ulama which can help to get us beyond superficial readings of such works. And in particular, his comparisons between poetry written about the death of a child in periods before the Mamluk period and works like that uh, of Ibn Nubata indicate that whereas in earlier periods, fathers writing these poems could talk about their dead children in terms that express regret for the people they would not go on to become, during this period, Fathers like Ibn Nubata could talk about children as the people they already were um, in, their, in their descriptions. Circumcision of both males and females is another topic that has received quite a bit of interest. Catherine Kouweni and Lena uh, Salema have challenged assumptions around the degree to which Islamic circumcision was a direct continuation of the Jewish practice. Salema talks about the complex and shifting processes by which male circumcision was rationalized, ritualized, and ultimately legalized by Muslim scholars over time. On the subject of female circumcision, otherwise known as female genital mutilation or cutting, Otto Minardus, in his 1967 article, traced the mythological origins and history of the practice of female circumcision in Egypt before outlining contemporary arguments for its abolition. Jonathan Berkey and Kueni both emphasized the different rationales behind the circumcision of girls and boys. For girls, it was about moderating potentially disruptive sexuality, and this was a burden not shared by boys in their analysis. Sami A. Aldib Abu Salia has, has highlighted, however, that moderating desire was one of the justifications offered by Jewish, Christian, Coptic, Co Coptic Christian, and Muslim religious authorities for circumcising males as well as females from the classical period onwards. And this is something I found in my research as well. 
As this suggests, the topic of children and childhood crops up in areas of study which it's adjacent to and overlaps with, such as women and gender, family life, law and literary history. On, on issues around child custody, for example, we can look at articles by people like Lee Guo, whose discussion of the sort of messy domestic uh, um, life of, of al Bukhari um, touches on, on, on this subject. Similarly, child marriage is, is, is discussed by Yosef Rappaport and Carl Petrie, among others. Postpartum ritual also stands out here. As in other medieval societies, Fathers or other senior male family members played the central role in for more formal religious rituals, which included saying the abhan and the karma in the newborn's right ear and left ear immediately after birth, and later performing the rites of tahnik, tahlak, and apkika. And whilst mothers were not entirely absent, they had a secondary role in these important formal rites. According to Kuwaini, women did involve themselves in and derive agency from these rituals through their willing relinquishment of both reproductive and parental control to fathers and other male figures, something which could enable a mother to seal her identity, and I quote, seal her identity as ideal mother in the eyes of believers. As she also emphasizes, quote, it is important to recognize that agency often operates within rather than outside dominant structures of power. Overlapping with these customs were a number of distinctly Egyptian practices like the Subur and Hammam al Arba'in, which was the ritual bath take, which took place 40 days after, after birth, reminiscent of Christian churching and the Jewish practice of bathing in the mikveh at 40 days postpartum. As Huda Lutfi has suggested, these occasions and the period surrounding them may have served the important function of giving women a feeling of more security and control over their daily lives, to quote, uh, to quote her, whilst also giving them important opportunities to leave their homes and forge meaningful bonds with other women. And this brings me to sources. Huda Lutfi's article on the manners and customs of 14th century Kyrene women is based on a polemical treatise by, the, um, by Ibn al-Hajj, who died in 1336, called al-Madqal, and she, she alerts us to the usefulness of work like this in uncovering details about the lives of those from whom we rarely hear, such as women and children. It contains detailed descriptions of some of the customs and behaviours of ordinary Kyrenes, which Ibn al-Hajj found so troubling, and which of particular interest here include postpartum rituals associated with women and elementary, elementary education. Ibn al-Hajj was a member of the ulama, the religious scholarly elite who produced most of the sources available to us. Another member of this group was his contemporary, Ibn Qayyim al Jalziya, whose Tufat al Maudud bi Akham al Maulud is really the starting point for anyone interested in the study of children and childhood during this period. This is a highly comprehensive work reflecting the comprehensiveness of Sharia law itself. It reflects a sensitive, pragmatic, and very positive approach to children and child rearing. And it's full of practical advice about things like weaning and teething and taking first steps, learning to, learning to speak. It talks about rites of passage from the birth rituals just mentioned and circumcision. It talks about puberty and adolescence and the kinds of discipline that suited uh, children at this stage of their development. There's an eschatological thread running throughout it, which in turn reflects deep concerns about the implications of adults' child rearing practices on the fate of their children in the afterlife, an issue he addresses repeatedly in the text. For him, maintaining the well-being of both body and soul were two sides of the same coin, a practical spiritual approach that is also evident in his other works. He also displays a deep understanding of the, of the scientific theories of classical authorities like Hippocrates and Galen. And he's been described by Basim Masalam as a true symbiosis of science and religion. But here he incorporates and reconciles these scientific ideas with Islamic ideals. We have legal sources which can be really useful for information about things like child custody, accidents involving children, deaths, circumcision on whether or not girls should be circumcised, for example on the specific roles and responsibilities of mothers, fathers, guardians, and on child education and corporal punishment. Fatawa, legal responsor collections like that of Ibn Taymiyyah, 
compendia of contractual or shirut models like that of al-Jarawani, the Hammam al-Sharif collection of over 900 legal documents from the court of the Jerusalem judge, Judge Sharaf ad-Din Isa Bilhanim, includes a number of entries about orphans, particularly with regards to their inheritance or property. Fiqh manuals concerning Islamic jurisprudence influence people's lives in a number of ways and of course inf inform the decisions taken by those issuing fatawa. A notable example from our period is by an nawawi Hisba manuals which provided guidance for the muhtasib, the market inspector, also reflect practices of daily life. As I've already, already mentioned, we have literary sources, so-called ego documents like autobiographies and journals. And Dwight Reynolds has shown the level of space and detail devoted to discussions of childhood in autobiographies and indeed biographies noticeably increased during the Mamluk period. Two notable examples which are full of intimate details about family life and about the relationships fathers had with their children and about the, the lives, illnesses, illnesses and indeed deaths of these children are those of al Bukhari, uh, a Syrian scholar who resided in Cairo, who died in 1440 and, 1440, and that of Ibn Talq, a Damascene court, court clerk who died in 1509. Biographical literature, such as Asakhawi's biographical dictionary, which has been described as a sort of who's who of Mamluk society, is useful for information about the individuals he describes education, about orphanhood. He includes entries about school teachers and others involved in the lives of children. Of particular interest is a section devoted to notable women known as the Kitab and Nisa, and it talks about, it addresses issues like motherhood children, childhood, girls' teachers, custody battles. We also have Mamluk era Sufi saints' lives, which often feature miracle accounts involving drowning children, which can shed light on real anxieties about children's safety. Chronicles, such as a set of 15th century chronicles by al Makrizi, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and Ibn Taghra Beardi, Talk about the social and demographic effects of widespread disasters like famine, epidemic and plague. And they talk about the disproportionate toll these took on children, occasionally including statistical estimates. Descriptions of catastrophic events involving children and often touching anecdotes about parents and children, some of whom they knew and some of whom were anonymous, help to personalize the events they talk about, reminding us of the real lives at the centre of such difficult circumstances. At times they offer us glimpses into the experiences of individuals from whom we rarely if ever hear, like the grief-stricken mother who killed herself when she was prevented from attending her only child's funeral, or the children taking to the street, talking in the streets about the terrors of the plague during a particularly virulent outbreak. Poetry, again, has proven to be an excellent source for the lives of children and parents. I've mentioned Ibn Ubata's poems on the deaths of his children. We also have elegies by Abu Hayyan on his adult daughter, Nuda, which give us small insights into the special relationship they shared. And whilst not representative, they can provide important clues into some of the expectations around girls born into this scholarly community and about how they were raised and indeed regarded by fathers like him. Two 15th century poets, offer us unique insights into the worlds of women and children. Ibn Sudun al Dashbahawi and Fatima al Jamalia are really important examples. Ibn Sudun talks a lot about his relationship with his mother and some of the ways that they worked together to circumvent the patriarchal authority under which they lived. She would hide him from his parents and, and teachers if he was in trouble, for example. He positions her at every important stage in his life well into adulthood and it is she who makes him an orphan when she dies when he's 44. He also talks about his own circumcision in humorous, uh, in humorous prose accounts and wrote poems and poetry, uh, poems for children. Al Jamalia is the only vo female voice appearing here but because, uh, because many of her pieces concern matters most closely related to the lives of women and children she's She's also often able to give us unique glimpses into some exclusively female affairs, 
such as the Hammam al Arbayin, the ritual bath which took place 40 days following childbirth, which I've already mentioned. And they challenged certain assumptions about the role and indeed rights of mothers in their children's lives. Looking at things, looking at sources for things like custody or postpartum rituals, we can be left with the impression, as indeed Anne Marie Ede was, that the mother, quote, plays a vital role in the early years of a child, but that when her child reaches the age of five or seven, she must step aside for the father or teacher. In her analysis, the mother's role, my quote, is only marginal in comparison with that of the father. We have other popular literature, literary anthologies containing morality tales, and also stories about schoolboys running rings about their inept school teachers. A shadow puppet play by Ibn Daniel includes one about, uh, includes information about the figure of the gypsy woman, Asania, who was closely associated with the circumcision of girls. Tales from the Thousand and One Nights that date from the Mamluk period can also give us insights into things like the prohibitive cost of circumcision ceremonies and about children being taken to see doctors. Book illustrations, such as the ones here, occasionally allow us to visualize children. Various manuscript copies of Al Hariri's Makamat have been used by Hirschler to support some of his findings about learning to write in elementary schools. We also can have details here about children's dress. And when considered alongside other material evidence can give us a sense of what children during the period war might have looked like. This illustration, which I've, I've used at the beginning of, of my presentation, a married man at his household. It's a 14th century, um, it's from this from the 14th century book, um, Kitab al Bulhan, and it encapsulates here the public private divide between the sexes. The mother is, in, is, is firmly within the confines of the home, breastfeeding her child, which is often used as, as shorthand, shorthand for the kind of nurture associated with the care of young children, which, which were connected with women. And the father is outside receiving a letter surrounded by his older children. We also have architectural evidence and their associated documents. A large number of urban Sabil Qutabs public water fountains with elementary schools situated on the upper floor were established during the Mamluk period. And they indicate the increasing visibility and indeed audibility of children in urban settings. We can look at the inscriptions chosen to adorn them and the accompanying endow endowment deeds, which give us important information about things like pupil numbers, what these children were taught, by whom, and any additional material provisions allocated to each pupil. Archaeological work, such as that being done at Tel Hasban in, in Jordan at the frontiers of Mamluk society, is looking at important themes such as household and family structure, which can contribute a great deal to our understanding of childhood, particularly for those living outside the urban centers from where most of our evidence comes. We also have archeological finds from places like Qasar Ibrim in Lower Nubia, which can give us clues about children's play and the often gendered training or socialising functions of some of these activities. Children's dolls, dolls' clothing, balls, miniature spindles. Other material evidence include items of clothing that children were buried in. And again, with pictorial evidence can give us indications of how children looked and indeed how their bodies were treated at death. I've mentioned tombstone epitaphs. And also very selectively, we can use modern accounts and anthropological materials. And on this subject, I know I'm running out of time. I just want to mention that uh, in terms of approaches, a consistent feature of discussions around the approaches to study of children in the past is that we broaden our scope, both in terms of the types and variety of sources we might consult and the disciplinary lenses through which we scrutinize them. Sociology in particular, the way that sociologists conceptualize children and childhood and the processes involved in being social, socialized into a given community. Heather Montgomery's idea of children being both beings and becomings was, was particularly in, informative in, in, in my research. We also have child psychology, archeology, span and indeed anthropology. Giladi has often taken an inter interdisciplinary approach, both borrowing ideas from historians of medieval and early modern European children.
Sorry. Trin, um, Trin, we can't hear you. I th okay, I think we'll have to stop there. And thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. Um, so many really interesting insights into researching Islamic, medieval Islamic childhood. And we'll come back to many of those points in the discussion. So um, I can't find my the appropriate. Thank you so much. And we're now going to go on to our second speaker, who is Tally Berner. Tally, did you want to screen share? Yes. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes. A um, little bit louder would be good. OK, I will. I will do my best. Um, it's better to use the earphones now. I have some distractions in the background, as you might have noticed. Can you see my, my screen share now? Yes, do you want to do full screen? Um, yes, yes, yes. Catherine, okay. thank you so much. I don't know if you could hear me. Um, we just lost you at the end, but I think we heard the whole paper. So are you ready, Ali? Yes. Great, okay. Um, well, now we, now we have a paper on the history of Jewish childhoods. Tally Berner teaches at the program for the research of child and youth culture, Tel Aviv University in Israel. She's a historian of early modern Jewish history, interested in particular in the history of children and childhood in the family. Her current research focuses on youth culture in early modern Jewish communities. And her book, In Their Own Way, Children and Childhood in Early Modern Ashkenaz was published in 2018 by the Shazar Center publication in Hebrew. She is the co-editor with Lucy Underwood of Children, Youth and Religious Minorities in Early Modern Europe, which was published by Palgrave in 2019. So thank you so much, Tally. And uh, thank looking you. forward to this thank very much. For, yes, thank you for inviting me to speak at this wonderful conference. And thank you also, um, Catherine, for the um, for your lecture, which I think it parallels in many ways to what, what I'm going to present um, now. So I think it was a great, uh, and there's some, you will see there's some things that, that are even similar in many ways. Um, so given 20 minutes, I uh, obviously can only cover a small part of the history and historiography of uh, Jewish children. Um, and I will begin by saying that to our knowledge, most aspects of childhood um, experienced by Jewish children were similar to those of their Christian and Muslim neighbors, primarily due to their similarities in their shared living condition medical treatment, material culture, and even the shared uh, monotheistic beliefs. Therefore, in my lecture today, I will concentrate mainly on those aspects that were perceived by scholars as unique or different in Jewish culture, and through them highlight some historiographical developments. So um, certain issues related to children were already researched at the second half of the 19th century, by the early scholars who founded the field of modern Jewish history. The Jewish system of education and the Jewish philosophy of education, which were considered by these scholars to be a uniquely Jewish phenomenon, received considerable scholarly attention, reaching its peak with the publication of the four volume collection of sources for the history of Jewish education by Simcha Asaf published between 1925 and 1943. Um, so um, you can see him here. He was a unique figure. He was both a historical a historian and a rabbi. And he was, he served as a Supreme Court, as a Supreme Judge in the Supreme Court, um, the first Supreme Court of Israel after 49. So um, quite a unique figure. Um, figure and his contribution to the history of childhood is, is priceless. He collected a huge amount of sources that are still being researched today. Um, so, so 
although he did not he did not research childhood, he collected sources. I think he was one of the founders of, of the field in many ways. Um, scholars such as Moritz Gudenam, Gudenmann, who were interested in folklore and everyday life, devoted their attention to some rituals around pregnancy, infancy, and childhood. Often under the title of um, obscure rituals or women's nonsense and witchcraft, revealing their um, biased attitudes regarding the ways of life of the non elite. Uh, I can see this was published in German in, nine, in um, 1891. Um, and while these histories did not study children per se, Others devoted works to the history of Jewish children, such as um, Schechter's The Child in Jewish um, Literature from 1889, and Feldman's The Jewish Child, Its History, Folklore, Biology, and Sociology from 1917. Um, these are characterized mostly by a, a historical approach and a nostalgic view of the past making wide gener generalizations and relying mostly on sources which reflected the elite. Um, other early works, um, while revealing many unknown sources, rediscovering forgotten rituals and raising the question of the history of Jewish children, often discuss children as a byproduct of other topics, such as the study of institutions or legal developments, um, I also mentioned here Yaakov Katz, who in many ways is the founder of, um, Jew, of um, the social history of the Jews, um, and his seminal article, Marriage and Sexual Life um, um, in Late Medieval, in the mid Middle Ages, is considered, um, again, one of the um, foundations on which um, the social history, including the history of children within the history of marriage, because um, he discusses um, the number of children people had and so on. Um, but of course, they did not, um, they did not study children per se. Um, or lacked uh, historical accuracy. It took about two decades after the publication of um, Philippe Arias's book until his thesis sparked a new interest in the history of Jewish children. Um, to this new interest, we can add the seminal work of two great Israeli scholars, um, Shulamit Shachar and Avner Giladi, which was already mentioned here. Uh, evoked no attention to the field. Um, Shulamit Shachar, in publishing her book, Childhood in the Middle Ages, uh, first in Hebrew in 1990, ended the debate regarding the existence of childhood in the Middle Ages and the attitudes of parents towards children. Uh, two years later, Avner Giladi of Haifa University published his book, Children of Islam, making a great contribution to the study of children in Islam and the Middle Ages and, and, and the Middle East. Um, although their work was not specific to Jewish children, their international acknowledgement and acceptance influenced the attitudes of Israeli academia um, to the topic. Um, and still to this very day, they are considered um, the two main founders of the, the study of the history of childhood. Um, in Israel. Um, and still under the impression of Arias, Ronnie, Ronnie Weinstein um, dedicated his 1989 master's thesis to the development of the bar mitzvah ceremony in early modern Italy. And this is really considered the first um, work, I would say, of the new generation of, uh, of scholars who discussed um, children in childhood. Um, seeing the development of the formal ritual as an indication to a shift in the understanding of the division between childhood and youth. Israel Tashma in 1991 and Simcha, Simcha Goldin in 1997 tried to resolve the attitudes of caring and awareness towards children they found in medieval Jewish sources with Arias's thesis and later with the new approaches to medieval childhood. 
They both viewed, viewed the differences they found between Jewish and non-Jewish parents in the importance of education. And, uh, sorry, and, and the power of community in Jewish tradition that's mainstreaming the idea that Jewish childhood was unique and different, and that the differences were rooted primarily in the emphasis on education. Thus, while the general approach has changed <clears throat> to less judgmental, more historically accurate histories, the two topics, the educational system and Jewish life cycle rituals remain central to the field. Um, although the, the study of children remained and still remains marginal to Jewish history, a new generations, generation of scholars, and allow me to count myself among them, has taken the scholarship beyond the Arias debate, debate while highlighting other aspects. Sensitivity to gender roles led Elisheva Baumgarten to look at pregnancy and birth and find the similarities in everyday care in the birth and childhood rituals between Jews and non-Jews. The same focus on gender has led scholars to conclude that as far as girls' education, Jewish communities sometimes lag behind Christian communities and, edu and education was not universal as earlier scholars believed, but was often limited to the elite. Scholarship that went beyond the Middle Ages and into the early modern period has demonstrated how Jewish communities adapted both Catholic and Protestant approaches to schooling, care of poor and orphan children, and how Jewish communities formed their own institutions and further developed rituals in the face of growing religious competition. And, and I know you can't, you can't read the, the covers of the books, the names of the covers of, well, not maybe some of you can't read the names of the co on the covers of the books that I, I'm, I'm showing here, but I still, I wanted to, to um, show the covers and uh, I guess from, from the illustrations, you can get some, um, some sense. Um, the one in the red in the middle is my own book. Um, and openness to new genres of sources has allowed discussion regarding the material culture of childhood, toys and clothing and more similarities than differences between Jews and non-Jews were found. Relying mostly on archeological scholars, um, on, on archeological sources, scholars were able to reconstruct some, some aspects of childhood in the ancient and Greek and Roman worlds. And here you can see the book of um, Rona Abishar Lewis um, about children in ancient Israel um, based mostly on archeological findings um, and less on scripture and the biblical narrative or biblical or Near East ancient Near East law like um, previous scholars, um, which enabled her to discuss um, toys and living conditions and spaces that children occupied that are obviously almost impossible or are not mentioned in the written sources. And in, in a similar way, Chagit Sivan was able to discuss um, new aspects of the children in the Roman world or the Hellenistic and Roman world based on um, based on um, great stones and um, other material other material sources such as um, such as the the the, the mosaics in, in synagogues that she she argues were, were intended for children. Um, other scholars concentrated on you. Um, and here, here we're in, back in medieval Egypt. Um, um, marriage and relationships with the other sex alongside, alongside some research and work on the roles of Jewish male and female um, servants. And I have here a book that did not even make it to the PowerPoint presentation because it was just published um, a few days ago, I guess. Um, it, it, 
the Hebrew book month. So many, many books are published um, around this time of the year. Um, this is a book about gender and sexuality in medieval um, Ashkenaz, medieval Germany. Um, and it's, it's about, you know, sexuality and gender. That's that it's, it's mostly about youth. Um, so, so this is just, you know, brand new from the press. Um, so um, the first two generations of scholars focused their studies on medieval and early modern European communities. But very recent developments in the field include studies on young women in medieval Egypt and early modern, modern Mediterranean and Middle Eastern Jewish communities. Um, the scope of topics um, constantly broadens to include runaway girls, children who converted, crime and violence, among others. So we've made a long way from concentrating mostly on, on education and life cycle rituals. Um, so looking at the big picture of Jewish children and childhood uh, a long time and across communities, one general conclusion one can make is, they have noted above, that Jewish children were very similar to their non-Jewish um, peers. It is clear that the emphasis on the difference in education was overvalued. Jewish rituals are indeed unique, but can and should be seen in the context of similar ceremonies in other religions. A comparative approach also reveals that the ways in which um, Jewish children were raised, treated, and educated, and the roles they carried in familiar and communal life were more similar to those of other minority groups um, of their time and place. So more work on, on other minority groups um, might, might be helpful also to understanding um, how the Jewish community uh, functioned um, more than studying the hegemonic um, culture. Um, these are, there are still many pieces missing in this puzzle. Uh, first and foremost, the study of non-European children. Even the American Jewish community did not receive sufficient attention. The study of girls and young women is still lagging behind. And topics such as professional training, material culture, and the study of poor orphans, sick, and stray children requires much research and revision. Um, these scholarly achievements have not yet, I hope not, they will still will <laughs> be translated into the creation of a local community of scholars or to an institution. Two main barriers restrict the development of the field. The first is the nature of the sources. Um, why is my PowerPoint? Um, the first is the nature of the sources, often like it, lacking archival material and ego documents, scholars are forced to rely on legal documents, responsa, um, legal discussions, religious commentaries, and small pieces of evidence hiding in other texts. It takes a great deal of training for those not versed in Jewish legal writing to overcome this barrier. That is, um, it requires a, a different kind of education than you would expect from a social, for a social historian or a historian of gender in terms of the skills of, of um, and knowledge. Um, so we actually need to be trained in two fields um, at the same time in many ways. And here I brought as, as an example, it's an example that is not typical it actually is an archival source and is an Egu document, but it's a letter in Hebrew from um, a young girl um, from the 16th century, um, written in Hebrew. Um, here, the problem is mostly paleographic, very obscure handwriting. Um, but this is an example of a letter of a girl that is also impossible to understand if you're not well versed in, in the Bible and um, 
sages because it's it's um, composed of uh, parts of verses and and other kinds of um, like allusions to, to to text that you cannot understand the letter without being able to to recognize where it what they drew on. Um, the other obstacle is the lack of institutional support with, with no research centers and funding for such research or um, research group, it is hard to draw scholars to the field. The marginality of the study of Jewish children is twofold and manifested in the fact that general works in Jewish history or even works on closed fields like the study of women, marriage, marginal groups, and even the education system fail to include significant references to children. Uh, the study of Jewish children also still remains marginal to the study of childhood in general. Anthologies, edited vol volumes, survey books, and readers on children and childhood, present and past, rarely include chapters or sources on Jewish children. And this is part of the reason that I was so happy to be included here today um, and able me to, to discuss um, this topic among other scholars of, of other religions and, and groups. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, thank you so much, Tali. That's, um so um, useful and informative and so many insights into an area that most of us are not very familiar with. And uh, also great to have those comparisons with other religions. And um, <laughs> I thank you so much. I look forward to the questions. Um, our, next speaker, um, our next speaker is Hugh, Hugh Morrison, who's, as I've said before, is at four o'clock, 4.30. Um, for this panel. So it, I'm just going to uh, read out Hugh's bio. Um, so Hugh is Associate Professor of Education at the University of Otago, New Zealand. He teaches in both education studies and initial teacher education. And his research coheres around a mix of New Zealand and British world, social, religious and cultural history with a focus on global missions and children. Recent publications include a monograph on Protestant children, missions and education, um, published by Brill in 2021, articles on missionary children and families, um, for example, studies in church history, 2022, Journal of Religious History, 2020, and with Mary Claire Martin, an edited collection on children's Historical Religious Lives, published by Routledge in 2017. He is an enthusiastic supporter of networks like the Children's History Society and the Society for the History of Children and Youth. And he's going to speak to us on children, young people, and Christian missions in modern history. Thank you so much, Hugh. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary Claire. Can you hear me okay? Um, yes. Good. Okay, that's fine from my distance. Okay, so um, I was thinking about 1972 um, as um, obviously the important date for this um, session for the last two days. Um, my screen is now, okay. And I thought about myself. In 1972, I was not a historian. I was not aware of children's or youth history. I was a youth. Um, I was at high school in New Zealand. I was... Um, we're still wearing shorts, riding a bike, going to school, um, going to scouts, hating sport, but generally um, unaware of history, but perhaps making history or making trouble at the time. And then when I think about 1972 and the difference between 1972 and now, uh, and not knowing the details of the, of the 1972 meeting, so thank you, Mary Claire, for filling in the details. Um, I'm, I was pretty sure that uh, children, youth, and Christian missions would not be particularly high on the radar, even though religion itself was um, one of the elements. And perhaps because in 1972 and in the 1970s, um, missions were anathema in scholarship. Um, missions were being um, prescribed by um, such groups as the All African Council of the World Council of Churches. 
Um, and historians in places like New Zealand were starting to think about history as a national history rather than an imperial history. And in the process, often leaving out the religious element because of some of the things that were going on both here and in wider secular society of the 1970s. Um, but then I thought, gosh, what a difference 50 years makes. Um, across the broad, broad spectrum of what constitutes youth and children's history, for example, religion is commonly now found in scholarship and the two books on the right-hand side of the, of the spectrum of the timeline sort of indicate that. Um, and, and historians, um, both explicitly religious historians and non-religious historians, are thinking about the place of children and religion and missions, amongst other things, in the mix of all that. And the, the book that Mary Claire just mentioned that we had published by Rutledge in 2017 um, is evidence that publishers are taking the child religion connection seriously. Um, but it also perhaps reflects the milieu that we're, that, uh, of our global milieu of the present time. American scholars and uh, Don Browning and Marsha Bunge, for example, um, suggest that religious diversity is now the experience of every society and of many children, um, and, and that religion is a factor um, in, the, in, the, in the world that we live in at the present. Um, and also in contexts like my own, um, the emergence of indigenous historiographies and of historians are st <clears throat> starting to, or uh, well, more than starting to question the separation that we've often made between the secular um, and the sacred in terms of historical narration and thinking. So what I thought about here was to um, just to talk about the, the broad topic of children, missions um, and history um, in terms of three different groupings of scholarship that's emerged, I think, in, in the last three or four decades at least. Um, one is uh, thinking about children as missionary subjects. Um, a second one is thinking about Western children, but not exclusively Western children, as pedagogical subjects. And thirdly, thinking about the children of missionary families. Um, and I suppose for the sake of clarity here, what I'm doing is splitting three things up in a false sort of way. And actually the realities were much more complex and there were of course movements across these boundaries. So let me just tell you three short stories and then I'll outline some um, of the trends within the scholarship. So the first story is um, of a young uh, Māori girl uh, by the name of Tarore, taught by church missionary society uh, missionaries in the early 1800s. Um, an example of a child as a missionary subject. So she's the focus of missionary activity. In 1836, she died tragically in a skirmish between two central North Island tribes. Um, she carried a, cos a copy of Luke's gospel in Te Reo Māori, in the Māori language. Um, and that gospel after her death changed hands several times. At one point, it was implicated in the conversion of her father uh, leading him to then forgive his daughter's killer at a later point. It traveled the length of New Zealand's North Island, contributing to the longer term evangelization of many communities, particularly Māori to Māori as, a part, as opposed to missionary to Māori. And then longer term still, her story and the story of her gospel has been woven into larger stories and published histories of Christianity in Aotearoa, New Zealand, from at least the 1890s, read, for instance, by many thousands of children from the 1910s onwards, and in 2009, epitomized by a children, illustrated children's book by author Joy Cowley that focused on her story as a story about peacemaking. The second story, um, or the second brief example, comes from the Hay River Indian Residential School in Yukon, Canada. As you can see, perhaps from the extract on the left hand side, here were um, Indian boarding children volunteering money that they saved from their own meagre circumstances to help the needs of so called leper children in China. On the surface, this was an unremarkable but typical representation 
of how Western children were being focused on and um, encouraged to participate in missionary support and activity. But of course, this is a much more complex scenario. And I acknowledge here the horrors and traumas of the Indian residential school system in both Canada and the United States. But the extract also notes um, a, an even more complex trail. The actions of these students were reported to the CMS annual meeting at London's Exeter Hall, then written about in the London Christian Herald, and then excerpted for, excerpted for Canadian Presbyterian juvenile readers in a magazine called The Message. So this was a classic example, I guess, of imperial textual circulation and appropriation, what South African scholar Isabel Hofmeyer calls imperial textual commons. Ultimately, this article here may never have been read by the original Indian children of the Hay River School, but the final remark that this was a story about, about true self-denial was clearly and pointedly intended for a wider juvenile reading audience. Thirdly, um, the example concerns a girl called Joyce Wilkins, daughter of English Baptist missionaries in India in the early 1900s. Joyce's story of childhood is full of juxtaposed ordinariness and complication, which in many ways fleshes out a very common emphasis in literature on the impact of parent-child separation in the missionary family context. Joyce, in her book, recounts the pain felt and remembered of being left at the Walthamstow School for Girls in North London at, year, at, age, at age six, and the legacy of that in her life in terms of growing up away from the companionate family unit. In this respect, she recounted, for example, a time where she crawled into her bedside cabinet in her dormitory to escape, but which, of course, she inevitably upended, throwing water, breaking porcelain, and getting in great trouble. And in hindsight, she commented, there were lots of upsetting incidents like that in my life. Yet a longer reading of this book and of her life reveals other incidents while she was back in India as an earlier child that predated separation and which compounded the complexity or the complexities of a missionary child's life. For example, on Sunday evenings while parents were at church, Joyce and a sister used to converse with their Indian nanny, or IR, Emily, and they used to talk in English. And this was a shared secret between the girls because her mother did not know that her servant girl, Emily, could speak English. But in her imperfect English, Emily unwittingly taught Joyce a version of a hymn, Rock of Ages, that was full of theological errors. And the errors, plus the pressure of the secret that she shared with her Indian um, nanny, piled up for Joyce, adding to a theme of guilt that is threaded through the length of her childhood narrative. So that's just to indicate the complexities and the interconnections between uh, these three groupings of literature. So I'm not going to laboriously um, go through every point that's on the slide, but I just want to say firstly, so our first focus is on children as mystery subjects, that is indigenous, local, national, or maybe classed children who were the subject of missionary activity and concern, whose lives were changed, circumscribed, prescribed, etc., by the work and idea of the missionaries. Um, and I preface, preface this by saying that Apart from a small piece of work on representations of Māori in juvenile religious and educational literature, this is not an area in which um, I, I have worked substantively. And furthermore, it's not an easy area in which to work uh, for a non-Indigenous scholar, particularly in contexts like my own. To do so in decolonizing secular societies is to potentially add to the colonization process. Um, as I note at the end, one of genuine but as yet unmet challenges is for Indigenous scholars and participants to be writing these histories, and that's a much larger work in progress. But some of the key trends emerging from monograph and periodical literature over the last two or three or four decades are listed here. The school child or education is um, obviously a major focus. Uh, Irish historian Deirdre Raftery um, 
says that there is a there, there, this is probably the, the biggest focus on um, children and missions, and and the literature already is voluminous and um, and, and covers a wide range of contexts and settings um, and periods. Um, of course, missions and colonialism are um, in part of that missionary and education focus and um, are really important. And as the work of um, Rebecca Schwartz, um, which is listed here, um, indicates um, what we need to do is to continue uh, working across uh, colonial contexts, because while there were lots of similar similarities, for example, racial policies around children, um, there were also lots of differences. Um, there's quite an emerging focus on uh, protection and separation policies and the implications of those for children. Um, I also wanted to note, um, finally, that children's voices are also starting to be heard, or ex-children's voices, um, not so much in the formal academic scholarship, but certainly through now a, quite a range of um, royal commissions, public inquiries, truth and reconciliation processes, um, that have occurred and are occurring in countries like Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Um, and also represented, for example, in the Soul and Generations um, website um, of Australian um, Aboriginal um, ex-children as well. So this is an important um, emphasis in the literature and it's ongoing. Um, and um, I'll indicate one or two of the challenges um, in a few minutes for that area. The second area is, or the second group of literature and scholarship is thinking about Western children, particularly as pedagogical subjects. Children living in Britain or North America or New Zealand, for example, who are caught up, who were caught up in various ways as mission supporters. Um, scholars of empire, um, of child, childhood and of literature have looked at, um, have looked at children in relation to the missionary movement as part of wider subjects. Um, historians like Catherine Castle and J.A. Mangan, for example. In 1976, um, not too long after 1972, an essay by English historian Francis Prochaska on children and the Protestant missionary movement was perhaps the first to move this focus more squarely into the spotlight. Um, at the time, framing children's missionary support within English women's philanthropy of the 19th century. Much of the writing on this element has appeared um, incohately and sporadically across articles, book chapters, and other um, uh, media. And one of my projects uh, recently has been to try to bring this broad corpus of writing together in a more cohesive fashion, which is the Brill title that you can see on the bottom right hand of the screen. Um, <clears throat> But probably the main shift that's occurred, I think, is that um, we've shifted in, in understanding these children from being just financial conduits as being um, a, a means of raising money for the missionary movement to thinking about the formation of childhood and of the education of children. So the education, particularly um, um, in the British context anyway, um, becomes a more important focus um, than um, money and finances, or should I say as important, um, or maybe the finances and money needs to be put within that, um, within that, within that frame. Um, just for the sake of time, I'll continue to the third area, which is um, children of missionary families in the past. Um, children of missionary families were, were the hidden element of missionary reporting, um, of missionary policies for a long time, of missionary biographies, for example. Um, but they are emerging as a focus of scholarly interest and the titles that I've splayed across the screen there are indicative, they're not um, inclusive of everything. But here we have a, um, a probably a focus at the moment in the literature on the 19th century and I'm thinking here about English and North um, English, uh, sorry, on the British um, missionary movement. I'm not thinking about an English language. I'm not thinking about non-English language at the moment. Um, on um, missionary families, 
and their relationship to empire families more broadly. Um, David Hollinger in the American context has drawn our attention to the life trajectories of missionary children, as does Joy Schultz in her book about um, the children of ABCFM missionaries in Hawaii in the 19th century. And Emily Mankelow's work um, brings us our focus and attention back to some of the issues around abuse and uh, children's resistances. Um, my own work, uh, I'm just continuing to work in this area and to trying to expand um, this area um, by thinking about um, missionary children across contexts, uh, trying to bring it into the 20th century um, and trying to think about it in relation to the various discourses or narratives that were operative around children. Um, so I'm uh, adopting what I'm calling an overlapping narrative lenses approach. Uh, wherein um, the aspects or the, the perspectives of parents, of the institutions they work for, and then of the children themselves um, are brought together. And then oral history um, has also indicated um, the simultaneously ordinary and complicated set of narratives that children tend to produce in hindsight when thinking about their lives. So to conclude, um, I think in each, for each of these areas of scholarship um, to date, there are a range of challenges that we face. And these again are challenges that I'm just identifying at the moment, they're not inclusive by any means. Um, and I've certainly left out a whole range of bullet points um, in my approach here this evening or this morning um, that, that you might question. Um, I think the challenge for the missionary subjects scholarship is not just indigenous histories, but indigenous historiographies. Um, so the writing of children being impacted by the mission contexts um, needs to be done by people from within those communities, as well as people uh, like myself from beyond those communities. Um, in terms of children as pedagogical subjects, I think um, we still don't really understand or know how children responded and reacted and what impact, um, for example, the conflation of missions, empire and nation um, had on children in terms of how they then saw the world. And in terms of missionary children, um, I think we just simply need some more um, discrete and comparative um, studies that bring us more into the 20th century um, and that take us out of the English language context into other um, missionary backgrounds. So um, that's really all I wanted to say, Mary Claire. Um, perhaps the overarching challenge that I, that, that I can see but have, um, I'm not working in myself at the moment, but I think is important is that um, missions and children tend to get a bit stuck in their own little corner and I think that actually in the end children young people and missions is part of the bigger story of children young people and religion in a historical context um, and so that might be another area to think about thank you very much um, I'm still awake I'm still going thanks Hello again, everyone. Um, welcome to this session on youth and disability history. Um, I'm Melanie Tebbett. I'm Professor of History at Manchester Metropolitan University, President of the Society of the History for Children and Youth, and I also have strong links with the Children's History Society. Now, Mary Claire Martin is actually responsible for this panel on youth and disability, but Mary Claire is giving a paper, so I volunteered to step in and moderate it um, on the basis of, um, actually, I know very little about disability history, so I'm hoping to learn a lot from this session. Um, Disability history is a relative newcomer to history generally, and even more so to youth history. Um, children and disability weren't really on the radar of the children's history workshop in 1972 
And it's worth remembering, I think, that disability history and disability rights emerged together in the early 1980s when they were linked to broader social and political movements of the same period in the UK and North America. Um, I suppose in some respects there were similarities with the earlier history workshop movement in that the subject brought together activists, writers and scholars from inside and outside the academy. And the early aim was to unearth the large, largely hidden histories, that familiar phrase of disability, which itself is not easily defined, and to offer explanations for the marginalization and oppression of dis disabled people and how this differed over time. Since the 1980s, the field has grown more complex and expanded, um, moving away to a degree from a UK, North American and Australasian focus and becoming more established as having equal value to gender, race and class in studying the past. Although in some ways it may retain a somewhat marginal status despite its resonance throughout history and its significance, I think, for making us rethink our own research. Um, as I said, I'm a newcomer to the subject and I've actually found the Oxford, Oxford Handbook of Disability published in 2018 as extremely helpful. It's worth saying that David Turner has a chapter um, in the handbook um, and it's really helpful in its coverage of debates and bibliographies. Yet while it does mention children and youth, it doesn't to a great extent, and there's clearly scope for a great deal more research, which is what this panel draws attention to. So as I said, um, I'm looking forward to hearing the papers very much. Um, so first off, we have Samir Hamdoud. Hello, Samir. Um, Samir is a fourth year PhD student at the University of Warwick, funded by the Wellcome Trust. His project is entitled Caring Power, Scientific Medicine and Mental Defici Deficiency at the Royal Albert uh, Asylum, 1870 to 1920. His research looks at how young people with disabilities were educated through a specialist form of pedagogy called physiological education. It also examines how they were cast as medical objects, subject to practices of clinical diagnosis, medical treatment, and scientific representation. Other his other research interests include the history of, mar of marginalized um, children and their experiences, and the social epistemology of medical knowledge and the history of eugenics in Britain. Samir's paper is Moralizing Young People's Bodies, Ability and Disability at the Royal Albert Asylum, 1870 to 1920. So over to you, Samir. Great, thank you, Melanie, for that um, great introduction and for um, yeah being able to get my interest into one coherent <laughs> sentence. Um, um, so first of all, I've got a presentation. So if I share my screen, will hopefully um, is that visible? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it's fine. Great, thank you. So, um, and I'd like to thank the organisers as well um, of this workshop um, for the opportunity to kind of present aspects of my work and kind of linking it into to more broader debates um, in the kind of field of childhood disability and history. So um, <clears throat> I'd like to start with um, a uh, referring to a, a review essay um, entitled Disability History, Why We Need Another Other, um, where Catherine Kudlick um, in 2013 reflect, as uh, 2003, sorry, reflected on how disability has been, how the category of disability has been, and I quote, crucial for understanding how Western cultures determine hierarchies and maintain social order, as well as how they define progress. For her, scholars in dis disability studies in particular have highlighted questions about what it means to be human, how we respond ethically to difference, the value of human life, and who gets to decide these questions. A similar sentiment is expressed by Patrick McDonnell in his um, Idiocy, a Cultural History. He writes that the concept of idiocy itself, a slippery term, um, which may be familiar to which may have been familiar to medical practitioners and asylum attendants for the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, but which is uh, a term of offence today, 
um, and therefore I use it sparingly. Um, these kind of ideas have been shaped by um, broader philosophical uh, debates about the boundaries and definitions of human life. Um, so uh, for MacDonald, he writes that um, the formation of idiocy, the refinement of its symbolic and ideological functions was also part of the process by which we became the people we are um, ourselves to be rational, reasonable, um, with a claim to rights and authority. So I think these questions about human difference and identity and the value of human life are particularly pertinent to how young people with disabilities have been perceived and treated in the past. In this paper, I'm going to talk about how perceptions of ability and disability shaped how young people um, were represented and treated at one of Britain's largest asylums, the Royal Albert Institution. Um, now, this was a specialist institution which cared for and treated um, children and young adults with a range of cognitive and physical disabilities. At its height in 1911, it accommodated over 750 young people, with over 4,000 being admitted um, by the outbreak of the First World War. Um, so today, I'm going to suggest that at the Royal Albert, young people were subject to a process um, the historian Lucy Hartley has called the moralization of body types. Um, I argue that moral evaluations about young people's abilities and disabilities, and therefore about their social value, were anchored in the observation and interpretation of their physical, cognitive, and behavioral characteristics. Physicians often asserted a link between bodily, uh, and I put this in quotation marks, deformities, and um, cognitive disabilities and social problems, connecting an individual's physical characteristics with moral judgments about their social capacity and value. Children, adolescents, and young adults were all subject to such evaluation at the Royal Albert. They were routinely pathologized through medical inspection and classification of their bodies and behaviors. But I also think this moralization of body types and discourse um, could also act or configure um, more positively, especially if this was done to further the Royal Albert's ambitions for national prestige, um, to draw in increased donations for revenues um, and, in, and a wider pool of young candidates for admission. I contrast the pathologization of young people with their positioning as transformed bodies capable of effective menial work and social interactions, which emphasize their abilities rather than their disabilities and a kind of general ability to learn. Um, and I think just to kind of briefly examining some of the educational and employment experiences of young people at the institution offers a way to kind of illuminate this tension um, in, the, in the kind of form of education that was promoted and implemented at the Royal Albert. But I think before kind of going into that, I would, I just want to spend just very like five minutes or so going over some of the historiography, which is pertinent to, to my work and um, also to the work of kind of others um, here today. <clears throat> so, in terms of um, the his historiography of um, uh, childhood disability, um, much of the work that has been produced in, in recent times has kind of challenged the notion that disability is inherent in an individual or um, that is biological in nature. Um, it needs to be fixed, um, usually through medical interventions. Now, this was a very dominant um, kind of mode of approaching disability, um, both in the kind of policy arena, but also historically as well. Um, in the, I think, as mainly you alluded to in the introduction, um, the social model of disability emerged in the 70s and 80s, which challenged that idea and actually um, argued that disability was the effect of disabling forces in society which discriminate against certain peoples with physical, cognitive um, and behavioural differences. Um, however, the, so the dominance of the social model of disability has itself been um, open to criticism from figures like Anne Borsi and Patricia Dale, who, who offer in their um, edited collection, Disabled Children, Contested Caring, an experiential cr critique of the dominant model of social disability. Um, and Thomas Shakespeare and Nicholas Watson also argue that the social model is an outdated, uh, outdated sorry, ideology. And, kind of just as a, as a crude summary i think the argument is that the social model of disability can in some ways um minimize or deny the the embodied experiences of people with disabilities um by suggesting that their that that them that their disability is rooted more in society and in cultural and linguistic representations rather than the lived experience of that, that people have for example with of missing limbs or, or um, that's a kind of significant cognitive impairment. So there are also um, other kind of areas in which childhood disability 
history and sociology intersect, um, particularly around debates um, around the integration segregation debate in the United Kingdom and the development of special education in the UK, um, with figures like Felicity Armstrong, Ted Cole and Murray Wilson, um, kind of debating uh, the kind of ideological origins of special education in the UK and also the policy implications, sorry, for um, the education of children in mainstream schools versus specialist education. Um, so more kind of relevant to my work in, in, in particular is innovations in the sociology of childhood and in the sociology of, sociology of the body. Um, and here, I think the work of the sociologist Alan Prue um, is important because he tries to kind of get away from this idea that childhood is either a biological reality with fixed stages of development that basically occurs the same or pretty much the same in, in everywhere across the world. Or on the other hand, the other extreme version that childhood itself is just a form of linguistic representation. Um, and he basically argues or tries to bridge the gap by suggesting, um, <coughs> sorry, um, that Childhood is both a temporal and a biological reality and a social category created and, man and maintained by elaborate cultural norms, symbols and language. And I think that kind of approach, that perspective can be useful for understanding disability as well as both being a biological reality and also a product of uh, very intricate social and cultural and economic relations um, and other forms of kind of symb symbolic um, interaction in society. <clears throat> so I think there are studies, uh, so there are collections of, of kind of um, work. Um, the Oxford Handbook of Disability History has been published relatively recently, four years ago or so, but I think as Melanie suggested, it doesn't really look at the intersection between disability and, and young age in particular, um, nor does um, a slightly older publication, uh, Forgotten Lives, which um, was seminal uh, when it was published in the, 19, in 19, the mid 1990s, sorry, for um, kind of bringing to the fore areas of history, um, like those experiences of uh, individuals with intellectual disabilities to the fore. Because in the 1970s and 80s, the history of madness and the history of psychiatry seemed, seemed to attract more attention from historians. So um, this is the kind of historiographical context in which I've been working over the past three and a half years. Um, and I think from around the mid 19th century, you can see a set of organized programs and regimes of medical and educational care, which coalesced around this idea that young people with cognitive and physical disabilities were, and I quote, improvable. Um, so this moral treatment or physiological education, as it became to be known, was predicated on a type of Christian philanthropism and a form of scientific rationalism that marshaled the resources of different pedagogical and philo philosophical traditions and practices, and just kind of as an indication of some of the, the, the kind of language and rhetoric that was used to promote the Royal Albert. Um, this is a quote from Edward Sigon, who's a pioneer in the education of young people with disabilities in the, in the early to mid 19th century. And Dr. Shuttleworth, who was a long time medical superintendent of the Royal Albert, um, they, uh, he saw him as his intellectual forebearer. And if you look at some of the language that's used here, um, the, the project, the task of educating these young people took an, a very high moral dimension um, and one in which, um, you know, the, the quote at the bottom, um, where poor children had to be taught uh, to love by being loved themselves. Um, so this is kind of very deeply Christian ethical endeavor, um, which was also mixed with uh, scientific study and physiological principles as well. Um, so you could say outwardly, the Royal Albert's educational offer to parents and to communities and to young people was outwardly um, aspirational. Um, young, the, the Royal Albert presented itself as a place where young people could be trained and put to work, whether for friends, family or specific manual intensive jobs. Um, they could also be re reintegrated into society through extensive um, physical, sensory and moral training. But I think these representations of young people and the way that we treated at the Royal Albert also reflected deeply held popular and medical ideas, which reinforced the lowly status of young people with disabilities in society and their limited opportunities for social improvement based on moral evaluations of their ability and disability. And this is where the kind of work of Lucy Hartley um, is relevant here, where 
Um, she shows how figures like Francis Galton in England, who was um, important in the development of eugenics, and Johann Lavater, uh, phrenologist um, in France, promoted the association between physiognomy um, or individuals' external appearances and their moral character, with conceptions of the, and I quote, good citizen equated with um, desirable physical moral traits. Um, and I think this moralization of body type thesis is redolent of some of the work of Sandy Gilman, who's highlighted the binary nature of representations of health with notions of good equated with beauty and ugliness and bad with ugliness and illness. And Mark Jackson has also examined this linkage in his analysis of late 18th century um, medical texts. Um, and in these texts, photographic images were utilized to emphasize the physicality of mental disabilities and their attendant social dangers of criminality, alcoholism and neurosis within a, an overarching paradigm of normative and um, normal human development. And I think at the Royal Albert, we see a similar process play out where children's behavioral characteristics and their external features um, were similarly anchored in moral evaluations about their capacity to be good citizens, to care for themselves, to socialize to, in conformity with expected behavioral norms to be educated and to work. And I'm just gonna give a, a kind of flavor of some of the ways in which children were described in their case files. And throughout my project, sorry, I've looked at about 500 or so case files. Um, so one example is uh, a young girl called Emma. She was admitted to the Royal Albert and her, as she was described as a dark complexion Mongol. And I, I realize it's an offensive term uh, for someone with Down syndrome. Very lively and active, one of this type, seems more lively than most Mongols. She has got on a little elsewhere in speaking and drilling and her habits are confidently improved. She's usually clean now. Um, another girl, Emma C, 12 year old, uh, she was 12 year old um, from, uh, oh, sorry, Emma, uh, a 12 year old girl whose father had died 12 months before um, her admission to the Royal Albert in 1876. Um, was also observed to be limited in her attention span and her ability to talk. Her case record describes how, and I quote, she did not take notice like other children, did not talk late, but that she walked as usual. Um, like many other young people, <coughs> um, Ellen, 15 year old Ellen's head uh, was measured and traced in her case record. Templates of the mathematical measurements of the other, other young people's skulls were also used to generate statistical studies, which attempted to show that these young people were developmentally aberrant from other children. And I think this style of reporting remained pretty consistent for many decades at the Royal Albert. So you have uh, a young person called Hilbert, um, who was admitted in September 1916, and he was described by medical professionals, and I, as I quote, I quote, sorry, childish in manner and simple in appearance. Um, he had no idea of money values. He was very backward in education. He has no ideas of the responsibilities of life. Beyond a vague idea of wishing to work, he has no idea how to obtain it. And these views were, were supported by his mother, um, who, and I quote, uh, said allegedly that Hilbert had always been childish, that he'd been of a stubborn nature, that he would never associate with others of the same age as himself, um, not, not taking part in games with other children. <clears throat> so I think children's clinical identities appear as an effect of discursive practices of observation and recording, which weave medical perspectives with testimony from family members. Focusing on a child's physical appearance, ability to recall and name objects, the quality of their speech and the behavior towards other children, was part of constructing young people as abnormal in order to classify and manage them. And this process was also process of classification was also evident in other institutions. For example, Catherine Colburn looks at the construction of patients, um, uh, sorry, the, the medical construction of patients in late 19th century asylums. And she observes, and I quote, how references to the physical manifestations of various forms of intellectual emotional disability, as well as to body difference and conformity, uh, deformity, sorry, were part of a culture of the colonial institution, which sought to categorize, label, and ascribe identities to institutional inmates. And asylum physicians and attendants routinely saw mental incapacity as coded, not only in the bodily fabric of individuals, but in what Keith Jenkins has called um, the social, emotional, and educational forms of, uh, and I quote, incompetence. Um, and I think in these medical narratives, which were contained in case notes, but also in academic literature as well, um, disability is represented within a medical model as, and I quote, 
a normative pathology, a disease, a, de a degeneration, a defect, deficit located in an individual and defined by deviation, deviation from a biomedical norm. Um, so I'm just gonna have to whiz through this last bit because I'm a bit pressed for time. But um, I think the moralization of body type um, kind of discourse was not only, to not only produce young people as pathologized, but what as ab abnormally developed. I think professionals at the Royal Albert and asylum administrators um, were also positioning children in a more positive light in order to um, demonstrate the power of the type of specialist educational care that, they, that only the, they could provide and a few other institutions in the UK. So we've seen how education was outwardly aspirational, emphasizing that young people could be taught and highlighting what they could do, i.e. their abilities. So to this end, the Royal Albert kept very meticulous details of children's educational progress, um, and also what kind of work they were put to and what, what products they produced. So if you look here on the left-hand side, um, and this is drawn from the annual report of 1885, you can see that um, young people's ability to make uh, to, to kind of make certain sounds, make certain speech noises, um, their ability to read letters or uh, or, the, or their kind of um, their capacity to, to kind of read at different levels and their capacity to write at different levels is all meticulously noted as is that the, the different occupations they um, they did, for example, tailoring, shoemaking, joinery, gardening, uh, gardening, sorry. Um, and this is also uh, reflected in in the kind of production of coats, trousers, vests, overcoats, etc., which was part of the internal economy of the asylum. Um, there were also success stories as well that were um, readily promoted by the Royal Albert and these usually highlighted improvements in a child's behavior, speech, the comprehension of basic numeracy, as well as physical appearance, self-care skills or habits. Um, and uh, part of this, uh, the you know, part of this process, I, I suppose, was also um, you know, there's an element of self-presentation in the way that the Royal Albert utilised this material, um, particularly to familiarise prospective candidates with what it could be like at the Royal Albert. Um, so letters were also um, sent from parents of ex-young people, uh, sorry, for, of, of young people or um, who had, um, who were staying at the institution or who, or who had left the institution expressing their gratitude. Uh, so for example, a father wrote to his son in 1887, oh sorry, a father wrote about his son in 1887. I pen the above lines as described by my son. He entertains a great affection for them. What a vast amount of excellent training he has received. We feel here for his care more than words can convey. We're very grateful. And you have uh, Charles G, who was uh, a young person at the, at the asylum saying that, um, being quoted in the annual report saying that it's a good thing that I came here because when I came, I could not write nor read, but I can do both. I have improved in all ways since I came here. Um, so you can see how children's abilities and capacities to learn were um, emphasized in order to promote the Royal Albert. <clears throat> and in contrast to the, uh, the highlighting of, of other aspects of young people's um, appearances and behaviors, which was more disabling, but I'll come to that now. In, so in conclusion, um, one way the degree of ability or disability a young person was said to possess at the Royal Albert seems to have been related to their perceived capacity to be educated and therefore to be of economic value to the institution, to their friends, family and wider community. Young people's abilities were highlighted and sometimes applauded if children conformed to expected moral, educational, behavioural and economic norms. Disability was interpreted pathologically in young people through medical observation and comparison. Variability in young people's speech, bodily movements and physical characteristics was interpreted as undesirable, abnormal, and in some ways disabling. Um, but at the same time, young people were presented as being treatable or as being able to be treated, thus making them amenable to institutionalization governed by practices of moral treatment and principles of medical care. And I think we can therefore view young people at the Royal Albert as seemingly being both disabled and abled by the physical reality of their embodied lives and by the moral, medical, and educational practices which acted on them. Thank you very much. Melanie, you're muted. 
Sorry, I was trying to be careful not to have any background noise. Sorry about that. I, I'll say again, thank you very much, Samia, for um, a really interesting paper. Look forward to asking you some questions later on. Um, we now turn to David Turner, whose paper is on disability and family dynamics in the Industrial Revolution. As I said, he's an author in the Oxford Handbook of Disability History, although he's written a lot of other things as well. He's Professor of History at Swansea University. He's published three books on disability history, including Disability in 18th Century England by Routledge in 2012, which won the Disability History Association Outstanding Publication Award. His most recent book, Disability in the Industrial Revolution, Physical Impairment in British Coal Mining, published by Manchester University Press in 2018, co-authored with Daniel Blackie, draws on research from a five-year Wellcome Trust Programme Award in Medical History Examining Disability in the British Coal Industry from 1880 to 1948. He's currently researching the long history of disabled people's political activism. So um, over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much, Melanie. I'm going to try and share my screen. This, uh, can you see? Yeah, that's no, fine. I'm working on two screens to see, so it's very confusing. Oh, right. <laughs> you can actually see it in Making life that's complicated. <laughs> there we go, right. Um, yeah, that's great. Okay, th well, thanks very much for inviting me to speak to this. Um, I describe myself as a disability historian rather than a historian of childhood, so it's it's great to be amongst uh, amongst you all tonight. And thank you, um, Melanie and Samir, for summarising the the field really well. And um, you know, so, so uh, that saves me a bit of a job in this paper. But anyway, disability shapes the dynamics of familial relationships in profound ways, both in the present and the past. It affects the functioning of the family and has the capacity to redraw relations and roles within the household. According to historians Ben Curtis and Stephen Thompson, disability can change a family's self-identity, reduce earning capacity, rethink recreational and social activities, and affect career decisions. Drawing on my ongoing research into experience of disability in Britain's industrial revolution of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, this paper reviews historiographical approaches to childhood disability in the family in this period and explores the consequences of disablement for working class families. So we're looking at the period about 50 years or so before um, the paper covered in Samir's uh, talk just now. <coughs> While my research is interested in how disability affects all domestic relations, I'm going to focus primarily on the roles and experiences of disabled children in the family. But at the outset, I think it's worth taking a moment to reflect on who counted as a disabled child in this period of history. Since the Ruskin Conference in 1972, historians have shown how definitions of the child and meanings of childhood are contingent upon a variety of social, economic, and cultural variables, and that these meanings change over time. There's been much debate and disagreement on when the modern idea of childhood as a distinct life cycle phase emerged, and about the degree of parents' emotional investment in their uh, children, particularly during times of high infant mortality. These debates are well worn and uh, we don't really need me to uh, uh, repeat them here, but it's striking how little historians have considered the impact of disability on these questions. First of all, disability challenges normative ideas about the life course. The theory of crip time developed by scholars in critical disability studies such as Alison Caper and Ellen Samuels highlights not just the greater amount of time needed by disabled people to complete everyday tasks, but also challenges us to think differently about temporality and bodily futurity. The independence and autonomy that have customarily been associated with the state of adulthood in Western history was not always attainable for young people whose impairments made them reliant on the care of others. While this is particularly visible in the growing perception of people with learning disabilities in the 19th century as occupying an end, a state of endless childhood, 
It's also evident in people with physical impairments who are reliant on parental care into adulthood. So an example of this, uh, disabled factory reform activist William Dodd touring Northern England to gather evidence of industrial disablement um, at the behest of social reformer Lord Ashley, described an example of this in a letter from Wigan dated the 21st of October 1841. 24-year-old Elizabeth Ashcroft had lost her leg because of a machine accident in a factory and was supported by her father from his meagre earnings as a handloom weaver. While Dodd and other writers at the time often conceptualised worker disability as a form of premature ageing, in this case the opposite seems to be the case. Unable to earn her own living and facing bleak marriage prospects, her disabling injury seemed to reverse her life course, returning her to a state of childlike dependency on parental support. But if the meanings of childhood are complex and historically variable, so too are the meanings of disability. As Roger Cooters pointed out, the poor, the maimed, the halt, the, and the blind have always been with us, but the disabled have not. In the 19th century, the term disabled applied both to temporary and to permanent states of incapacity, but predominantly it referred to a person's inability to do paid work. Thus, Henry Mayhew began his series of letters to the Morning Chronicle in 1849, uh, surveying London's poor, by dividing them into two categories, who, who he referred to as the striving and the disabled. He subsequently divided the poorer classes into three groups, uh, those that will work, those that, that cannot work, and those that, uh, that will not work. Yet the boundary between the striving and the disabled was not fixed, and, that, and people with impairments can be found in all three of Mayhew's categories, as his own evidence suggests. The preeminent, the preeminent image of child exploitation used to press the case for regulation of hours worked in factories in the 1830s and 40s was the poor so-called factory cripple, weak, malnourished and presenting orthopaedic impairments, such as crooked legs supposedly caused by standing for long hours at machinery from a very early age. Many of these so-called factory cripples gave evidence to official inquiries uh, in the 18, early 1830s, but rarely were they described or did they describe themselves as disabled. Many of them were still working when they gave evidence to um, factory commission and other uh, inquiries, despite their impairments. For reformers who labelled factory children in this way, the term cripple evoked a pitiable state that evoked dependency and was designed to appeal to the charitable and humanitarian instincts of the middle class. But, industri but in industrialising Britain, being a cripple and being disabled were not the same thing. Those, indeed, those who described themselves as cripples in industrial inquiries talked about numerous hardships resulting from impairments and the way in which they're treated by others, but rarely did they portray themselves as wholly dependent on others. As people with physical impairments that impacted on their daily lives, uh, and shaped the way others saw them, they rightly belong to disability history, I think. But neither disabled or child are terms that we can take for granted. Now, the Industrial Revolution has been traditionally seen in disability studies as marking a decisive shift in the lives of impaired people. Namely, it was a moment where everything goes wrong for disabled people. It's argued that the rise of mechanisation, time discipline and standardisation of production made the industrial workplace a hostile environment for people with non-standard bodies. Uh, the historical geographer Brendan Gleeson, for example, has argued that pre-industrial labour centred on the home had permitted a degree of what he calls somatic flexibility, enabling people to work at their own pace, supported by their family members. However, increasing demands to work outside the home meant that fam uh, during industrialization meant that families were less capable of caring for older and disabled uh, relatives, leading to increasing warehousing of the vulnerable in workhouses or asylums. However, many aspects of this industrialization thesis rest on assumptions that have not until recently been tested through empirical research. There can be no doubt that the gradual shift towards mechanised factory production meant that people with non-standard bodies faced increasing challenges finding work. 
But the industrial economy of the late 18th and early 19th centuries in Britain was diverse and to view impaired people's experiences of work solely through factory production is inadequate. Furthermore, although the number of people with physical, sensory or intellectual impairments housed in institutions grew over the course of the 19th century, institutional support did not wholly supplant family care. And Borsay noted that although the proportion of adult non-able-bodied paupers residing in, in workhouses rose from 11% in 1849 to 28% in 1900, most sick and, and infirm recipients of poor relief continued to receive support outside of institutional settings. Moreover, as Steve King has, has recently shown, the provision of institutional care varied significantly between regions and the propensity to institutional care for disabled children was greatest in London during the first half of the 19th century. Despite the growth of institutions, King, uh, King argues that the poor law authorities often spent prodigiously on nursing care for sick and impaired children within communities and invested in the employment prospects of these young people by subsidizing their wages as an incentive for employers to take them on. These efforts reflect a real desire to, to prevent uh, physically impaired young people from becoming reliant on institutional resources. So the link between institutionalization and industrialization is not clearly apparent. Indeed, back in the 1970s, John Walton um, showed that uh, in his study of um, patients admitted to the Lancaster County Lunatic Asylum in the 1840s, he found that the rate of admissions from textile manufacturing towns was lower than for agricultural areas. Um, as Kathy Smith has recently argued, institutional care for so-called lunatics or idiots might be resorted to in times of crisis, but is one aspect of the mixed economy of welfare in industrialising Britain. This traditional view of industrialization in disability studies as a process of increasing segregation and marginalization of disabled people is furthermore challenged by the importance of worker health to the politics uh, of, of industrial reform in the 1830s and 40s. For instance, the visibility of disability in industrial communities was widely commented upon uh, by supporters of workplace regulation who used it to call, to call for reduced hours of work in factories and, and for restrictions on the employment of young children in textile mills and coal mines. This highlighting of deformity in child workers can be seen as part of a longer process of increasing professional interest in childhood ill health and disability that have been building since the late 18th century. While historical studies of increasing professional intervention in the lives of disabled children and their families focus most often on the role played by medical professionals and educationalists, it's also evident that a wide variety of people claimed expertise on childhood disability in industrial settings, including owners of factories and coal mines, members of parliament, social reformers, trade unionists, journalists, Sunday school superintendents, philanthropists and parents, and children themselves. Child workers were involved in debates and activism regarding the health of factory operatives. As Catherine Gleedle has shown, uh, street protests involving children were a really important part of factory reform activism in the early 1830s. And these protests included um, children described as deformed or crooked. When factory commissioners arrived in Bradford, for example, in June 1833, they were met by what was described as a deputation of factory cripples, along with thousands of factory children who presented them with a letter that asserted their desire for an act that would reduce the hours of labour, declaring that we will have it and that is all we have to say. Similar petitions were presented in Leeds and Manchester. Undoubtedly, these were stage managed protests organized by the adult short time committees as a way of intimidating factory commissioners who they saw as being too sympathetic towards the views of uh, the mill owners. But the vibrant spectacle of child protesters, including what one observer described as hundreds of factory made cripples the wording of petitions acknowledge the agency of those commonly cast as victims in reform rhetoric. The 
official inquiries into, into industrial work in the 1830s and 40s also provided an opportunity for disabled young people uh, to talk about their experiences and experiences of their family life. And I'm going to turn in the last um, part of this paper to some of the evidence we, we can glean from those official inquiries. Many workers, disablement meant, meant reduced income or reliance on poorly paid alternative employment. The economic impact of disablement de depended on the nature of impairment and whether it permitted someone to take up alternative work and also on the attitude of employers. In coal mining, for example, where it's estimated that for every person killed in an accident, a hundred more were left injured or, or left with permanent impairments. Many employers sought to provide victims of accidents with alternative work if they couldn't return to their former roles. Um, so impaired coal, uh, adult coal miners sometimes were given um, what's called boys work, um, uh, such as um, furnace keeping and other, kind, other kinds of, of surface work. So in coal mining, adult disablement might have an impact on the availability of tasks for younger workers. Nevertheless, child labour provided a vital source of income for families in mitigating the loss of earnings caused by injury or debility. The report of the Children's Employment Commission into the employment of women and young children in coal mines, published in 1842, reveals the extent to which the economic contribution of other family members was important in mitigating the effects of disablement. In Scotland, where women and girls constituted around 40% of the mid 19th century, uh, mining workforce, about a third of females interviewed um, reported having dead or disabled fathers. In all mining regions before 1842, sending children to work underground was a familiar survival strategy for families struggling to cope with the effects of disability or other misfortune. So children giving evidence often sort of um, cite these family uh, circumstances as a reason why they were working in uh, the mines. Jane Humphreys has employed the concept of breadwinner frailty uh, to explain why working class children were sent to work. Families' dependence on adult male earners, she argues, made them vulnerable to breadwinner unemployment or incapacity. Consequently, when men were sick, injured or unemployed, families had a strong incentive to encourage or force their children into work. This meant that those children whose labour might best help a family in times of need could be favoured over others. An essay published in Charles Dickens' periodical Household Words in the 1850s even claimed that such was the demand for healthy children, particularly boys in mining families, that uh, so-called superfluous children, um, which is never really defined what that is, were willfully left to slip into the grave. But evidence presented to official inquiries testifies the important contribution made by impaired as well as healthy children to the household economy. 15-year-old William Pickles of Bradford told the Factory Commission in 1833 that each day he was hugged or carried to the mill by his parents due to his inability to walk unaided. He was barely 115 centimetres tall and his legs bent inwards, but his parents said that he had to work because they couldn't afford for him to be doing nothing at home. At Edmondson Colliery near Edinburgh, 16-year-old David Brown and his sister worked underground in the 1840s to support their widowed mother. Despite suffering from an ankle injury, Brown's sister had to carry on as the family required her work. While the deaf and dumb sister of Agnes Gray was not able to join her siblings working underground at Pent Caitlin Colliery um, in, in Scotland, she was learning the straw trade in Edinburgh, making straw hats to support her father, who was disabled with lung disease. Now, it's difficult to determine how parents felt about sending their disabled children to work. Um, some witnesses to official inquiries said that they regretted doing that. But others um, justified their decision as being beneficial to their ch child's health. Um, for example, as seen on the slide here, the 1842 Children's Employment Commission reported that eight-year-old Benjamin Jones had been taken out of school by his father and taken to work with him at the ironworks in Dowlice in South Wales. According to the report, the boy was laboring under a kind of spinal complaint. And Benjamin's father said that he'd been told by a surgeon to take his child to work with him 
because the exercise was better uh, for his body than being inactive at home or at school. Consequently, he now found his son in better health than ever before. Now, this seems like an unusual case, but there was a, a belief you can find in other sources that the industrial workplace might be beneficial environments for people with delicate health. The constant and warm temperature of coal mines or factories was argued by defenders of, of these workplaces as being advantageous to health compared to working in damp, damp homes or being exposed to cold and wet weather in the fields. In some parts of the industrial economy, like coal mining, many workers continue to work to task rather than to time for much of the 19th century, permitting a degree of the somatic flexibility that characterised pre-industrial labour. So to conclude, despite the traditional view in uh, disability studies that the Industrial Revolution led to the increased segregation of disabled people from work and family life, there's much evidence to suggest that impaired people continue to live with their families and where circumstances allowed contributed to the family economy. Rather than a private refuge from the world of work and industrial relations, the family was a political arena and featured prominently in public discourse about the nature and impact of industrialization. Gothic images of accidents and of the debilitating impact of labor on workers' bodies, particularly those of young children, were used to decry the evils of exploitative industrial relations and to further the uh, case for uh, regulation. But the impact of disablement on family life depended in practice on the interaction of a complex series of factors. These included the nature, severity and duration of an impairment or injury, the size, composition and structure of someone's family, the specific place of the family within its life cycle when disability occurred, the number of disabled individuals in a family, and wider social and economic structures, welfare systems and attitudes. Evidence provided to official inquiries in the 1830s and 40s reveal a complex picture of working families struggling to negotiate the economic and psychological impact of disablement using their own resources and sometimes drawing on wider networks of institutional and informal support. Histories of childhood and disability are beginning to acknowledge the vari this variability of experience, but the focus of this much of this work remains on impaired children as the objects of care or control. While these histories, histories are important and reflect the, the experience of many disabled children in the past, we need, I think, to broaden the focus of our research on disability in the family, to, to examine impaired family members, not just as passive recipients of care, but also as active participants in family life, attempting where possible to provide economic support and care to others. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. That was fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we now turn to Mary Claire uh, Martin. Uh, Mary Claire, are you ready there? It would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. Would. Okay, I'm just about to share my screen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hold on. Um, right, while you're sharing your screen, right. I'll introduce you. Um, Mary Claire Martin, whom you'll be familiar with over the last two days, um, is talking about disability in the Girl Guides Association, the social model in practice. Um, Mary Claire is a principal lecturer and research lead in the School of Education at the University of Greenwich in the UK. Her research interests lie in the history of childhood religion, as you will have heard in the previous session, illness, play and recreation from 1700, and they include the Girl Guides Association, multicultural toys, female activism and social welfare. Mary Claire has taught on interdisciplinary degrees on education and childhood and leads the cluster for the study of play and recreation in the Institute of Life Course Development at Greenwich. She is a co-founding director of the Children's History Society and founder of the Life Cycles Seminar in uh, the Institute of Historical Research, which I strongly recommend you to follow if you aren't. 
Um, her publications include Creating Religious Childhoods, uh, published in 2017 with Hugh Morrison, and numerous essays. Two monographs in the are in the pipeline, Free Spirits, Children and Religion, 1740 to 1870, and A Social History of Children's Illness, 1700 to 2000. So, Mary Claire, would you like to take over now? Right. Um, thank you very much, Melanie, for um, sharing this session. Um, I, I have to say something about History Workshop. I loved it when Anna said her paper wasn't finished. And it reminded me of when I went to the um, Ruskin College Conference in 1991. And we were provided with the papers in advance. But Raphael Samuel said, um, unfinished, ran out of time, which um, I actually really liked that. So um, uh, without further ado, I'll start on the paper. I'll just uh, go to, right, there we are. Um, so this image here, and I hope you can see it, is of a, it says an extension guide taking her fire lighting test in hospital in 1943. Um, so this was an extension guide with, this was a separate um, part of the girl guides and they adapted the test um, to be inclusive. Um, so, and this is uh, just an image from magazines that were circulated to girls who lived in their homes. So just a tiny bit on disability history and thank you to um, the other speakers for covering so much of it so well. And um, I'm just going to put in a, my penneth if you like. Um, so one of my favorite uh, quotations is by Richard Altenbaugh, who's a historian of polio in the United States. Humankind is temporarily non-disabled. So we're all potentially disabled. And uh, I remember being shocked when my, pri uh, my son's primary school teacher told me um, that he was deaf and uh, as if it was an insult, <laughs> which was not, not really very appropriate. But um, we are all temporarily non-disabled, which I think is a helpful way of thinking about this, you know, the category of disability. I also really like this quotation from Kathy Kudlik. Um, Disability history suggests not just personal practitioner, but a unique entree into understanding the society, politics, economics, and culture that shape a complex web of relationships for disabled and non-disabled alike. So reconstructing that social world would be a wonderful aim, and I'm just really touching on that in this paper. And again, she talks about how disability is dynamic and socially constituted and can be used to study both an individual and a broader world. So just a, a now just a couple of points about the 1970s. So um, um, <clears throat> Melanie has mentioned the disability rights movement. In fact, the disability living movement started in the 1970s and the archives are in San Francisco, um, was more focused on adults living independently um, than the young, though of course young people is a sort of malleable category. And one of the other landmarks in UK educational history is the Warnock Report of 1981, which recommended the integration, what was later called inclusion of disabled children in school. So um, we've heard a little bit about the social model. Um, I'm just, what I'm going to do in this paper is think about these models of disability and whether they're relevant to the Girl Guides Association. Um, <clears throat> so the medical or tragedy model um, is usually dated from the mid 19th century, um, uh, considers disability the problem of the individual, um, the social model, which is flawed and often doesn't allow for pain, um, argue, but the argument behind it is that it's sort of a responsibility of society to adapt to the disabled person. Another model, um, which is also unpopular, but does exist, and I found quite a lot in my research on the 19th century, was the idea of the disabled person as a heroic exemplar to others. Um, this idea that the sick room is the center of the house. But of course, this places huge demands on the sufferer, as um, Lois Keith argued. So how do these relate to the Girl Guides Association? Um, <clears throat> just to summarize, if you like, this associate, um, the, female, the, the female kind of branch of the Boy Scouts did adapt their organization and badges um, to be inclusive. 
there was a great deal of emphasis on being active on on sisterhood on including um, all guides in national and international structures and providing opportunities for involvement. Um, there's also quite a lot of emphasis on the heroic model, um, disabled people as exemplars, and this was usually in an active, not passive sense. Um, but there were also fears about the reputation of the movement, and these turn up in committee minutes. And um, this is a brief timeline. Um, <clears throat> there's some people who know a lot here about the Girl Guides. I am just, what I'm trying to do here is integrate the um, history of uh, disabled guides into the history of the association, because although there are brief references um, to the special arrangements that were made in many excellent books, there's very little detail about them. Um, one of the first points I want to make is that even before the Girl Guide Association, specifically for girls, was founded, um, guiders were trying out the scout system, um, one in a home for what were called difficult girls, and also in St Mary's Hospital, Carshalton in Surrey. So these organisations were actually integral to the creation of the Girl Guide Association. They weren't just an add-on. Um, the Badge of Fortitude, which I'll describe later, was um, founded in 1912. Lone guides had, were not specifically disabled, but there'd been this system of allowing guides who lived in very isolated areas to be guides on their own. And that was transferable to um, disabled guides living at home. The extension branch specifically for disabled guides was founded in 1919 and um, particularly relevant to institutions. And um, then this category of extension loans, guides who are living in their own homes was created in 1921. Now I found very little about disabled young people in the history of youth movements about which we heard some great papers yesterday. Um, Susan Whitney in um, Mobilising Youth does talk about how the um, French uh, Workers Catholic Association sent young Christian workers to sanatoria. So if I'm missing something, do let me know. Um, now, one of the other issues is about sources. Um, the Girl Guide Association archive is definitely unstable. It's been um, locked up and unavailable for many years. Um, fortunately, I, was a I actually photocopied and photographed a great deal of material before that. So there are a lot of printed sources, mainly produced for adults, but some also produced for guides themselves and, um, and so on. I'll now go to the next page. And I um, <clears throat> can't give this paper without referring to Christine Alexander's excellent article, Can the Girl Guide Speak? But um, it's also, Can the Disabled Guide Speak? And again, disabled guides have been fairly absent from the story. And there are lots of, um, there are actually sources, and Christine pointed this out herself, which to some extent reflect the voice of the guide, um, letters and articles in magazines, log books, scrapbooks and magazines produced or co-produced by young people. And this one, the open window, which I'm going to show later, um, was sent to one hospital for contributions, then passed on to others. So There's about one that survives. Photographs about which we heard yesterday. And also um, we shouldn't forget disabled adults because guiders who are adults who help run the organization um, often had a real interest in encouraging guides who are disabled. Um, here's just an example of some, one of these sources, East Park Home, Mary Hill in Glasgow. Um, there's a thistle with a photograph of them all. We're the 74th city of Glasgow company and pack. And we have the distinction of being one of the oldest extension groups in Scotland and so on. There we are again. And this is a picture of a hospital ward, which was from the magazine I described called The Open Window. And some of the people there are in guide uniform, but not everyone. Um, so here's the structure of my talk and the time I've got left. And I will probably cut vast swathes of it so I don't go over time. Um, I'm going to look at the presence and the numbers, the rationale and rhetoric, activities and adaptations and work, charity and voluntarism. So um, important point in 1921, George Newman um, from the Medical Service of the Education Department 
noted that about half the disabled children in the UK were in the special schools and the other half were living at home. And by 1920, just to give an indication of numbers, there were 22 guide companies in special schools. And obviously this language, we don't use this, the language of crippled and now, um, but I'm just quoting what was there, blind, deaf, crippled and invalid, and then three in institutions for um, mental defectives. There are also 12 in rescue homes and industrial schools, 16 companies and orphanages and poor law schools. And some of these were stopped and I haven't got time to go into this, but there are a lot of discussions in the minutes about um, whether, whether there should be guides in um, uh, institutions for juvenile delinquents, for example. The extension loan guides, as I mentioned, was a scheme to enable um, invalid, crippled, blind and deaf girls living in their own homes to become guides. Um, all guide work is carried on by correspondence, um, the guide joins an extension loan company under a captain who circulates a fortnightly letter with games, competitions, badge work, yarns, etc., to members of her company. And often these um, they were adopted by a local company. And um, again, just briefly, this was an international phenomenon by 1932. Um, they're collecting figures about um, loan guides and extension guides in different parts of the world. Um, just photograph. So I'm next, if I, I'm just going to go on to the next section, which is rhetoric and rationale, and try and relate this to those different models of disability, which I described earlier. So again, as Christine and others have pointed out, the ethos of the guides was to be inclusive. And this was very specific in the guide law. A guide is a friend to all and a sister to every other guide, no matter to what social class the other belongs. A guide is courteous, but especially to old people, invalids and crippled. And all guides are supposed to lend a hand and do a good turn every day. So what were the reactions to um, having companies of guides in institutions? Well, many of the adults involved were very positive. Um, by 1921, doctors were claiming that um, the children's health had improved because they were more motivated. There was greater self-control and self-discipline. And also, interestingly, institutionalised children had opportunities to mix with those outside. Um, our Beasley and Williams book, Childhood and Disability, is actually a very contemporary book. And that um, the author, there's an article in there where the authors point out that um, disabled children in the present feel marginalized and often don't have opportunities to mix with those outside. So um, this is just one example from the present, but I think it's important to contextualize um, what the guides were trying to do. Um, here's some other feedback. The matron of Stony Ets certified institution near Glasgow thought, um, I think the guide movement has done much in the way of helping these girls to take an intelligent interest in outside affairs. And again, um, they thought of extension guides as a kind of offshoot, but then they saw what splendid guides they were and they came plump into the center of the movement. Now, this may not have been true in practice, but what's interesting is this rhetoric about um, disabled guides having a central role and, um, and so on. I, I can't quote all of these, but for example, almost the only thing a disabled girl can share with a normal child feel less of an outcast and helps to break down barriers so difficult to surmount. Now, again, obviously the Guide Association wanted to, um, you know, create a good image of themselves, but, you know, this was an activity in which they were attempting to share with all, all guides. And um, again, the post brownies were the younger children living at home, talked about their isolation, um, their sense of being different from others, and the fact that being, being a guide could help them feel more like other children and um, kind of uh, celebrate disabled guides. This badge of fortitude was created in 1912 um, for quote, a crippled girl showing exceptional bravery. And there were a lot of stories about very brave um, girls who did wonderful things. And again, this does correspond to the idea of the heroic exemplar. Um, which is actually very unpopular, this idea of heroic crips. 
but nevertheless you can also argue that it's creating a, a kind of positive image of um, disabled people and um, Daphne Harrington for example um, got the badge of fortitude in 1946. Daphne has been under medical observation ever since birth suffering from very fragile her lying in a plaster bed in the course of her life she has had fractures of practically all her limb bones and so on but she's the friend of all the children in the neighborhood um, again going back to that kind of 19th century image of the sick um, sick room being the center of the house so, and also, of course, there's a reference to work, picking up on the themes in David's paper and um, Samir's. And um, photographs, so we have photographs in a lot of these sources. And Pauline, who's got the badge of fortitude, is looking very cheerful, as well as all the other guides around her. And again, this is a letter telling, um, telling the guide company in one of these magazines that um, Mary Colwick has been awarded the badge of fortitude. So this is about 1946. And um, thank you, Christine, for giving me a um, heads up to go to the Canadian archives, which also have some great, um, great stuff. And here's a picture of um, a hospital guide company. And um, some really interesting stories in the Canadian material. One was about a disabled guide leader who was, because she was disabled, was prepared to take um, quite extreme risks, allow girls to have wheelchairs on mountains which others wouldn't have felt able to. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about activities and adaptations, the social model. Um, so in essence, this involved adapting meetings through these magazines. So um, the guides who were based at home could all do similar things to the, the guides who were meeting face to face, which that remind us of. So the magazines had 3D activities, um, they were sent to different houses and they were asked to pass it on in a specified time. Um, so I'll just show you some of the images. So roll call. Um, so you can see that these um, girls have written their name in, but they're all on different dates. So they would have written in their name and then passed it on. Um, an alternative was to choose a tulip and then put it in the envelope. Um, so a huge amount of work went into creating these magazines. Um, and this is inspection. So they were supposed to be ready for inspection, even though they're alone at home. And of course, raising the flag, um, whatever we might think of it, they, um, they were actually given these 3D flags so they could put them on up, up at home and uh, with instructions. And um, again, this is, I've cut this off, but this is also about inspection. Um, knots, square lashing, so all things that you could do at home. Um, there's also a New Zealand um, guide. Um, <clears throat> Melanie, I think I'm nearly out of time. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, about three minutes. So um, I'll, I'll just summarize the rest. So badges were adapted um, to accommodate guys with different type, types of disabilities. So what we need to think about is, was this a social model of adaptation <clears throat> or was it regarded as second class? I'll leave that open and all kinds of activities were adapted um, for blind guides and for deaf guides um, all kinds of it was matched <coughs> of course camps camping was the apogee of the guide experience and um, great efforts were made to provide camp, camps for um, guy again for guys with different disabilities I've highlighted this bit in yellow because I think it, it relates to the kind of new sensory history, outdoor smells, sounds, and relative freedom to blind girls. Um, and uh, again, that's that picture, Woodlarks was founded in 1931 and still exists. And um, so the last section is on work, charity, and volunteering. So guide magazines contained um, regular features about careers. Um, huge emphasis on helping girls to have careers, um, letters about and also helping them to acquire skills, including things like soldering a kettle, making a hearth brush. Um, so this was this kind of commitment was transferred to disabled guides and a handicraft de a depot was founded in the 1920s, which was described as being a great success. So disabled guides would make articles at home which could be displayed in the shop. 
um, they had displays at fairs. And um, some guides did start earning quite a bit of money from doing this. So it was a kind of pathway to employment <clears throat> and also a way to have something to do, an opportunity for fighting the enforced inactivity they see around them. And we're back to children as wage earners. And um, this is the period Selena Todd was writing about. In several cases, the post guides have been the only earning members of the family and the appreciation of any help is immense. Um, however, not all guides approved of this. They didn't think that disabled guides should be restricted to handicraft as the only acceptable activity. And again, this um, makes us think about the role of disabled guiders. I think many well-meaning people preach the fatally easy creed of resignation. Quote, you be resigned to doing needlework, poor thing. Um, uh, disabled guides also receive material relief. And of course, these, um, these stories were also in the guide magazines. But there are also stories about guides doing heroic voluntary work. Again, this is the heroic, the heroic model. This is a picture of post rangers. So these are older girls. And um, wartime, wartime also made a difference in that more disabled people were actually employed. And again, there were, the, other, the other issue was that often disabled children couldn't go down to the shelters. And um, in this story at the bottom, um, a great deal is made of one guy who couldn't, one girl who couldn't get out of bed, had a lot of first aid knowledge, and she helped her sister who, who could. Um, and there's a story about them in a bombing raid. Okay, so just to conclude, um, so the law and rhetoric of the Girl Guide Association stressed equality and inclusion. Institutional companies existed even before the Girl Guide Association was founded. Um, extensions, as they were called, were efforts were made to include them in all guide activities, um, which arguably is evidence of the social model, um, the rhetoric stressed active citizenship, working for others and achieving their potential, arguing this was something that uniquely uh, guiding uniquely could provide. But there are also shades of the medical model. There's a lot of um, evidence of disabled guys being presented as heroic exemplars. And um, the words I should have used really were resilience and independence. So um, see you at the Social History of Medicine next week. Okay, thanks very much. Right, everybody be pleased. This is the final roll call. Um, and it's really, um, I volunteered to make some comments that I'll then open out. Um, I've kind of dotted some notes down in terms of the gaps and new gaps that have been filled in new directions, um, questioning established frameworks and definitions, archives and sources, listening to youth, periodization and conversations. Um, I think, I don't know what your feelings are, but I thought what a great community of scholars we all are, or all the people who've delivered papers are, um, a brilliant and thought provoking um, papers and I think they've shown how many gaps have been filled since 1972 and the many new directions that the field's taken and emerging themes which I think has been particularly interesting you know there are things that we're familiar with I suppose intersectionality transnational perspectives global directions and the richness of the local and linking with the global to open up new research possibilities so I've all found that really really good um, of course, there are obvious omissions from the 1972 programme, disability history and black studies, queerness, non-conforming gender identities. And as Hugh pointed out, um, that whole area of religion, which is, has become a rich area of study. We've got more diversity, greater nuance. Um, but I think there are also, there've been little examples throughout about how this, at, current research speak, uh, speaks back to the earlier era of history workshop, yet also defines earlier assumptions. Um, one small example was how notions of liberation, the, the uh, child liberation in the city have changed. Um, I thought, but for me, I thought that papers also highlighted the need, highlighted the need to keep pushing the academy forward, whether in terms of research themes, um, kind of dealing with the exclusion of black scholars from key journals which I thought was shocking um, encouraging the growth of themes in regions 
where some things aren't don't seem to be much addressed, such as black studies in the British Academy, despite considerable potential in terms of the archives. There's been a lot of questioning of established frameworks and definitions, um, problematic frameworks rejected. Um, we had some really interesting discussion this morning about black study, girl, black girl studies, introducing not only significant new dimensions around the meanings of blackness, but disrupting scholarly notions of what it needs to be a girl. Um, and also that idea of highlighting the value of starting stories in different places and interpreting them differently. And I thought Corinne Fields spoke really eloquently about disrupting the category of girlhood and how black ages have been out of step with dominant Western interpretations of generation and life stages. And I thought she also offered a useful reminder of paying careful attention to how terms and methods travel between social science and history. Um, we've encountered new terms like the use of quiet labor and moral danger yesterday. Um, and we've also seen how models based on youth in the global north are being challenged by scholars of the global south, moving res beyond research points such as the age of consent. Um, and there was also uh, urging for greater exploration of activism centered on the state, particularly in Asian contexts. It was also interesting to see how influential concepts such as how moral panic theory have been contested with reminders how that sort of theory can decontextualize children's experiences and also the importance of historians countering how children are represented in the media, uh, not only in the present, but in the past. And I thought today the uh, space matters emerging as a really significant conceptual device, the potential of spatial perspectives um, and place and location as a lens through which to, to explore the changing environments of children's lives. Um, but looking also looking at space, not only for children, but by children, which I think is an important theme. Archives and sources came, has come over really strongly as the, the need for creative approaches, methodologies and solutions. It's been, that, that's been a continuing theme, I think. Um, and I suppose when approaching the archive you know, the further back we go in history, the more um, important it is to be creative, I suppose, as Tally pointed out about Jewish childhood. Um, the need to suspend what we already believe, um, being aware, of course, of our own cultural position, but also developing in-depth specialisms to help test concepts from the secondary literature and also challenging the assumptions of archivists themselves, as Anasa highlighted. Um, I think um, oral history has emerged. Oral history was certainly important in 1972, but several papers have brought visual sources and uh, photographic images to the forefront, including family photos. And that harks back to something that Simon highlighted Raphael Samuel's emphasis on studying families of images, as well as the significance as, of the familiar gaze of family photos, as Vanessa highlighted. One of the things I did think about oral history, because it's something I've been discussing with a, an archi archivist in Manchester, is, is the need to revisit oral history ar archives collected in the 1970s, as far as the UK is concerned, because there was a huge sort of explosion of oral history as a way of giving jobs to unemployed students. Um, and I think a lot of them focus on childhood. So I think that offers a lot of really rich possibilities. Um, and also people talked about the potential of the digitization of sources which can be a bit overwhelming, um, but it also offers the possibility of identifying new patterns in young people's lives. The other sort of theme that I thought about was the whole notion of listening to youth, because several papers highlighted the importance of understanding how young people in understood their, themselves and their lived experience. And that, of course, is another echo of 
history workshop approaches of the 1970s to connect with communities, which Anna Davin was very aware of, um, and exemplified in uh, several papers, but by Lara's plea for more expansive definitions of scholarship, including community-based ones. Um, and there are also those calls to recognize the potential of listening to black girls of color and, willing, and women, how they tell their stories and centering them in analysis. Um, and that was true also of Andy Davis talking about hooligans and what happening uh, happened to them. Um, and Corinne, I think, pointed out that was something which History Workshop in 1972 did get right, um, referring to how we might engage girls in the right, or they might engage girls in the writing of new black histories, um, and how we might do this in a more inclusive way, which of course is also something that Hugh highlighted. Um, periodization was another really interesting area, the call for more research on black girlhood outside the 19th century in the US, um, but the need, reminder of the need to encourage and represent pre-modern time periods, other geographical locations and unexplored regions, um, and not, of course, taking for granted chronological ages in the historical record. Um, I think the richness of push, pushing back into earlier periods was very well expressed through papers on the panel about religion, especially childhood in medieval Islamic societies and the history of Jewish um, childhoods, despite all the problems that they are maybe with evidence. And I suppose, finally, um, it's back to that notion of conversations. Um, and I think in terms of both societies, there's perhaps a call to intensify efforts to reach out to historians of children and youth in other geographical areas and regions. And out of English language context, I know that Tamara has been very keen on doing that in the past and it, it's, it, there are difficulties, but I think it would be great to think about how we might expand the scope of our community of scholars. Um, and like I said, the importance of conversations and thinking about how what we've all discussed today might be continued, the importance of interdisciplinary conversations to take the field forward. Um, but you've all been here over the past two days. So um, rather than me going on, what do you think? I hope you think something. <laughs> any ideas, any thoughts, how it's gone? What you think might be, uh, let me put the gallery up. How many of us are there? Oh, we're a select group now, aren't we? Down to 21. Simon. Well, firstly, thank you, Melanie. I mean, I don't know when you've had time to pull all that together in our 15 minute break <laughs> um, that we've had throughout the day. So well done indeed for that uh, masterful overview. Um, <laughs> of so many things. I thought I might just reflect a little bit on the two sessions that I oversaw and what I've taken away from them and, and perhaps for the benefit of anyone that missed them, um, some, of, some of the things that came from them. Um, and I know towards the end of this session, just as a bookmark for later, we're gonna think about what might happen in the next 50 years. So um, uh, start to have a think about that if you're in the audience too. But um, I, I oversaw the sessions on moral panics and then on environment. And some of the things that I took away uh, from those, um, as mentioned by Melanie, the, the utilities and shortcomings of thinking about moral panic as a portable concept uh, across disciplines, across countries and more. Um, the need to remember to racialize white children as well mm. uh, is I think really important here. That's something that came from that panel too, thinking there of the comments in Andrew Davies' paper on the representation of the Irish working class. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something that can often get taken for granted by scholars of childhood and youth, particularly, particularly uh, commencing students, this uh, tendency to treat whiteness as a, a neutral category against which mm. other things are read rather than uh, probing it uh, as, as a construction itself. Um, something else that came from that session was this idea of uh, consent or assent as well as conflict as important in our understanding of young people's everyday lives. So it was Jasper that mentioned the need to remember the mundane and not only mm. the spectacular. And I think, I think that was important. Um, we also thought about how we teach or could teach, uh, this came up in both of the sessions, 
that I oversaw. And um, I thought I thought that was instructive. And uh, I guess one of the things that would be wonderful to see is yet more and more courses coming on stream uh, from, from us and from the students that we teach uh, to really help embed the history of childhood and youth further in the academy, because it's only really through teaching uh, and writing together that I think that will that will happen. Um, digital te techniques you've already mentioned, Melanie, so to participatory methods. Uh, Jasper again, I thought had a had a useful uh, phrasing, keyword cut throughs. He spoke about, mm. but also the shortcomings uh, of those. Um, where next? So yes, this uh, point on the presentism of certain aspects of childhood and youth scholarship, I thought was significant. And I guess as a challenge to delegates here, I would really encourage you to always try and attend the pre-modern papers at any conference that you go to. As a, one of the fellow conveners of the life cycle seminar that was mentioned earlier, I, I can report that I just get so much out of those pre-modern papers in terms of concepts and methodologies. And it's always the ones that you least expect are going to be uh, useful to you that are in fact the most useful. Um, so I, I guess I'd very much encourage that and hope that that will happen more and more in, 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 mm. in, in the coming years. Um, then in the environment session, there were also loads of really productive thoughts generated by, by that discussion, I thought, uh, particularly on scale, scale as perhaps a privilege, small spaces as potentially useful to think with. And that made me ponder whether a conference or indeed a book on the theme of one size fits all question mark <laughs> would be generative. But having organized three conferences this year or at least helped to do so, I think I'll, I'll uh, ebb my enthusiasm <laughs> for, for the time being. But nonetheless, I did think that scale would be a terrific theme for a gathering. Um, we also had thoughts, particularly in Marta's paper, on the memories associated with space and those held by the spaces, which mm. I also, also um, considered really, really valuable to think with. Um, in the session two on, on, on environment, Sarah spoke about what she called fostering geographical imagination, which I really liked um, and, and, and would very much encourage too. Um, and that session also drew attention to the body itself as a scale of space, um, which again can be useful to think with. And I guess just finally, in terms of my little roundup, um, that session also reminded us, again, principally through Marta's paper, but also <laughs> in other ways, of the raced nature of space, which returns mm. to my earlier point, um, and this need to consider spaces in in intersectional ways and i think intersectionality was a was a, a theme of the conference too mm. perhaps, perhaps an unsurprising one but that wasn't a theme that would have been so present apart from gender class mm. uh, and age in 1972 so i guess that's all from me brilliant that's great thank you simon lots of food for thought there anybody else want to contribute anything um, uh, and Melanie, hi. I'm sorry. I have to take my sick puppy to the vet, unfortunately. Oh, yes, so you must take. <laughs> but before I run out the door with him, um, I just want to say um, that I too I share a lot of what you both have said about the the sessions and about this experience. And one of the things uh, that came out of the media uh, session was how important it is to engage with uh, people who seem to be working on childhood from very distinct and separate uh, fields. And that um, Hella's work is, is a case in point that it's absolutely critical that we um, add that historical mm -hmm. approach. Um, and in my own work on Runaways and Street Kids, I'm very aware of how much differently um, I'm approaching it than the sociological literature that has been really has really had that field or that subject matter in, mm. a, in a vice grip. Um, but I also was um, very, um, very prompted by what Jasper said in the moral panics a session about how moral panics is really a place to start. It's not, it's not somewhere yeah. that you 
arrive and you stay, but it is something, it's a way to think through uh, what's going on and see if it can't um, lead to further windows or doors um, and to get at what is going on and the meaning for children and youth. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna get my, collect my puppy, but thank you so much to everyone. A great team. Um, thank and you. Next time. Thanks, Tamara. That's great. Really helpful. Hope the pup's okay. <laughs> ah, now, Christine, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, I have. Go. Indeed. And it's funny, I think Tamara read my mind just now. <laughs> the thing, so, yeah, community. Uh, yes, right. So just holy moly, thanks again. I am just so looking, I'm so looking forward to spending the weekend thinking with revisiting all of the insights that came out in papers and discussions. Um, I guess what I, what I want to say kind of builds on something that Simon said about teaching and Tamara's uh, reference to Jasper's point about um, moral panics as something, as a place to begin. Um, and I think I actually said this to Simon in a conversation early on when I, when he informed me that this event was in the works. And I said that, yeah, that for me, moral, the idea of moral panic as something to think with was a gateway drug into <laughs> world history and the history of childhood and youth. Like it's, and I think it's something that I've seen my students really respond to, um, you know, especially just this idea that the, and because of course, most of them are themselves youth, young people, youthful, and the idea that, you know, on the other side of this generation will divide that, that adults are freaking out and there's actually no correlation between <laughs> what is happening. And so I, yeah, so all of which is to say, yes, um, thank you. And, but I also would love to have um, some time, uh, maybe at the SHCY next year, I would love to have a conversation about how this, about how this works in our teaching. I found it as well recently with um, scholarship and discussions with respect to agency. And so, uh, for example, I have had students do independent studies with me, honor species, and they've read stuff by Mona Gleason and Susan Miller, all of the all of the folks who have been name dropped here as um, kind of rightly problematizing the use of that concept in the history of childhood. But this past spring, I had a student who basically had come as an observer to the SHCY and CHS conferences last year, read all the agency stuff, loved it, and then wrote a paper about these two girls growing up on a ranch um, in close to Lethbridge, Alberta, based on just a, a treasure trove of written and of written and kind of uh, visual sources. And she just was like, they didn't have agency, agency is useless. And <laughs> So I think, yeah, so all of which is to say, I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of would love to talk more about how to balance these discussions where we're really trying to push the field forward and challenge conceptual thinking with the ways in which, yeah, these, these concepts, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be totally thrown out with the bathwater because for many of our students, they are such a good place to start. Mm. Well, Christine, you've actually got an invitation in the chat. Uh, I think uh, Nick has um, oh, I'm, oh. <laughs> <laughs> suggesting you look at the call for papers. Yeah. So I have no go. doubt that Christine is well aware of the call for papers. <laughs> um, the, the one thing I would say as one of the organizers of that conference is we are for the first time going full on hybrid. So you can have a virtual panel, you can do an in-person panel, or you can do a mix and match hybrid in person. We have been told by the conference services people at the University of Guelph that they are ready for any combination we want to throw at them. So there is uh, about a week left um, before submissions are due. So if the distance was an impediment, think again, it's not. Um, yes. And we will welcome you in one form or another to Guelph, Ontario. That's brilliant. Wherever you are, you now have no excuse. <laughs> Mary Claire, your hand is up. Oh, unmute. You unmute. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, there you go. Well, thanks for all those great comments. And um, we were all going to make comments on our the panels we organised. So I feel a bit close to mine. 
but I'll just make some. One of them is about subject areas. I mean, the religion, it was, it was great the way um, the speakers talked about the sources they used, even from um, you know, medieval mm. or even further back. I found it, it was very hard to find someone who worked on Hinduism and childhood or Sikhism, maybe it's just, a, or even Islam in the modern period who wasn't, you know, a super professor that was far too busy that you, you know, would have to book a year in advance. So those are all kind of gaps, and especially if we're going to decolonize the curriculum. I also make the plea for kind of intersectionality, um, in fact, of religion. So, I mean, it, what was interesting about Andy Davis's paper is, and you asked this question, Melanie, the importance of Catholicism. You know, that was, so, you know, and it often gets left out. So I'd really think that needs to get added into the mix in future, or perhaps mix is the wrong metaphor. Um, and of course, it's disability and intersectionality, you know, really have to be, and again, I mean, our papers were all on the UK, so, although, you know, I suppose mine had, has a global angle. So it's about, you know, if anyone here knows more about disability studies in a more global context, Christine mentioned Canada. I think that's really important. So I suppose my thoughts are really more about kind of missing subject areas mm -hmm. than uh, c concepts. But yeah, and I think putting religion into, you know, intersectionality really kind of mm -hmm. um, is actually a really important thing to do. And could be really productive, you know. Or... Mm, yes. Yeah, that's a great point. Did you want to add anything else, Mary Claire? Are you OK? Not really. Uh, no, I think I've been working quite hard. <laughs> the past few In which case, I'll go to Georgia because Georgia go also ahead. has her hand up. Hello. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for the last two days. It's just been amazing and hearing all about the research coming from all over the all over the world and everyone making the time to come here in the middle of looking after their kids and waking up at the crack of dawn and sharing their knowledge and research has been enormously valuable and um and and I'm kind of slightly exhausted because it's just been so amazing <laughs> Um, but somebody mentioned what what's going to be the future in the next 50 years and I don't think I have the answer but I'm a um, I'm a PhD researcher and I'm exploring youth culture and museums from uh, within oh. Great Britain. And um, I'm really interested in this idea of, uh, I've been exploring the relationships between museums and young people over the last 50 years and wondering that if perhaps we talk more about the history of young people and childhood, maybe we could have a different connection with young people in our museums. And that's one of the other areas I'm also looking at curating in museums around youth culture with young people. I'm looking at models and things. So I just wanted to say, you have all been so wonderful for me and so enriching to my work. I'm so grateful. <laughs> oh, well, that's a lovely comment. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure we all really appreciate it. It makes it all really worthwhile when you get that, when you get feedback like that. So thank you very much indeed, Georgia. That's wonderful. Um, Susan has got her hand up as well. Ask you to unmute. Unmute, sorry. Yes. Actually, that's I'll... fine. Oh, you've gone now. Oh, I just want to thank the organizers. This was just a wonderful way to to kind of invigorate us as as summer begins, actually, and as we sort of turn to to doing more of our own uh, research work. I have to say, I'm a little, I'm totally zoomed out. I don't know how you're not mm -hmm. Simon, but yeah. uh, I, this is, <laughs> and the and the and the and the break thing. Although I I get Nick's point that. Um, how would you schedule a break with so many time zones? So I, I see that, but but no lunch. Um, but anyway, it was just a, a great two days and I, I really appreciate it. And I just wanted to make a, a comment too about how I like the mixture of historiographical overview with case studies. And I think mm -hmm. to me, that was really helpful, especially when we were listening uh, to speakers talk about uh, subject areas that I hadn't really thought much about before. And, and 
I mean, I come away. So I, I, I'm also interested when you're going to post the um, post the recordings because I, I had a um, a computer meltdown when when Corey <laughs> was speaking. So that I want to go back and and hear that. But I think you know I come away with um, so much excitement about all kinds of new fields, and I'm interested just to take the last. Uh, the last session on disability and, and Mary Claire had a little shout out to my Jossis and, you know, in, in sanatorium. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, I, disability history wasn't really something we thought about. And, and how does bringing new ways of thinking change the same material that you've already mm. looked at? So I think I, I just want to thank you all. And I, I don't know how you people in the UK are, are still functioning this late at night, <laughs> dead by this point. So, so thank you. And it was it was great to be part of this for two days. Oh, brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to that gin and tonic, I must admit. But there we go. There are some really good comments in the chat, um, that very generous comments and very useful comments. So um, the, the chat will be saved. So maybe there will be some way of us perhaps pulling them together. Um, as far as the recordings are concerned, that's dependent on our wonderful Will, who I don't want him to say anything now because it will put him on the spot. <laughs> but, um, but if I forget, he's done an absolutely brilliant job and we're all so grateful to him for keeping it all running smoothly, you know, so that's brilliant. Um, now, I think, yes, we've got Corin with your hand up and... Oscar, where are we? Uh, Good, just mute. trying to unmute yes. here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to join everyone else in just saying how truly wonderful this was. And I am zoomed out, but it was also a great illustration of how um, people in different locations can get together for really generative conversations. So thank you for that. And I guess I just wanted to bring out and underline one thing that I haven't heard in the wrap up, which is the call for attention to queer childhoods. And I do mm. hope that this is something that you're able to encourage more papers at the next conference and an area that I think is going to be, um, you know, as Nick gestured to particularly difficult to study in the U.S. going forward, given our political climate right now, which is weaponized, you know, ideas of youth sexuality and gender identity. But I think it's a really important topic. And I hope that the organization will look for that work and encourage that work. Yeah, brilliant. So. A really good comment. Thank you very much indeed. And also for your comments, uh, I can't remember, was it early to, earlier today? I think it was. <laughs> My kind of time scale is slipping somewhat. Um, Ella, would you like, you've got a comment? Yes, you, yes, you're on, yes, you are um, unmuted. Well, yeah, so I just want to join all of the others saying that this was wonderful. It was mm -hmm. truly wonderful and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, so thank you so much for organizing. Um, I have been, um, I, I've been going to two, well, so, so I know that the British, um, so, so I know that in Britain there has been sort of a new initiative to, from past and present to start looking at the 90, 1990s. And also in Denmark, there's been a similar initiative to look at the 1990s. And I'll just like stop at um, how much um, youth culture was a focus for the people there, but there were nobody that I actually knew that did youth culture or children's culture or ch mm. child history. Um, so just maybe that's an area to look out for. And also I think, you know, like, um, because pe people are starting to think about this, uh, you know, this new period and and uh, I don't know how it works <laughs> as a period actually, but, but um, but it's just, uh, I think that that's something where we really um, have, have uh, can contribute to a conversation also mm -hmm. sort of help shape that conversation because um, because it was it was talked about a lot like youth culture and children's culture, um, but uh, but there weren't many people who had worked in that area before. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, I think that's something to look up for. Yeah, that's really good to hear. That's uh, the advantage of bringing people together is that you can start to pool some of that. Um, you know that awareness that we perhaps wouldn't all otherwise know about so thanks for that uh anybody else don't want to put anybody on the spot you don't have oh susan's back yes can you sorry just to, to um Helly reminds me i also wanted to mention how nice it was that you included people from different disciplines and that 
the sort of interdisciplinary reaching out and dialogue was was so emphasized because I think, I mean, my I originally come from women's and gender history, and and that is so interdisciplinary, and and so should childhood and youth history be. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Uh, oh, Simon. Yes, Simon. Thank you. Yeah, um, I wonder if we might turn our attention to our um, predictions for where Ooh. we're going to go next. And um, of course, notoriously bad as we are uh, as historians <laughs> and others at looking forwards rather than backwards, it might be fun to uh, have a go. This is being recorded, so in 10 years time we can watch uh, and see if any of the things that we said uh, came true. I'm not sure I'll be here in 50 years. If, well, if I definitely can. won't be. <laughs> <laughs> But the, you know, this is a, like a time capsule for the future. So I had I had three things that um, I thought might take place, and two of them have been mentioned in the conversation already. But before I get to those, I guess I would say more of the same, please, would be mm. one of the first things. Um, he was here earlier in the conference, uh, Vince Di Giromo, um, and he put this fantastic uh, comment into the chat box at a previous event where I was, which was a quotation from the historian Gerda Lerner, who said that we need a hundred years more of women's history. Um, you know, th this, this idea that, you know, this kind of constant revolution of the field can sometimes mean that the, the caravan moves on too quickly uh, and that occasionally, uh, or not really occasionally, but often, um, we need to kind of secure the field. Um, and I'm thinking here of the, dare I say, notorious Maza article in the American Historical Review, um, which shows that, you know, there are a lot of people that really do not understand the history of childhood and youth as a, as, as a field or, or get bits of it, but don't understand other bits at all and don't read widely enough and so on. So I think, you know, carrying on with lots of the good things that we are doing would be an excellent way to proceed, at least initially. But if I was to look ahead uh, as well, I would very much like to second the comment from Corey on uh, the need for further research into queer childhood. Um, I would also like to um, second the comment that Ella was building towards, which is that I think we're going to need to move at some point into writing more and more histories of the 21st century mm. and children and youth there. Contemporary history, at least in Britain, still begins in 1945. It hasn't moved forward to say 1968 or 1989 uh, as a kind of origin point yet. And I wonder how long that can kind of continue. Mm. So I think that kind of move into the next uh, period of time, at least for those of us that work on the modern period, would be something that's interesting. And then the, the final thing that I, I would suggest, or, or, or theme that I would suggest that's going to become more and more prominent, is the interface between youth and the Anthropocene. Mm. Um, I really think that's going to be a, a, a hugely significant area, particularly as young people are so engaged themselves by the ongoing environmental catastrophe that unfolds around us. And they will <clears throat> want to know about the history of that, but not only the kind of scientific history, but also how young people themselves have um, corresponded uh, with each other about environmental matters in the past or um, been activists um, in the pre-modern period as well. So I think that kind of youth and environment more broadly considered than the urban, but also mm. incorporating the urban, will be um, something that we can uh, look out for. So I might be completely wrong in these things, um, but we can all have a good laugh in 10 years, if so. Mm. I think you're quite right with youth and the Anthropocene. We, we just had a, a festival in Manchester with Manchester Histories, which brought in an awful lot of young, of young, young people. So yeah, I think you're spot on there. Anybody else? Thoughts? Exhausted? Uh, I would, like I said, there are some good, uh, really useful comments in the chat. Uh, so if there's anybody who wants to pick up on anything there. A okay. comment about children as participants, which I thought, which the Children's History Society always does, always does make an effort to involve children. 
I did like the unintended <laughs> children kind of taking part. That kind of lifted it in a different way, really. Um, Very clear. Well, I've, I've put this in the chat, but um, Yinka Olashoga, who's our children. Ah, yes, I saw that Yinka and, was there. And yeah. um, not wanting to put you on the spot, Linka, but and myself <laughs> and Dion Georgiou did have a meeting and come up with lots of suggestions. And one of them is, if we have children as family members in other ways to kind of incorporate them and find a way for them to get involved. Mm. Um, so if anyone else has children and wants to get involved in just children's history activities, um, do let us know. Um, can, I, can I just take the opportunity to thank the Society of the History of Childhood and Youth for actually funding this? Um, for a, I think it was about two thousand US dollars. Was that yes. right? Yes, it was. And so obviously we're very grateful for that. Um, I think it's all free on Zoom, but you know, actually, we're so grateful to Will, but also for the society, and also I'd like to thank you, Melanie, for organising it, doing all the notes, sending out the Zoom links, and keeping everything on track. Oh, so, well, uh, okay. Maybe we should all give Melanie a round. Of no, maybe I should write up these notes from <laughs> us. <laughs> You can only get your round of thoughts and you've written up the notes. No, seriously, <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I think it's been a really useful, inter really good interaction, I think, between the two societies. And I would really like to think mm. that we could do more of these sorts of things, even if not on a small scale. Now, I'm um, talking too much. I've got two. I know Lucy wants to say something and I know that Tahani wants to say something. So Lucy first and then Tahani. That's OK. I'll ask Tahani. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it was just to reply, reply to Mary Claire um, uh, about the children's participation. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the work that the society has done to, in, to have kind of child sessions in your conferences, it, it has been um, really great, and really important. But I think, um, I suppose, I, get, I guess a kind of word of warning about the, a word of, uh, caution or, or something I don't know so, about this sort of idea of um of involving family members <laughs> as, <laughs> a, it, as a way of including children I think it, it is obviously it's, it's something that the the um um the 1972 conference did and has this sort of um uh had did did very well but I think that we should be aware of the way that that will continue to replicate some of the um, exclusions that we might see um, mm, within um, yeah. within history, within the field, and within the kinds of histories that we're um, wanting to work on. So, so maybe that's something to think mm. about. And I suppose I posed the question in part because I think that there's there's some problems with include having children mm. as participants um, and how we kind of manage the, the politics of that as well um, in terms of our kind of um, the power relations between um, mm. kind of, uh, it, within that. So I think, um, yeah, but uh, as you say, uh, Simon, um, kind of having keynotes from, from children is a really kind of, important way to, to perhaps um try to involve children in in as historians as well as um as mm. some sort of uh subjects i think right and they can be very successfully involved i think simon's examples mm. and also some other things that they've done in manchester i think kind of are evidence of that as well so good points thank you um have i missed any more hands and, oh, can I just come back on that? Yeah, uh, please do. Muted. Yeah, I mean, I think it's possible to involve people, you know, without it being co coercive. Uh, which I'm, I'm not sure it was coercive. This things Anna was. Am I muted? No. No, no. no. no I was just thinking I'd still forgotten there. somebody. Tahani um, wanted to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if children. I mean, I grew up in a household where we were incorporated into kind of activities our parents were involved in but I really enjoyed that so I think we have to kind of keep open the possibility that this can be um you know something children actually like being involved with I mean I, I think the points you make are you know well taken but I, yeah I absolutely I, I didn't mean to imply that <laughs> so, no, no. Um, no and I think you're right about exclusions and so on and obviously we need to, you know we need to look at our membership and always be trying to um 
well recruit outside the academy for a start as well as mm -hmm. within it um and yeah that's a kind of ongoing issue but yeah no i just i, I wouldn't want to rule out the fact that this, this is something that could be enjoyable you know mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to take over their life or anything well, and, uh, <laughs> and i think leave it there really <laughs> i think if we work with um school teachers or youth workers as well they are entries into groups of um, young people who might be interested in getting involved so it, so long as they're not being corralled into doing something you know um, anyone else no sorry I, I did on mute uh, ah yeah there you are I've been waiting thanks, for you yes, sorry excellent. Melanie but that's um, all right thanks very much yeah great I mean it's been a great couple of days and I've just been reflecting myself on things um mentioned yesterday by Jasper and and David uh, uh sorry and Andy sorry yeah. Yeah. around the digital ar archives and um the difference that's making in terms of things that we can look at mm. now that weren't available also also the changes in terms of you know with the 100 year rule so when I started mm. my degree in 1998 my first degree the research that I'm doing now I wouldn't have been able to do it in that period and things mm. I mean in conversation with Andy um at the university when he first did his research on the scuttlers and he told me you know you, you couldn't go on newspaper archive and do a keyword search for scuttlers he had to go through the microfiche individual mm. individual newspapers and i'm thinking how difficult that must have been you know to do that piece of research and how we do have that at our fingertips at the moment and what a difference that is making to us as researchers um which is is just fantastic and, and i'm looking forward to the future the possibilities now there's just so many possibilities with youth mm. there's so much i mean at I've stored so much in my Dropbox from things that I discovered that I shouldn't have been looking at while I was doing this research. <laughs> so I, there's so much that I'm going to be going back to now post PhD. But it's been a great couple of days, and thanks so much to ev all, all the presenters and and um, those moderating as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, and thank you for coming, and I'm really glad that you've got so much from it. As I said before, it's great to hear that, that kind of, to, to hear how it is possibly shaping new forms of research. It's brilliant. And I've noticed that Yinka has put a, uh, she was sorting out fed time with her daughter. So um, she, if you want to have a look at her comment, agree that we need to think of inclusive ways of engaging with children and bringing opportunities for children to engage with primary sources and with children in the historical record, because it is such a wonderful way, isn't it, of connecting young people with history. Oh, brilliant. She's working on this with the OP archive at the moment um, and bringing primary sources into museum workshops for children and families in Bradford and Sheffield. The OP archive is a course in the British Library and is a wonderful set of oral histories isn't it conversations with children I, I love them um it was it um Iona Opie was interviewing children in the playground about their games and it's a wonderful res reversal of the authority of the children knowing far more than, than she does it they're, they're wonderful to listen to some of them anyway Simon you have got something to say thank you yes I'd just uh, like to be a bit mean and in our remaining time press Bring my us fellow, back. <laughs> press my fellow organizers for their predictions for Ooh. where uh, we're going to be in, um, in the next 50 years so that I'm not the only one who's uh, mortified in uh, 10, 20, 30 years. <laughs> so maybe, um, maybe Nick, you could go first. Oh, <laughs> oh um, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, <clears throat> I'm trying to think, and I had taken some notes on the two panels that I had observed or that I was moderating and so forth, but Melanie hit on so many of the points I was going <laughs> to make. But I did, no, in a great way that I did not feel like it was necessary for me to like come back and return to them. One of the things that I was struck by on, on the panel this morning on gender, but I think probably applies to, to lots of others, is that if the field continues to grow and if more and more people become interested in it, that we'll just have a 
a more diverse range of places mm -hmm. to to uh, to have reports or to have books and articles on and speakers from, and also places in earlier moments too. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that the the field is skewed toward the modern. I, history generally is skewed toward the modern, but the the greater this uh, the, the momentum behind this field is, I think we're going to get some more examples. And the example is that the. Um, the gender uh, people talking on black, about black girlhood we're talking about were you know blackness in pre-modern societies but I think we could mm -hmm. simply just say more examples of childhood in pre-modern societies mm -hmm. and in a variety of places I think we've got great representation in the CHS and the SHCY from a number of places but they're definitely underrepresented mm -hmm. areas of the world as well and the both the JHCY and the SHCY have like done studies of the number of sessions that are proposed by region and the number of submissions that come in by area of the world. And we know that Europe and North America are overrepresented. Um, so I think a broadening out, this is not an original prediction that I'm making here, but it is a hopeful one that, that we'll just have a, a bigger conversation with more people representing more places. Mm. Well, you've just about covered quite a few of the things I was gonna say. Mm. Mary Claire, you're, you're kind of well. I've, kind of I've, I've already yourself. said what I think I want to happen, which is to have more kind of intersectionality with um, including religion, disability, a range of religions. And um, I agree about queer childhoods. And also, mm. it's about highlighting things when they you find them. I mean, I found some queer queer childhoods in a mental deficiency institution and they're kind of in my article but they're probably buried for anyone looking for them um just on a very practical point i think it's worth looking at working with other organizations for example mm. the international center for the history of education had their conference on exactly the same days in fact gary mcculloch is our vice president so you know, we could try and anticipate that by trying to trying harder to find out what else is on. I know it's difficult at this time of year, but mm. uh, because I'm sure some of them would have liked to be involved. But it is also reaching out how to develop contacts, you know, outside the UK and North America. And I mean, I do have some, but it's yeah, there just isn't. It's just, it's about developing them and maybe thinking about having a conference in. Um, I don't know, lots of places, Italy, India, parts of Africa. Mm. How, how do you, you know, you have to kind of build up some different kinds of capital to do that. It is, it's developing those networks. Although, as Nick said, I, I'm really glad to hear that you are having a, a kind of a, there will be a, high, we are having a hybrid conference next year, I think, because that really does help, you know, to, to mm. spread the word, really. I see that, Marta, have you, you've got your hand up. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I have to run. I have another Zoom coming up soon. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Uh, um, it was a great conference. And, and I, I did want to make this one point, which is that I was so inspired by the work of younger scholars. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, I thank, thank, thank Simon and the or, all the other organizers for making space for younger scholars, recruiting younger scholars to speak. I think our field is in very good hands. I must say, uh, uh, the work is the work is very promising, and very um, very enlightening. So I thank I thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope to see you all soon. Perhaps not on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. Yeah. Take care, friends. Thank you, Marta. Thank bye -bye. you. I mean, I, I think uh, I, I would like to see, you know, given the fact, as Marta said, there are so many good young scholars coming through. I would like to think 50 years from now, they have really made their own contribution and helped to change the, the kind of the landscape of, of uh, you know, of, of, the, um, of the discipline, really. I look forward to that. Right, we are near, we're on uh, nearly four minutes before we finish. So are there any final comments that anybody wants to say wants to make ah yes I see your hand Mary Claire I think it's been um, well I just raised uh, for some reason <laughs> we'd like to encourage everyone who's not a member of either CHS or um, the Society of the History of Childhood and Youth to join um, because that will really help us moving forward and it's only 10 pounds for students and 15 for um 
early career scholars for CHS, but I'm not, not expecting people to prioritise that. I'm just giving you the information. Well, um, I, I, I will make a plug for our conference next year, which uh, yes. Nick is pushing Point. forward. So I hope to see as many of you as possible, either online or actually um, it's Ontario, isn't it? The, the, well, the, yeah. Well, so, Ontario, yeah. Near yes. Toronto, so you can Near fly Toronto. into Toronto, convenient. There you go. And maybe the planes from Europe will be an awful lot more efficient next year than they are this year. <laughs> so and the year after the CHS conference will is very likely to be in Newcastle. Oh, right. OK. So, um, good. Newcastle's a good place. So, yeah, very two, good. And know. a lot to recommend it. So, um, Ah, well, that's mind. an indication of just how much is going on, I suppose, really, kind of on different sides of the Atlantic. So anybody else got anything to say? Any final comments? Oh, yes. Hello. Uh, so, so actually a serious comment that, um, so, well, not that the others weren't serious, but I thought we were like finishing, but I've been thinking about this. Um, yeah. And so in terms of digitization, which is, yeah, like I have ch child history, but also digitization as my other specialty. And I think there's a, uh, now that we're talking about sort of like the gravity towards North American and European, especially UK, so English language, um, mm. uh, data, like uh, digital resources, I think there is for us sort of as a collective and thinking about the next 10 years, looking at what sources get digitized yeah. and what sources do we use? Like, because there is, you know, digitization, well, of course, you know, there, there's a possibility to find, you know, things that are digitized that you would never find, but actually what you do find and what they've really sort of highly curated very visible um things that you you find that are top rated also like that are optimized for search engines those are the ones that you find and so so we have a i think as a as a like as societies and as scholars um you know we we need to train our students in digital um mm. kind of literacy uh in order for the field not to be screwed uh, even further towards the areas that are already sort of highly studied uh, because those are the ones that tend to you know when you have the big even sort of in Denmark you know we get that our libraries always offered um, sort of big databases in, in English in, in, with English language content um, so so there is a, a, a difficulty here with the digital that I just as a collective I think we should be thinking about so that yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah no that's a, yeah and that's a really good comment that also gives students very useful skills as well doesn't it um, even if they don't want to go you know and become professional historians in some way so yeah that's a very good comment um anything else i don't see any hands up can i just no. add to that that was oh really, yes go on sorry really excellent point on on the sources i mean I'm thinking of like particularly the Middle East and places where there's been war. I was in a in a fun a fantastic archive in in the Yemen in two, 2015 prior to the war. Um, mm -hmm. I speak Arabic, obviously I'm bilingual, so I would have you know loved to be able to take those some of those archives. I don't know whether now they've been damaged by the war. I, you know, I kept mm. in contact with the university over there, but I mean. That's such a, a really important point. I'm, I'm thinking about um, Catherine's um, work on youth and, you know, thinking about religion as well. Mm. You know, are we going to mm. then, if we never have those archives, are they going to be lost, those yes. histories of childhood in those regions? Mm. So, I mean, that's a really, you know, really important thing to think about as well on, um, on archives and sources. Yes, absolutely. And you're one of those young scholars who I hope, you know, in a few years time will be involved in, in a, in a, in a you know, even more in expanding the interests of both societies and the discipline itself, really. So thank you for that. Um, anything else? No? Right, I can't. There we go. Actually, I have got something to say. I think oh, we should very it. close. Simon's idea to have this theme. Yes, um, I did. We, I did at the workshop. beginning. Yeah, I did. 
in, the, in my initial comments, I did actually yeah, acknowledge it, but apologize. it's worth ha it's worth having another acknowledgement. Yes, if it hadn't been for Simon, we would not have picked up on 1972 for either the history workshop, children's liberation, or um, moral panics. So yeah, we are indebted to you, Simon. So that's brilliant. Any more thanks that we need? I think. Well, thank you. But credit where it's due, it was Tamara that spotted the moral panics ah yeah, right okay and she's good. not here but it's no. now been recorded so she yeah so that's good. that's great and thank you too again i think um will is still here i'm not quite sure where he is but i'm sure he is and thanks there you are i'm glad we can see you to say thank you properly i really appreciate everything that you've done and uh, it's helped to make it really smooth so there are one or two other things that uh, we'll be asking people to evaluate um how they you know so you'll get something through eventbrite um but that's it and maybe we might be able to do something with the notes and send them out to people as well if they're if they're interested because there have been some especially in the last session lots of kind of their references to books and you know other other things so okay thank you very much um enjoy your morning evening afternoon whatever it is for you um and uh, no doubt we'll see you again before long so thank you thank you for supporting both societies so thanks Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Thank Bye. you.